Keeper of the Lost Resurrecting Magic, Book 2 Written by Kiri Taylor Narrated by Sidney Fulmer Chapter 1 I didn't know how he did it. Nathaniel was so calm and forgiving, even when his ribs were still only half-healed, even when he still bore a black eye and stitches in his left cheek, even when he had nearly drowned, partly at the hands of the very man asking for our help. How could he just forgive Borden? But if he could forgive Borden, what right did I have not to? It didn't mean I trusted him, though. The second Borden stepped foot through the door of the solarium. I turned and walked to the jar of change Nathaniel kept on his shelf. I reached inside and grabbed the first coin my fingers wrapped around. I raised the nickel in my fist to my lips and spoke truth to it. I've never hated anyone until David Sinclair. I said the first thing that came to my mind. Borden looked over at me, a slight look of confusion on his face. But Nathaniel just looked at me, nodding in agreement the moment he realized what I was doing. I crossed back to Borden, holding his gray eyes. I wanted to read all of his truths right off his skin, written in blood. But this was the next best thing. Here, I said, extending the bewitched coin to him. Still uncertain, his brows knitted together. He held his hand out, and he took the coin from me. You aren't the descendant of Scottish royalty, I said, immediately launching into the test. Yes, I am, he said. And the moment the words came out of his mouth, his look of confusion deepened further. Your family is incredibly poor, I said next. Not at all, he corrected. He looked more bewildered by the moment. He might have had other words he wanted to say, but they changed right on his tongue, to nothing but the truth. Have you ever tried to kill anyone? Nathaniel asked, looking up at Borden from beneath dark eyes and long lashes. Borden's eye slid over to meet Nathaniel's. Yes. He answered honestly. My jaw clenched tight, my teeth grinding together as I crossed my arms over my chest. My stomach was full of knotted snakes. Their venom filled me up, poisoned me from the inside. But we had to know. Do you really hate the society boys? I asked. Every second with them, Borden said. And even though I knew he couldn't lie to me, I could tell he meant it just by the look in his eyes. Do you mean it? That you are only with them because they make you angry? Nathaniel asked, walking to my side. We stood in nearly identical positions. Yes, they're awful people. Borden's eyes flicked from mine to Nathaniel's and then back to mine. What? What's going on? Why do I feel like this? Why can't I say what I'm thinking? Because I gave you a coin of compulsion, I said, feeling a small smile curling on my lips. I felt smug, like this was some tiny shred of revenge for all of the horrible things he'd been a part of. You can't say anything that isn't the absolute truth. Would you ever reveal our secrets? Nathaniel asked, because really, that was the most important matter. Everything hinged on it. I don't think so. And that, I knew, was an honest reply. I glared darkly at Borden for a good thirty seconds, debating. What did it help us to let him in on anything? To teach him? He might say he hated the society boys, but he'd still been with them on numerous occasions of torturing Nathaniel. His hands weren't clean of the night Nathaniel was nearly drowned by them. What else do you know how to do? I asked, because at this point, the only benefit I could see to helping him was if he could help us in return. 
January 3rd brought the first day of winter semester with it. It had snowed six inches the night before, adding to the twelve we already had, and Dad called over to the school twice to be sure they weren't delaying or canceling. They weren't. So Dad went out with a shovel to start on the driveway and the sidewalks. I stepped out onto the porch and looked in one direction and then the other. There was someone out at the end of the road, but they were far away and looking the other direction. I smiled as I looked at my father bent over his shovel, his back to me. I lifted my hand. I mentally reached out to the snow. Instantly, every bit of it lifted off the driveway and the sidewalk and then dumped itself in the center of the lawn. Dad stood up with a start, looking to the left and the right in utter confusion. His hand even went to his hat, as if he were worried it was going to float away too. I couldn't help but laugh, to which he suddenly twisted around, searching for an answer. His eyes met mine, wide with shock and maybe a little fear. I just smiled. Dad looked nervous, but he smiled and laughed too. He shook his head at me as he walked back up to the door, leaning the unneeded shovel against the side of the house. You're a handy one to have around, every now and then, Margo Bell, he said as he tapped my nose with his gloved finger. Every now and then, I said. We gathered our things and stashed them in our bags, and then we donned our thickest coats and hats and gloves and walked outside into the frigid air. I continued to clear the sidewalks, so long as no one was around to see. How does Nathaniel not freeze in that solarium? Dad asked as we set off on the sidewalk. His eyes slid in that direction, to the north end of the university. He has a fireplace, I said, casting my gaze that way too. But he's surrounded by glass, Dad said, shaking his head. No insulation. I'm worried he's going to sleep too deep one night and not stock that fireplace, and he'll just freeze to death. I smiled, and something in my heart fluttered. Dad cared about Nathaniel, truly cared about him. Nathaniel was family. While my father had never had a son, Nathaniel had become that to him. If it gets too bad, I'll make sure he stays at the house, I said. Sleeping on the couch, Dad said, fixing me with a pointed look, even though he'd let Nathaniel sleep in my bed once before and hadn't bothered to kick him out on other nights when Nathaniel had fallen asleep there after studying, like three nights ago. Of course, I said, instead of pointing all of that out. More and more students were flocking into the university in droves, it was a totally different scene from the first day of the last semester. Everyone had been half-clothed and ready to take on the world. Now, everyone was bundled up and looked like soldiers heading off to battle. It was the second semester, and we all knew what we were in for now. The floor was slippery with melted snow as we stepped inside. Shoes squeaked against the tile and voices echoed loudly through the halls. Friends caught up after the long holiday break, bragging about the exotic locations where they'd vacationed, the overpriced gifts they'd given, and the spoils of rich parents they'd received. I aimed right to head to my first class, when a set of blue eyes caught mine. David Sinclair walked toward me, flanked by James Richards and Gerald Paulson. His eyes were fixed on me. His lips were set thin and narrow. Just then, a warm hand settled on my lower back. I glanced up to see Nathaniel. He quickly bent down and kissed me with a whispered, Good morning. But I looked back at David. He looked at the two of us darkly. But there was venom missing in his eyes. I didn't see any traces of promises for vengeance in them. I didn't see any calculation in his eyes on how to win me over. 
He just held my eyes as he and his boys walked down the hall and then walked right past us. I think your little mind trick worked, Nathaniel said as he watched them go. None of them looked back after they passed us. I didn't feel promises that he was going to kill me like they were words being screamed from his eyes. I chuckled because that was almost exactly what I'd been thinking. I slipped my hand into Nathaniel's and started down the hall. And did you notice who wasn't with them? Borden. Nathaniel said simply. I nodded. It was going to take a whole lot more than one morning for him to prove anything to us. We made our way halfway down the hall before I stopped in front of a door. Writing 122. Is your schedule at the library the same this semester? I asked, hesitating in the doorway, letting the other freshman in behind me. Nathaniel shook his head. I have Mondays and Saturdays off now. I smiled, happy to hear that he had extended our weekends. Should we go to Mom's office after class then? I've got some things I want to work on. Nathaniel nodded and smiled. Happy and content, I leaned forward, accepting his kiss. This felt like the most natural thing in the world. Me and him, together in the school, falling into our own version of normal. See you after class, I said, smiling as I watched him walk away toward his own class. I had five classes this semester, the same as last. Writing, Latin, a general ed science class, humanities, and a literature class. Fifteen credits would keep me plenty busy. Adding our mage studies on top of that, and I was exhausted already, not even accounting for any homework in the grand clockwork of it all. I wasn't sure how Nathaniel was going to balance his seventeen credits, plus his library hours, plus mage studies. One day at a time, I suppose. That was all we could do. Nathaniel and I coordinated our lunch break this semester, so at noon, I stepped out of my Latin class and made my way to the cafeteria. It was a noisy space with the buffet along the back wall and rows of tables, six across and ten deep. I rarely ever ate lunch in here. Typically, I went back home to get food, but with our schedules this semester, our 30-minute break didn't leave quite enough time for that. It kind of felt like high school all over again. All the rich kids sat together. All the scholarship kids were scattered around the room, trying to figure out where they fit in. The lacrosse jocks stuck together, and the pre-law students were always arguing with one another at another table. I spotted Nathaniel across the room and walked over to join him. So, Nathaniel asked as we got in line for food. Was this first day of class as boring as the last? It still isn't challenging, I said as I grabbed a tray. But I think I'm not going to float by quite as easy this semester. How was yours? Nathaniel shrugged as the student employee dumped some food on his plate. I'm taking a class on early Germanic history. It's quite interesting. Is your German getting any better? I asked raising an eyebrow at him. Du bist die chance de Frau, die ich gesehen habe. He said, in what sounded like absolutely perfect German to me. Again, I raised an eyebrow at him. And what does that mean? He bent down and pressed a kiss to the hollow beneath my ear, even though we were in the middle of the lunch line. He whispered close to my skin, you are the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. I blushed. Even though I knew Nathaniel was attracted to me, even though he made me feel beautiful every single day, I felt my face flush brilliant red. He simply gave me a rogue smile, and I stepped up to the register to pay for my lunch. We turned to the tables, and I set off for an empty space in the middle of the room. With no one else at the entire table, it was perfect, and it was then that I realized that Nathaniel and I were becoming loners, 
recluses. And that was absolutely okay with me. I just forked some of the less-than-great potato salad into my mouth when someone set a tray down next to Nathaniel and dropped right into the seat. Wide-eyed, I stared at Borden Stewart. He gave each of us a nod and set to digging into his food like he'd done this a million times before. My eyes still wide with shock, I looked around the lunchroom. People were staring. At least half a dozen eyes were focused on us, their brows furrowed, staring at this new development. Borden was a society boy, a senior one at that. He was a leader, a head. They stuck together. And now, he was sitting with Nathaniel and me, known outcasts. And just then, David, James, and Gerald walked in. I sat there, frozen, my eyes fixed on them, as the three of them walked to get in the food line. They weren't looking for us, but I was just waiting for it to happen. The three of us sat there silent, not saying a word. Borden just ate his lunch, but Nathaniel and I were frozen, knowing something was going to happen. The society boys got through the entire line. They paid for the food, and then they turned to face the tables. It only took two seconds for David's eyes to find us. First, he stared at me, and then his eyes shifted to Nathaniel, and then straight to Borden. My heart started hammering the second he stepped forward. I was back on that beach, watching as he tried to drown Nathaniel, attempted murder. That's what he'd gotten away with, because he was rich. Down the row of tables he walked, flanked by the other boys. He walked straight to our table, and he stopped right at the end. Looks like you're lost, Borden, David said. It sounded like he was using every ounce of will he had to keep his tone even. Not sure how the stench of poverty isn't driving you back to where you belong. Borden's eyes rose up to meet David's, and I was actually shocked at the strength and lack of intimidation I saw there. All these years, I'd watched him be the beta to David's alpha, but right now, I was seeing no beta. This is where we part ways, David, Borden said. His voice was even, but it possessed a power that told every ear that could hear he was serious. Excuse me? David asked, his voice similarly even. Borden's eyes flicked off to the side in a dismissive way. You and me, me and the society boys, we've come to an end. David just stared at Borden, blinking twice, three times. His lips were set in a thin line, and I saw him carefully considering his words. The society isn't something you just end. It's something you are born into. Something that carries ties for the rest of your life. Get up and come back to the table where you belong. Piss off, David, Borden said, enunciating each word just a little bit. David stood up straight, his brows furrowing together. He was silent for another three seconds, mulling over the swift, public dismissal Borden had just given him and I got really worried when a small, controlled smile pulled at the corners of his mouth. So this is what you want? he asked. He gave just one small nod. Good, because something needed to make this semester more interesting. And without another word, he walked further down the aisle before turning and taking a seat at the boys' table. Not knowing what to say, James and Gerald followed, glaring in confusion at Borden as they passed him. I realized then that I'd been holding my breath. My heart was pounding loudly in my ears. Well done, Nathaniel said, clapping Borden on the shoulder. Welcome to the Target Club. Borden just glanced over his shoulder, meeting David's searing glare. Let him do his worst, he said. 
I've never been scared of the name Sinclair. And why would he be? Borden was literal royalty, after all. And he was also a mage. So much for having a nice, quiet semester flying under the radar. Chapter One I didn't know how he did it. Nathaniel was so calm and forgiving, even when his ribs were still only half-healed, even when he still bore a black eye and stitches in his left cheek, even when he had nearly drowned, partly at the hands of the very man asking for our help. How could he just forgive Borden? But if he could forgive Borden, what right did I have not to? It didn't mean I trusted him, though. The second Borden stepped foot through the door of the solarium. I turned and walked to the jar of change Nathaniel kept on his shelf. I reached inside and grabbed the first coin my fingers wrapped around. I raised the nickel in my fist to my lips and spoke truth to it. I've never hated anyone until David Sinclair. I said the first thing that came to my mind. Borden looked over at me, a slight look of confusion on his face. But Nathaniel just looked at me, nodding in agreement the moment he realized what I was doing. I crossed back to Borden, holding his gray eyes. I wanted to read all of his truths right off his skin, written in blood. But this was the next best thing. Here, I said, extending the bewitched coin to him. Still uncertain, his brows knitted together. He held his hand out, and he took the coin from me. You aren't the descendant of Scottish royalty, I said, immediately launching into the test. Yes, I am, he said. And the moment the words came out of his mouth, his look of confusion deepened further. Your family is incredibly poor, I said next. Not at all, he corrected. He looked more bewildered by the moment. He might have had other words he wanted to say, but they changed right on his tongue, to nothing but the truth. Have you ever tried to kill anyone? Nathaniel asked, looking up at Borden from beneath dark eyes and long lashes. Borden's eye slid over to meet Nathaniel's. Yes. He answered honestly. My jaw clenched tight, my teeth grinding together as I crossed my arms over my chest. My stomach was full of knotted snakes. Their venom filled me up, poisoned me from the inside. But we had to know. Do you really hate the society boys? I asked. Every second with them, Borden said. And even though I knew he couldn't lie to me, I could tell he meant it just by the look in his eyes. Do you mean it? That you are only with them because they make you angry? Nathaniel asked, walking to my side. We stood in nearly identical positions. Yes, they're awful people. Borden's eyes flicked from mine to Nathaniel's and then back to mine. What? What's going on? Why do I feel like this? Why can't I say what I'm thinking? Because I gave you a coin of compulsion, I said, feeling a small smile curling on my lips. I felt smug, like this was some tiny shred of revenge for all of the horrible things he'd been a part of. You can't say anything that isn't the absolute truth. Would you ever reveal our secrets? Nathaniel asked, because really... That was the most important matter. Everything hinged on it. I don't think so. And that, I knew, was an honest reply. I glared darkly at Borden for a good thirty seconds, debating. What did it help us to let him in on anything? To teach him? He might say he hated the society boys, but he'd still been with them on numerous occasions of torturing Nathaniel. His hands weren't clean of the night Nathaniel was nearly drowned by them. What else do you know how to do? I asked, because at this point, the only benefit I could see to helping him was if he could help us in return.
Chapter 3 I had been looking forward to this literature class, but this was a new teacher, and this was his first semester. As I looked over the syllabus, I could tell this was going to be a horrific couple of months. The second the time ran out in class, and every student started grabbing their things and heading out the door, the girl in front of me let out an audible groan and shook her head in disgust. What, are you not a fan of Edgar Allan Poe or John Steinbeck? I asked. She groaned again. Not exactly. Sorry, I'm not meaning any offense. I chuckled and shouldered my bag. None taken. I kind of died a little inside of the reading list. Life is hard enough. I don't need to spend it reading the most depressing books in history. Right? She said, as she grabbed her own bag and we headed toward the door. I barely managed to stay afloat with homework and my parents' expectations. I don't need this shit dragging me down into the midnight dreary. I laughed, nodding in agreement. I'm Margot Bell, I said, extending a hand as we walked out the door. Related to Professor Bell? She asked. He's my dad. I nodded. She smiled in a way that told me she'd taken at least one of his classes. Mary Beth Foster, she said, shaking my hand. You must be a freshman. I don't recognize you. I shrugged. Guilty. You? Sophomore, she said, adjusting the strap on her bag. I, uh, I have to run to my next class but it was really nice to meet you. You too, I said with a smile, and as I watched her walk away, I realized I meant it. It felt like it had been forever since I'd made a new friend. All I seemed to make these days were enemies. Turning on a heel, I headed toward the library. Unlike the first week of the first semester of school, when the library was empty, it was already packed. This was the semester when everyone realized they needed to buckle down and get things done early instead of waiting until the last minute. We were ready to get serious. So, as I walked through the aisles of study tables, I had to dodge backpacks and dozens of bodies. Instead of the usual silence, there was a low hum of voices. I smiled as I spotted Nathaniel behind the reference desk. His back was turned to me and he was diligently working on organizing the returned books to the cart. I shamelessly let my eyes run down him, taking everything in, from his shoulders, his shirt pulling over his taut muscles, down to his narrow waist, and his exceptionally shaped rear end. He looked handsome in his slacks and his button-up shirt. It was his usual attire, but I never got tired of admiring him in it. Excuse me. I said, laying my hands one on top of the other on the desktop. Do you know where I can find the most alluring man in this school? The smile was already growing on his face when Nathaniel turned and looked at me. He didn't say anything in response, simply leaned across the desk and pressed his lips to mine. So, this is going to be one of those low productivity days he said in a low, teasing voice as he stood back up. I smiled, loving the feeling his words and lips gave me. I'm actually headed up to Mom's office, I said, fingering the key that was looped over the strap of my bag. I just wanted to stop by and say hi. Nathaniel smiled again, and I loved it when he did. He never smiled for anyone else. You're always my preferred hello. Come get some leftovers when you get off tonight? Nathaniel nodded and leaned over the counter once more to kiss me before I walked away. The library was crowded, but as usual, there was no one in the McCallum room, which always surprised me. This room was packed with books, though it was tiny. I threw a quick glance over my shoulder, making sure no one was within the line of sight. Then I unhooked the key moved the books that hid the lock, and undid it. 
I pulled on the shelf and it swung out, revealing the way to the spiral staircase. I closed the bookcase behind me and walked up the beautiful iron staircase. The problem with Nathaniel and I using Mom's office regularly, since it was too cold to work in a stereo house or the solarium most days, was that it now smelled like Nathaniel and me. The scent of my mother had long disappeared, leaving my heart aching with emptiness. It had been nearly four years. Four years since she simply vanished. She didn't take any of her things. She took no money. She'd made appointments for the days following her disappearance. The police thought maybe Dad had killed her and hid the body. But she had simply vanished. I knew the reason behind it was magic. Mom knew about magic and her heritage and the mages, though she called herself a witch. Mom was learning and increasing her powers and abilities. She was the whole reason Nathaniel and I could do anything beyond telekinesis and compelling coins. She'd spent years searching for the magical books that were our entire foundation, which was my reason for coming here today. I had homework. Even though it was only the second day of school, I already had assignments. But those could wait until tonight. For now, I needed to practice some self-assigned homework. I took a seat at Mom's desk. I pulled the book toward myself. Alchemy was real. There were exceptionally vague instructions in this old book Nathaniel thought originated from Ireland. I'd been able to prove that it was possible, though maybe not permanent. I had to wonder if this was where the term fool's gold came from. I could certainly pass off the gold temporarily, but within a short amount of time, it would return to a rock. I thought my ability to perform it had something to do with my affinities. Nathaniel's affinity was with paper, and he'd never been able to turn anything into gold. But mine was earth-related, and I'd been able to transform rocks into gold, both of which were naturally found in the earth. I wondered if Borden would be able to do alchemy. I doubted it. His affinity, from our exceptionally limited experience with him, seemed to be electricity. I couldn't see any kind of tie between electricity and gold. I took one of the rocks from the basket beside the desk and held it in my hand. Alchemy was a mix of words and will and blood. Thankfully for me, I was already exceptionally well-versed in Latin, so I knew what words I was saying when I'd very first read them. Spiritus sanguinis mei, et cord mium, ut quod fiorit ferum, et hoc in clara. The words felt beautiful as they rolled off my tongue. Spirit of my blood, will of my heart, take what is dull and bring it to bright. I took the pen on the edge of the desk and pricked the tip of my middle finger. As a drop of blood bubbled out, I pressed it to the rock. I watched as the blood seeped into the pores of the stone, and instantly it changed from red to brilliant, shiny gold. Veins streaked throughout the rock, growing wider, bigger. They expanded until slowly, the entire rock was consumed by shimmering gold, until the entire thing was a huge lump of gold in my hand. Will of my heart. That was the one that wasn't exactly clear. What did that mean? Much of what I was able to do as a mage was a matter of asking the object of my attention and willing it to happen. Was my will just not strong enough for gold? I let my eyes close and I let my heart reach out to it. I was aware of the gold, but it was also physically sitting in my hands. It wasn't the same as the tingle I got at the back of my neck sometimes. It felt too... normal, tangible. But I reached out. I imagined every surface of the gold. You are not a rock. You are precious, valuable gold. I spoke the words in my mind willing them to be true. I spoke the words out loud, as if it could hear me. Stay gold. Stay gold. The words repeated in my mind, over and over. 
When I could think of nothing else to try, I set the golden rock down on the desk, in line with two dozen others. All of them had been gold at one point, but now all of them looked like ordinary stones. I pulled my journal out of my bag and opened it to the next blank page. This was something exceptionally important, taking notes of everything. We recorded all of our experiments. What worked? A lot of what didn't. After going through vague notes and failing at things over and over, we didn't want future generations to have to do any guesswork. Nathaniel informed me that historically, books like these were called grimoires. The word felt dramatic, but fitting. I finished my notes, closed the book, and cast my eyes around the office. I wondered why it had been built, and by whom. It had been here long before my mom would have become a teacher. Aldridge was over 240 years old. This wasn't a new addition. Someone had seen a reason for a hidden office a long, long time ago, and somehow, my mother had inherited this space. I prayed that someday I would find her again, and she could tell me the story. Guilt ate at my stomach just a little bit. This was becoming less her space and more ours. Several of my jackets were lying around the room. Nathaniel had a change of clothes in one corner. Our notes and books were scattered everywhere. There was a stack of dirty dishes that needed to be taken back to the house on one shelf. She wouldn't mind. I kept telling myself that, because I knew it was true. She had wanted this for me someday. She'd said, in her own words, that she was going to tell me about my blood on my 18th birthday. I'd been 19 for three and a half months. This would have been the norm for a while now. We would be working on this together. My eyes flicked to the clock, and when I found it was five, I snatched my grimoire, stuffed it into my bag, and headed for the stairs. I cast one quick look back at the last stone on the desk. It was still gold. But the real test was to see if it stayed gold until I came back. Every day over the entire first week, Borden sat with us and ate lunch. Every single day, David would stop by our table and give Borden hell. Nasty words and threats. It was as if his favorite dog had suddenly decided he no longer loved his master. Borden took it. He was always exceptionally calm, never fully rising to David's taunts. He'd dismiss him like he didn't matter at all to him. And over the course of those five days, I started to believe Borden could be trusted, that he truly was done with the society boys. Meet us at the solarium at nine tomorrow morning. I said at lunch on Friday, just before Nathaniel and I walked to put away our trays. Borden looked at us with wide, surprised eyes. So, on Saturday, I went to the solarium at eight, carrying breakfast in a brown paper bag. Steam coated all the windows, blocking my view into the solarium, but I grabbed the knob and twisted, letting myself in. It was quiet inside, though a fire crackled in the fireplace. It was warm, just enough to be comfortable. I looked around and realized Nathaniel was still in bed, sleeping. I smiled as I set the bag on the coffee table and crossed the solarium. I shed my coat and then my shoes, and carefully, I lifted the covers and slid into the bed with Nathaniel. Sleepily, one eye slid open as I nuzzled up into him. A loopy smile spread on his face as he wrapped his arms around me and tucked his chin over my head. I felt my entire body relax as I wrapped myself around him. He smelled like cotton and sandalwood and paper, and it was the most intoxicating thing I'd ever smelled in my life. I could get used to this, he said echoing exactly what I'd been thinking. He pulled me in tighter, trying to drive away the cold that had seeped into my body from my walk in the snow. Buy me a gigantic bed with ten pillows on it and the fluffiest blanket you've ever seen? I said shamelessly. Promise, 
he said, pressing a kiss to my forehead. I smiled and relaxed even more, because I could picture it so easily, so exactly. Him and me, sleeping in on lazy Saturday mornings, kids running around the house and crawling into bed with us, Sunday mornings reading the newspaper, and chaotic Mondays getting ready for another week. It wasn't hard to imagine at all. You should get dressed, sleepyhead, I said, pressing a kiss to Nathaniel's throat. Borden will be getting here before too long. It's going to be awkward if we're both just lying here. Talk about being the third wheel. Nathaniel chuckled and squeezed me tighter before pressing another kiss to my temple. But he rolled over, literally over the top of me, and I laughed as he climbed out of the bed. He wore his underwear and a gray t-shirt, and I shamelessly stared as he walked to the rack that held his clothes, my elbow digging into the mattress, my head propped up by my hand. Do you sometimes feel like we're just in this limbo waiting time before our real life begins? I asked, watching Nathaniel as he dressed. Like, we know exactly where things are going to end up, but we have to wait out our dues? A small smile pulled on his lips as he looked back at me. We've only known each other for just over four months. I smirked at him. And you don't fool me for a second into thinking you feel like it's only been that long. He smiled, and I knew I'd nailed it. You're only 19 years old, Margot. I climbed out of bed and walked toward him. A 19-year-old who grew up surrounded by university professors and students. I'm only 22, he said with a smirk as I wrapped my hands behind his neck and his hands settled around my waist. Who has raised himself since he was three years old, I said, my voice dropping lower and quieter as I stared into his green eyes. Time is the enemy of all men. Nathaniel finally conceded as he lowered his forehead to mine, staring into my eyes. It will pass no matter what, and someday... We are going to get that future we both know is coming. I smiled, and honestly, I couldn't wait for our future. I couldn't wait for what we both knew was coming. But I was also going to really enjoy the journey while getting there. We ate together. Then Nathaniel restocked the fire. It grew hotter, and the condensation dripped from the glass ceiling to the ground below in an endless cycle of evaporation. Right at nine o'clock, there was a knock on the door, and it told me something, that when Borden walked in, I didn't feel a massive knot of dread in the pit of my stomach. I was actually starting to trust him. Morning. He greeted the both of us with a nod of his head. I hope you slept well, I said, which was out of my character, but I was nervous, because once we stepped down this path, there was very little chance of going back. Thanks, I did. Borden responded, nodding his head. So, Margot and I have talked. Nathaniel began, and once more, I marveled at his confidence when it came to teaching, how focused and direct he was. You've shown to be trustworthy this week. You're not caving to the society boys. So, we'll teach you something today. We'll start slow and then we'll continue every weekend until we're confident. Borden nodded, and I found myself surprised at how patient he was being. That sounds great. Thank you, he said. Nathaniel grabbed the coin of compulsion from his bookshelf and walked over to the couch, indicating for Borden to sit at it. He handed him the book. Read this, he said. It's short. It won't take long. And over the course of the next hour, we taught Borden how to enchant a coin, and we showed him how it worked by giving it to Nathaniel. Borden was a gentleman. He didn't ask too deep. He didn't dig too personal. But he'd done it, as easy as could be. Because really, this was the easiest thing in the world to do. And when he walked out of the solarium later that day, I felt even more confident. 
Despite being David's right-hand man and being absolutely awful to Nathaniel last semester, Borden was different. He was someone we could trust, and things were going to be different. Monday morning, I walked into school to find Borden and Nathaniel talking in the common room. I started crossing the room to join them when I watched as David and Gerald and Howard crossed the space toward them. I didn't hear what was said, but I saw it as Nathaniel got that glazed-over look in his eyes, the one he used to keep himself out of a fight. His hands curled at his side, but they locked by his hips. Your ego is going to be the death of you someday, David, Borden said in response to whatever had been said. Grow up and move on. David grabbed Borden's shoulders and shoved him back a few steps. I watched as Borden's jaw clenched tight. I watched his fingers curl into fists, and I saw a spark of electricity crackle over his hands. I just want some answers, David said, his voice taunting and rising, now that he knew he had everyone's attention. What makes you think you can walk away from blood like this? What makes you think you're better than the society? You really looking forward to being cut off from the name Stuart? Walk away, David, Borden said, his tone darkening. Does it turn you on? David taunted as he shoved Borden again. Their freaky brooding shit? Are they letting you into their little love nest? Is that what it is? For the first time ever, I watched as Nathaniel took a step forward, all the tendons in his jaw standing out. Back off. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Every syllable of Nathaniel's voice was a deadly warning. I saw the tendons in his arms stand out in stark contrast to the muscles on his arms. I could swear he grew two inches taller. David looked at Nathaniel, scoffing as he looked up and down. There was something in his eyes, though, that told me he just now realized Nathaniel was five inches taller than he was. David turned his eyes back to Borden. I heard Daddy Stewart found out about your desertion, that he's not too happy about some things. I wonder how that happened. Why so jealous of the name, David? Borden taunted back. Wish your daddy was a Stewart instead of a Sinclair? David snapped. His fist flew, but Borden's instincts were quicker than expected. He ducked and was only clipped in the cheek instead of straight in the face. But when Borden came back swinging, David didn't stand a chance. He caught him square in the mouth. His lips split, and instantly, blood started pouring from his mouth. Gerald and Howard jumped on David before he could swing again, and Nathaniel stepped in between the two of them. You'll regret this, Borden! David snarled as the two other boys held him back. All these years, and you go and screw it all up in the final months. Guess we know what kind of life you're going to have. I'll make you regret every decision you made since Christmas. That's a promise. Glaring death threats, David snapped out of Gerald and Howard's grip and stalked out of the common room leaving a trail of blood drops on the floor. The crowd that had been watching was shocked into silence for a solid three seconds. But as the bell rang, they headed off toward their classes. Goosebumps flashed over my skin as I watched David and the boys disappear around the corner. You sure this is worth it? I asked. This exchange? Borden touched his cheek where he got hit, but he didn't even flinch. David's an asshole, but assholes with power are even worse. This is a life lesson he's needed to learn for years. Not everyone is going to always bow down to him. I met his eyes and swallowed once. If this didn't prove his loyalty had shifted, then I wasn't sure what would. Come on, Nathaniel said, putting his hand on Borden's shoulder. Let's get you some ice before that starts swelling. Chapter 2 
January 3rd brought the first day of winter semester with it. It had snowed six inches the night before, adding to the twelve we already had, and Dad called over to the school twice to be sure they weren't delaying or canceling. They weren't. So Dad went out with a shovel to start on the driveway and the sidewalks. I stepped out onto the porch and looked in one direction and then the other. There was someone out at the end of the road, but they were far away and looking the other direction. I smiled as I looked at my father bent over his shovel, his back to me. I lifted my hand. I mentally reached out to the snow. Instantly, every bit of it lifted off the driveway and the sidewalk and then dumped itself in the center of the lawn. Dad stood up with a start, looking to the left and the right in utter confusion. His hand even went to his hat, as if he were worried it was going to float away too. I couldn't help but laugh, to which he suddenly twisted around, searching for an answer. His eyes met mine, wide with shock and maybe a little fear. I just smiled. Dad looked nervous, but he smiled and laughed too. He shook his head at me as he walked back up to the door, leaning the unneeded shovel against the side of the house. You're a handy one to have around, every now and then, Margot Bell, he said as he tapped my nose with his gloved finger. Every now and then, I said. We gathered our things and stashed them in our bags, and then we donned our thickest coats and hats and gloves and walked outside into the frigid air. I continued to clear the sidewalks, so long as no one was around to see. How does Nathaniel not freeze in that solarium? Dad asked as we set off on the sidewalk. His eyes slid in that direction, to the north end of the university. He has a fireplace, I said, casting my gaze that way too. But he's surrounded by glass, Dad said, shaking his head. No insulation. I'm worried he's going to sleep too deep one night and not stock that fireplace, and he'll just freeze to death. I smiled, and something in my heart fluttered. Dad cared about Nathaniel, truly cared about him. Nathaniel was family. While my father had never had a son, Nathaniel had become that to him. If it gets too bad, I'll make sure he stays at the house, I said. Sleeping on the couch, Dad said, fixing me with a pointed look, even though he'd let Nathaniel sleep in my bed once before and hadn't bothered to kick him out on other nights when Nathaniel had fallen asleep there after studying, like three nights ago. Of course, I said, instead of pointing all of that out. More and more students were flocking into the university in droves, it was a totally different scene from the first day of the last semester. Everyone had been half-clothed and ready to take on the world. Now, everyone was bundled up and looked like soldiers heading off to battle. It was the second semester, and we all knew what we were in for now. The floor was slippery with melted snow as we stepped inside. Shoes squeaked against the tile and voices echoed loudly through the halls. Friends caught up after the long holiday break, bragging about the exotic locations where they'd vacationed, the overpriced gifts they'd given, and the spoils of rich parents they'd received. I aimed right to head to my first class, when a set of blue eyes caught mine. David Sinclair walked toward me, flanked by James Richards and Gerald Paulson. His eyes were fixed on me. His lips were set thin and narrow. Just then, a warm hand settled on my lower back. I glanced up to see Nathaniel. He quickly bent down and kissed me with a whispered, Good morning. But I looked back at David. He looked at the two of us darkly. But there was venom missing in his eyes. I didn't see any traces of promises for vengeance in them. I didn't see any calculation in his eyes on how to win me over. 
He just held my eyes as he and his boys walked down the hall and then walked right past us. I think your little mind trick worked, Nathaniel said as he watched them go. None of them looked back after they passed us. I didn't feel promises that he was going to kill me like they were words being screamed from his eyes. I chuckled, because that was almost exactly what I'd been thinking. I slipped my hand into Nathaniel's and started down the hall. And did you notice who wasn't with them? Borden. Nathaniel said simply. I nodded. It was going to take a whole lot more than one morning for him to prove anything to us. We made our way halfway down the hall before I stopped in front of a door, riding 122. Is your schedule at the library the same this semester? I asked, hesitating in the doorway, letting the other freshman in behind me. Nathaniel shook his head. I have Mondays and Saturdays off now. I smiled, happy to hear that he had extended our weekends. Should we go to Mom's office after class then? I've got some things I want to work on. Nathaniel nodded and smiled. Happy and content, I leaned forward, accepting his kiss. This felt like the most natural thing in the world. Me and him, together in the school, falling into our own version of normal. See you after class, I said, smiling as I watched him walk away toward his own class. I had five classes this semester, the same as last, writing, Latin, a general ed science class, humanities, and a literature class. Fifteen credits would keep me plenty busy. Adding our mage studies on top of that, and I was exhausted already, not even accounting for any homework in the grand clockwork of it all. I wasn't sure how Nathaniel was going to balance his 17 credits, plus his library hours, plus mage studies. One day at a time, I suppose. That was all we could do. Nathaniel and I coordinated our lunch break this semester, so at noon, I stepped out of my Latin class and made my way to the cafeteria. It was a noisy space with the buffet along the back wall and rows of tables, six across and ten deep. I rarely ever ate lunch in here. Typically, I went back home to get food. But with our schedules this semester, our 30-minute break didn't leave quite enough time for that. It kind of felt like high school all over again. All the rich kids sat together. All the scholarship kids were scattered around the room, trying to figure out where they fit in. The lacrosse jocks stuck together, and the pre-law students were always arguing with one another at another table. I spotted Nathaniel across the room and walked over to join him. So, Nathaniel asked as we got in line for food. Was this first day of class as boring as the last? It still isn't challenging, I said as I grabbed a tray. But I think I'm not going to float by quite as easy this semester. How was yours? Nathaniel shrugged as the student employee dumped some food on his plate. I'm taking a class on early Germanic history. It's quite interesting. Is your German getting any better? I asked, raising an eyebrow at him. Du bist die schönste Frau, die ich gesehen habe. He said in what sounded like absolutely perfect German to me. Again, I raised an eyebrow at him. And what does that mean? He bent down and pressed a kiss to the hollow beneath my ear even though we were in the middle of the lunch line. He whispered close to my skin, You are the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. I blushed. Even though I knew Nathaniel was attracted to me, even though he made me feel beautiful every single day, I felt my face flush brilliant red. He simply gave me a rogue smile, and I stepped up to the register to pay for my lunch. We turned to the tables, and I set off for an empty space in the middle of the room. With no one else at the entire table, it was perfect, and it was then that I realized that Nathaniel and I were becoming loners, 
recluses. And that was absolutely okay with me. I just forked some of the less-than-great potato salad into my mouth when someone set a tray down next to Nathaniel and dropped right into the seat. Wide-eyed, I stared at Borden Stewart. He gave each of us a nod and set to digging into his food like he'd done this a million times before. My eyes still wide with shock, I looked around the lunchroom. People were staring. At least half a dozen eyes were focused on us, their brows furrowed, staring at this new development. Borden was a society boy, a senior one at that. He was a leader, a head. They stuck together. And now, he was sitting with Nathaniel and me, known outcasts. And just then, David, James, and Gerald walked in. I sat there, frozen, my eyes fixed on them, as the three of them walked to get in the food line. They weren't looking for us, but I was just waiting for it to happen. The three of us sat there silent, not saying a word. Borden just ate his lunch, but Nathaniel and I were frozen, knowing something was going to happen. The society boys got through the entire line. They paid for the food, and then they turned to face the tables. It only took two seconds for David's eyes to find us. First, he stared at me, and then his eyes shifted to Nathaniel, and then straight to Borden. My heart started hammering the second he stepped forward. I was back on that beach, watching as he tried to drown Nathaniel. Attempted murder. That's what he'd gotten away with, because he was rich. Down the row of tables he walked, flanked by the other boys. He walked straight to our table, and he stopped right at the end. Looks like you're lost, Borden, David said. It sounded like he was using every ounce of will he had to keep his tone even. Not sure how the stench of poverty isn't driving you back to where you belong. Borden's eyes rose up to meet David's, and I was actually shocked at the strength and lack of intimidation I saw there. All these years, I'd watched him be the beta to David's alpha, but right now, I was seeing no beta. This is where we part ways, David, Borden said. His voice was even, but it possessed a power that told every ear that could hear he was serious. Excuse me? David asked, his voice similarly even. Borden's eyes flicked off to the side in a dismissive way. You and me, me and the society boys, we've come to an end. David just stared at Borden, blinking twice, three times. His lips were set in a thin line, and I saw him carefully considering his words. The society isn't something you just end. It's something you are born into. Something that carries ties for the rest of your life. Get up and come back to the table where you belong. Piss off, David, Borden said, enunciating each word just a little bit. David stood up straight, his brows furrowing together. He was silent for another three seconds, mulling over the swift, public dismissal Borden had just given him. And I got really worried when a small, controlled smile pulled at the corners of his mouth. So this is what you want? He asked. He gave just one small nod. Good, because something needed to make this semester more interesting. And without another word, he walked further down the aisle before turning and taking a seat at the boys' table. Not knowing what to say, James and Gerald followed, glaring in confusion at Borden as they passed him. I realized then that I'd been holding my breath. My heart was pounding loudly in my ears. Well done, Nathaniel said, clapping Borden on the shoulder. Welcome to the Target Club. Borden just glanced over his shoulder, meeting David's searing glare. Let him do his worst, he said. 
I've never been scared of the name Sinclair. And why would he be? Borden was literal royalty, after all. And he was also a mage. So much for having a nice, quiet semester flying under the radar. Chapter 1 I didn't know how he did it. Nathaniel was so calm and forgiving, even when his ribs were still only half-healed, even when he still bore a black eye and stitches in his left cheek, even when he had nearly drowned, partly at the hands of the very man asking for our help. How could he just forgive Borden? But if he could forgive Borden, what right did I have not to? It didn't mean I trusted him, though. The second Borden stepped foot through the door of the solarium. I turned and walked to the jar of change Nathaniel kept on his shelf. I reached inside and grabbed the first coin my fingers wrapped around. I raised the nickel in my fist to my lips and spoke truth to it. I've never hated anyone until David Sinclair. I said the first thing that came to my mind. Borden looked over at me, a slight look of confusion on his face. But Nathaniel just looked at me, nodding in agreement the moment he realized what I was doing. I crossed back to Borden, holding his gray eyes. I wanted to read all of his truths right off his skin, written in blood. But this was the next best thing. Here, I said, extending the bewitched coin to him. Still uncertain, his brows knitted together. He held his hand out, and he took the coin from me. You aren't the descendant of Scottish royalty, I said, immediately launching into the test. Yes, I am, he said. And the moment the words came out of his mouth, his look of confusion deepened further. Your family is incredibly poor, I said next. Not at all, he corrected. He looked more bewildered by the moment. He might have had other words he wanted to say, but they changed right on his tongue to nothing but the truth. Have you ever tried to kill anyone? Nathaniel asked, looking up at Borden from beneath dark eyes and long lashes. Borden's eyes slid over to meet Nathaniel's. Yes. He answered honestly. My jaw clenched tight, my teeth grinding together as I crossed my arms over my chest. My stomach was full of knotted snakes. Their venom filled me up, poisoned me from the inside. But we had to know. Do you really hate the society boys? I asked. Every second with them, Borden said. And even though I knew he couldn't lie to me, I could tell he meant it just by the look in his eyes. Do you mean it? That you are only with them because they make you angry? Nathaniel asked, walking to my side. We stood in nearly identical positions. Yes, they're awful people. Borden's eyes flicked from mine to Nathaniel's and then back to mine. What? What's going on? Why do I feel like this? Why can't I say what I'm thinking? Because I gave you a coin of compulsion, I said, feeling a small smile curling on my lips. I felt smug, like this was some tiny shred of revenge for all of the horrible things he'd been a part of. You can't say anything that isn't the absolute truth. Would you ever reveal our secrets? Nathaniel asked, because really, that was the most important matter. Everything hinged on it. I don't think so. And that, I knew, was an honest reply. I glared darkly at Borden for a good thirty seconds, debating. What did it help us to let him in on anything? To teach him? He might say he hated the society boys, but he'd still been with them on numerous occasions of torturing Nathaniel. His hands weren't clean of the night Nathaniel was nearly drowned by them. What else do you know how to do? I asked, because at this point, the only benefit I could see to helping him was if he could help us in return. 
Chapter 4 On Saturday, Borden once more came to the solarium. We taught him fire starting, which was exceptionally easy for him, not surprising considering his electrical abilities. As the end of January approached, I kept hoping for warmer temperatures, but winter persisted. The snow kept falling, and the temperatures only occasionally crept above freezing, just enough to keep us from being entirely buried beneath the white snowbanks. I was headed across the grounds after school on a Tuesday, back to the library to work on some homework, when someone called my name. I cast my eyes across the blinding snow to find Borden on the opposite sidewalk, also headed back to the school. There was a bounty of student housing that surrounded Alderidge. While all the houses on the north end were for professors, all the houses on the west and south sides were for students. You headed to see Nathaniel? Borden asked as our sidewalks joined into the main one, leading for the central doors of the university. I'll say hello, but I actually have some homework to do in the library, I said, as we walked side by side toward the doors. Me too, Borden said, nodding. Mind if I walk with you? I didn't answer, but just nodded. I grew up in New York, but it's hardly any different, weather-wise. Borden said, making small talk. Everyone is always talking about wanting the weather to turn and get warmer, but I kind of love the cold. I chuckled. Must be your Scottish blood. Maybe, he said, and it was kind of nice when he smiled, and it was easy. Should I count myself lucky I didn't also get red hair? Hey, don't be colorist against red, I teased. You're a steward. Mary herself was a redhead. Borden laughed. It was a quiet and controlled thing, but it was deep, the kind that went all the way to the bottom of his belly and vibrated through his whole body. Looking sideways at him, I started to see him a little differently. He seemed so much lighter. He seemed real, like any normal person I didn't hate, like someone who just needed a change in his circle just needed someone to believe that he could be different. You know, I've been thinking, I said, moving on. If you're a mage, and I'm a mage, and Nathaniel is a mage, what is the likelihood there are more of us here at Alderidge, or more in the area? It seems like a pretty high chance, Borden said. There has to be a somewhat concentrated number of us here in the east. Out west it might be different but a lot of people immigrated here, and their families never left the area. Look at all three of us. I nodded. Exactly. If you look at family trees, they start getting really wide really fast. Our mage ancestors could have hundreds of descendants. Somehow we need to find them. We could hire a professional genealogist, Borden said. I just looked over at him with a glare. Yeah, because we have those resources. Borden looked over at me, a look of confusion on his face. And then he realized I was being sarcastic, and I realized he was being serious. Sorry, I said, looking back at the doors as we reached them and walked through. I forgot you're a hybrid, formerly a society boy, meaning incredibly connected, and now you're one of us. Nathaniel and I weren't quite cut from the same cloth as you. Money is just money, Borden said, as we walked through the hall toward the library. It does make life easier, but it's meaningless if that's all that matters to you. I have my own resources and money. I'm happy to use them to help, whatever all of this is. I shook my head as we pushed through a group of students congregating outside a classroom. Maybe someday, but I think for now, we need to figure out some kind of test we can perform on our own. Why spend money when we could come up with a free test? You mean like the glamoured book? Borden asked as he grabbed the handle of the door to the library and pulled it open, holding it for me. Exactly, I said as I dropped my voice to accommodate the quiet nature of the library. 
but something quicker and easier. I wish there was some kind of magic stick or something that we could simply touch to someone, and if they had mage blood, it would glow. You know what I mean? Borden nodded, and when I looked over at him, I could see the gears turning in his head. We need something simple and quick. Just imagine, if we had something like that, how many others like us would we discover? I shook my head, my entire chest filled with longing and amazement at the possibility. I've seen you do some pretty impossible things, Margot, Borden said. I imagine it can be done. I smiled in appreciation, but didn't say anything more. We stepped up to the reference desk, just as Nathaniel returned from an aisle, pushing the return cart. Hey, just wanted to say hi, I said, as he walked around the desk and wrapped a hand around my waist and leaned in to kiss me. We both have some homework to get on. Glad to see the two of you are finding your stride, Nathaniel said, pride in his eyes when he looked at me, which just caused me to roll my eyes at him. Margot has some interesting ideas, Borden said, moving along. If you get a break for a few minutes, you should come talk to us. Us. Us had changed. Us was getting bigger. No longer just Nathaniel and I, and the occasional conversation with my father, but now Borden, too. I will, Nathaniel said, and the tone of his voice told me he was intrigued. Mrs. Walker called for Nathaniel, so he kissed me once more and got back to work. Together, which was exceptionally weird to think, Borden and I turned, and he followed me back toward the Edom room. As usual, when we got there, there was no one inside, but there was a fire raging in the fireplace, keeping this far end of the library warm. Borden took one couch, taking his books and papers out of his backpack. He scattered them across the coffee table in front of him and immediately got to work. I took my things and laid them out, but I found my mind wandering. I found myself going through every book we'd found useful in Mom's office. Compulsion, glamouring, alchemy, transfiguration, fire-starting, altering memories, and a few others that, so far, we hadn't figured out the functionality of. None of that seemed helpful to me. We couldn't make people confess to being a mage if they didn't know what they were. Glamouring did nothing. Alchemy was useless. Maybe there would be something with transfiguration, but we were having a really hard time with that. Lighting people on fire didn't do us any good, and altering their memory did nothing either. I'd done things without instruction before. Maybe I could do it again. My head jerked up when someone stepped inside. Oh, sorry, no one is ever in here. Mary Beth stood there, looking ready to turn out of the room when she realized who I was. Hey, I said, offering her a smile. You don't have to run away. There's plenty of room in here. Borden and I were just working on homework. You sure? She asked. Awkwardly, she looked from Borden to me and back again. She'd seen Nathaniel and I together plenty of times. But here I was, alone in a room with another guy. Just me and him. Of course, please, I said, nodding her in. She offered a smile and walked in sitting on the other end of the couch from me and taking her things out. Borden, this is Mary Beth Foster, I said. Mary Beth? Borden Stewart. It's nice to meet you. Borden said with a nod. Foster, is that any ties to the Foster room? Guilty, Mary Beth said, her eyes dropping in slight embarrassment. I mean, really? I shouldn't even have been able to get into Alderidge. But when your grandparents donated millions and have a whole room named after them, you're from those Fosters? I asked in awe. I'm a Latin major. You're welcome? She said awkwardly. The Foster room was filled with Latin books, a large portion of them donated by the Foster family. Sorry, that's just... 
I didn't know how to finish the sentence. I'd already made things plenty awkward. No, it's fine, Mary Beth said. My family's a bit obsessed with books, too. I dare say, like, a third of the books here came from my family. Latin, fiction, academic, even useless fairy tales. When Grandma runs out of room in the house, she sends them here. I shook my head with a laugh. Did you inherit her love of books? Mary Beth shrugged. Maybe not her same level of obsessiveness, but yeah, I've read a few books in my day. I chuckled and smiled. This was nice and weird. I hadn't hung out with other kids my own age in forever, except for Nathaniel, and here I was with two others. And like normal college students, we each got to work on our own homework. An hour passed, and I wrapped up my Latin work. Another passed, and I completed my humanities homework. And just as I closed my last book, my stomach let out a ravenous growl. Dinner time? Mary Beth asked as she raised an eyebrow at me with a smile. What time is it? Borden asked as he checked his very expensive-looking watch. How is it already six? Just then, Nathaniel walked in, and if he was surprised to see Mary Beth, he didn't show it. The inclusion of Borden into our group seemed to change him. He was open, more accepting. Honestly, he kind of reminded me of Dad sometimes. It was hard to believe he wasn't already a professor. Think you can skirt out of work early? Borden asked as he started packing up his things. We're all going out for pizza. We are? I asked, raising an eyebrow. I am dying for pizza, Mary Beth said. All agreement and on board. If I have to wait two minutes longer for food, I am going to die, Marco. I laughed and shook my head, joining them in packing up my stuff. Mrs. Walker just told me to head home, actually, Nathaniel said. And I can't remember the last time I had pizza. What are we waiting for, then? Mary Beth asked as she slung her bag over her shoulder. I gave Nathaniel a look, one that acknowledged how bizarre this felt to me, too, that we were going out with... friends? But he just smiled and slid his hand into mine as we turned for the door and followed Borden and Mary Beth out. It was even colder outside when we stepped out. The wind had picked up a little, and snow threatened to fall from the sky. But we walked quickly hurrying toward the pizza shop just down the road from Alderidge. We all stumbled through the door as snow began to blast from the sky. The hostess took us to a booth toward the back, took our orders, and brought drinks. Mary Beth is one of those fosters, I said to Nathaniel, raising impressed eyebrows. This doesn't need to be a thing, Margot, she said. I really wish you wouldn't make this a thing. Foster, Nathaniel said, and I knew exactly where he was headed the moment he said her name. Irish. Mary Beth nodded. Mostly. Great-great-granddad was Scottish. Actually, I'm pretty sure I have an ancestor who was killed in Salem. How grim and cool is that? Instantly, my eyebrow shot up toward my hairline, and I looked at Nathaniel. There was a spark in his eyes and Borden looked just as surprised. I do too, I said, my words coming out a little breathy with shock. Mayor McGregor. That actually sounds familiar, Mary Beth said with a smile. Hey, we must be like second cousins or something like that. I think that would make you third cousins, twice removed, Nathaniel said, his tone reflective. Nice to reconnect, cuz, Mary Beth said playfully. She reached for her cup and held it up. It took me half a second to realize she was making a toast. I awkwardly raised my own cup and touched it to hers. But my mind was now racing a million miles a minute. 
I was dying to ask more. I needed to know if there were any witch trials in Ireland. I needed to know just how direct of a descendant of Mare, Mary Beth, was, though I was pretty sure she wouldn't know. I needed the Glamour Telekinesis book. I needed to test Mary Beth right then. But I couldn't do any of that. I had to act normal. I had to pretend this was nothing more than an evening out with friends. So, for an entire hour, the three of us faked it. We held it together. Until finally, at eight, Mary Beth declared that she needed to head back to her house. Thanks for the pizza, she said, smiling. We should do this again sometime. We will. All three of us responded with the exact same words. She just laughed and headed to the door, and we all watched her as she turned the corner and walked down the sidewalk. She's got to be one of us, I blurted the second she was out of sight. Ireland was different from England and Scotland. They had very few witch hunts. But I know I've read the name Foster among the ones that did take place. Nathaniel let out all the words he'd been holding in this entire time. And if she really is related to Mary McGregor, that would mean she has mage blood on both sides. We have to tell her, too, Borden said. She's one of us. She, we need her. We stared at one another for a solid ten seconds while we thought through this. I can test her tomorrow during class, I said. I'll bring the glamoured book to class and ask her if she can read it. With her family, there's a chance she can just read Gaelic, Borden said. But still, and you're right, Margot, we need another way to easily test people. If Mary Beth is one of us, too. There could be a dozen others just at Alderidge, I said breathily. Turning to Nathaniel, Borden and I explained our idea of creating a way to test people simply by touch or something similar. You're right, Nathaniel said. This, if Mary Beth really is one of us, and there are others, it will change everything. I said. Chapter 5 On Wednesday, I brought the Glamour Telekinesis book to school with me. It felt like this golden beacon in my bag, screaming to all the world that it could reveal secrets. And as I walked to school that day, a thought occurred to me. This book only revealed itself to other mages. I'd written off glamouring before, but maybe it was exactly what was needed. Someone, at some point, had hidden the book from anyone but mages. We could use glamouring to create some kind of test, one that was easier and quicker than seeing if someone could read a book. I wasn't sure what the solution was yet, but I knew between Nathaniel and Borden and me, we could figure it out. My brain was reeling, thinking through all the possibilities when I stepped into the hall and found Borden sitting in a chair against the wall. The blank expression in his eyes told me something was wrong. I pushed my way through the crowd and came to stand in front of him. Hey, I said. What's wrong? Borden's eyes rose up to mine, and in them, I saw hollow worry and anger and... He just looked lost. David follows up with his threats. Borden said. He got in touch with my family, told my dad I'd walked away from the society boys. He was waiting for me at my dorm when I got home last night. I felt the color drain from my face, and I didn't even know what all of this meant yet. And? Borden shook his head as his eyes shifted away from me and fixed at a random point in front of him. It was an interrogation to put it lightly, Borden said. His voice grew deeper with each word. He wanted to know why and what had happened to make me leave a society that has ties to our family going back five generations. Me telling my father that it was because the society was filled with a bunch of bullying assholes wasn't an acceptable answer. I didn't know what to say. 
These were a different breed of people than I was used to dealing with. But I did notice the electricity crackling along Borden's hands, singeing his slacks, though he didn't seem to realize. I'm under investigation, Borden said, his voice hard and tight. On probation in my own family, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. He scoffed and shook his head. Whatever. Dad can cut me off or shame me. I have my own money and dealings. This semester is already paid for, and then I graduate. I'll deal with all these assholes later. Borden stood, looking around as if he wasn't sure where he was supposed to go. He was talking like he wasn't worried, like he didn't care. But I could see it in his eyes, how much this was affecting him. I'm so sorry, Borden, I said, shaking my head. If this is too much, if you need... I need to be my own man, Borden said, cutting me off. His eyes met mine again, and I saw the conviction and fire in them. I need to be who I am, and I won't apologize to any of them for it. This doesn't mean anything is changing. Thanks for listening, Margot. I didn't mean to worry you with it all. I realized then, Borden's moods could change, just like the electrical storms he could create. The aura around him felt darker, the air more charged. With an angry cloud, he turned and set off down the hall, beelining toward his first class of the day. And I realized then that at some point, we were all going to have to make sacrifices for this. Resurrecting magic and being what we were was dangerous and difficult. How bad did we want this, and how much were we really willing to commit to it? If it came down to it, was I ready to sacrifice in the same way Borden was possibly going to have to? I didn't have any answers to those questions, so I turned and headed down the hall to go deal with my first class. We were all in agreement, but I still found myself questioning as I walked down the hall to my English class. Was this the right thing to do? Were we sure? Once I did this, could we really go back? But that was fear and insecurity talking. If Mary Beth was one of us, we needed her, and she had a right to know. So I held my head high as I walked down the hall and I didn't hesitate as I turned into the classroom. She was sitting at her usual desk in front of mine when I walked in. When her eyes caught mine, she smiled and sat up. Thanks for letting me go out with you guys last night, she said as she turned, watching as I set my bag down on the ground and took my own seat. It's been a while since I went out with friends. I was actually thinking the same thing the whole time. I said, smiling, it's usually just Nathaniel and me. Borden is a recent addition. How long have you and Nathaniel been together? She asked, raising her eyebrows in a somewhat suggestive way. I didn't blush, because it wasn't the way she was likely thinking. Since last fall, it was kind of one of those quick, immediate things. She sighed as she rested her cheek against her fist, her elbow on my table. You're lucky. I dated this guy for almost all of my freshman year, but he wasn't that into it. I could tell. Nathaniel looks at you like you're the freaking sun, moon, and stars. I did feel my face flush then, because I knew it was true. Just lucky, I guess. More students were filtering into the classroom, and I knew my time was running out. I bent and fished the telekinesis book out of my bag. My heart started hammering, and my palms were sweating. Do you happen to know ancient Gaelic? I asked, trying to play it casual. Mary Beth shrugged. Grandmother really wanted the entire family to learn, but it never seemed particularly useful, so I didn't bother. I nodded like it didn't matter, and opened it to the middle of the book. I think this might have been one of the books she donated. Take a look. I handed it to her. She took it, and I paid special attention to how she grabbed it. Her index fingers spread over the spine, 
and her thumb balanced between the pages, touching the paper directly. Probably, Mary Beth said. Grandmother loves books about magic. She's donated hundreds of fairy tales and fantasy stuff. My heart thundered now. I hoped I didn't look like a total maniac, but I knew my eyes were a little too wide. I looked a little too shocked. You can read it? I asked, before I could think of some smoother way to say it. Mary Beth looked at me with furrowed brows, an amused look on her face. I know I said I shouldn't have been able to get into Alderidge, but yes, I can read just fine. I shook my head, trying to keep up with my thoughts that were running a million miles an hour. No, sorry, that's not what I meant, I... But I was cut off by the professor as he dove into the lesson. Mary Beth just smiled at me and shook her head. Making things fly with your mind does sound fun. She whispered as she set the book down on my desk. She gave me a wink before turning to face forward. Mary Beth was a mage. She was one of us. It was no longer just Nathaniel and I, tasked impossibly with bringing magic back on our own. There were four of us. Who knew how many others there were? We could do this. We could bring back an entire lost race. I practically ran to lunch after class. I waited impatiently as students floated in and out around me. I was actually biting my nails by the time Nathaniel walked into the cafeteria, Borden in tow behind him. She could read the book. I blurted out as soon as they walked up. No problem. She could read the book. She's one of us, Nathaniel said, a small smile pulling in the corner of his mouth. Glad to not be the only newbie, Borden said, and he actually did seem glad for it. We have to tell her, I said, as we stepped into line. I took a tray and grabbed my food. It was Wednesday. I wouldn't see Mary Beth again until Friday, unless I went looking for her. I thought through it as I walked from the checkout to our now normal table. Do we wait until this weekend? I asked as we sat down. I feel like it's something we should all do together, but you don't have a day off until Saturday. My next lesson is Saturday, Borden pointed out as he sat beside me. Seems like an easy way to kill two birds with one stone. I looked at Nathaniel, who considered it for a moment, and finally he gave a nod. That sounds like a solid plan to me. I nodded as well. I have some ideas about our tester as well. How overwhelmed is everyone right now? Maybe we could meet tonight after your shift? I could see the tiredness on Nathaniel's face already. His face had always been slightly gaunt, but now the hollows beneath his eyes were more intense and noticeable. But he didn't hesitate when he nodded. Meet at the solarium at nine then, I said with a nod. It had been dark for three hours by the time I told my father where I was going and headed to the solarium. The snow was crunchy and crisp. The weather had gotten a few degrees above freezing today and thus had started melting. But now the temperatures had plunged again, leaving everything frozen and slick. Smoke was rising from the chimney in the solarium, and I kind of wondered how no one but Borden had ever found Nathaniel living there. Not that this end of the school looked safe. It really did look like it could all collapse and be swallowed up at any moment. But I didn't fear for my life as I walked past the fence and headed down the overgrown path. Borden was already inside when I stepped in. He and Nathaniel were talking, both their arms folded over their chest, looking concerned. What's wrong? I asked, hanging my scarf on the tree stand. My parents called this afternoon, Borden said. They've spoken with the society about my desertion. They're worried that I'm going to screw up my education, that I won't be able to handle the business when it's my time to take over. They're cutting me off. My heart sank into my stomach. The society continues after Alderidge? Borden's lips disappeared into a thin line, and he nodded his head. 
these families go way back, to the founding of the country almost. They all stay in touch. They are all connected with their business dealings. My father and David's have worked together in some form since their own time here at Alderidge. And I realized then just what Borden was willing to sacrifice. Borden, why is this worth it to you? We're, we're just a couple of acquaintances. This, you could forget about magic and move on with your life. Go live the way you were supposed to. How is this worth it to you? Borden fixed me with his eyes, and I knew whatever came out of his mouth, he meant the words. Some people just have intensely honest eyes like that. There have been expectations placed upon the shoulders of Stuart children for centuries, he said. We've been expected to live our lives a certain way since the old days in Scotland. I've been a good son, I've done my duties, and I am still a good man who is still going to do something great and big, and somehow, I am going to make my parents proud. But I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to be my own person. And if they can't respect me along the way, then I don't need it. Let them see the end results. Little by little, I was coming to realize that Borden was different. He wasn't the same person he was when he tormented us with the society boys. I wasn't exactly ready to forgive and forget, but slowly, he was proving trustworthy. I really respect that, Borden, I said. My words came out tight and hoarse. I don't know if I'd have that same kind of strength. Borden pressed his lips together again and nodded. He stepped forward and wrapped his arms around me. And in that moment, it wasn't difficult to reciprocate the hug. Nathaniel stepped forward too, wrapping his long arms around us, holding tight. I took a deep breath as I released the both of them and let it out between my lips. Okay, right. It's getting late. My idea. We turned, and I walked to the couch, leaning against one arm. Nathaniel stayed where he was, folding his arms over his chest. Borden took a seat at the desk, listening intently. The telekinesis book reacts to mages, I said. I didn't think anything about the glamouring book before, but if you think about it, it's already the only test we have. What if we were able to take some kind of hybrid approach with the glamouring book and the transfiguration book? Create an object that transfigures itself when held or touched by a mage, but remains glamoured when touched by any regular human? Nathaniel asked. Exactly, I said the excitement in my voice increasing. It needs to be quick and easy. I mean, as in something we can walk through the halls at school with and touch people, without them even knowing what we're doing, and instantly be able to tell. We joked and said a stick earlier, but that would be the easiest thing. Borden spoke up. You could walk around with it and touch people without them even noticing. So. We're wanting to create a magic wand that glows when it touches another mage? Nathaniel said, the humor of it showing in his face. I chuckled just twice, recognizing how ridiculous it was. Yes, I'm talking about creating a magic wand that glows when it touches others like us. Borden laughed and shook his head. This is ridiculous, but it should work. Nathaniel's eyes were wandering, and I could see the gears turning in his head a million miles a minute. I think we can make it work. That isn't to say it will be any time soon. Transfiguration hasn't been going the smoothest. At that confession, Borden gave me a look, to which I simply shrugged. I think we need something simple, something that doesn't look suspicious, Nathaniel said and I knew he was always thinking about our safety and how our ancestors had essentially been hunted to extinction. At that, Borden held up a pencil that had been laying on Nathaniel's desk. Solid and simple, small and straight. I think we found our magic wand, 
I said with a smirk. And just think, we could enchant hundreds of pencils and spread them around the school. We'd be able to tell who our fellow mages were very quickly. Pencils are cheap, Borden said in agreement. We could buy thousands of them and get them spread throughout the entire school. We'd be able to find each other in a matter of weeks, Nathaniel said, the excitement and fear growing in his voice. This, we might be able to find them all faster than we're prepared for. Think about it. What would it mean if we found dozens of others in a matter of weeks? How do we manage it? How do we teach them? Who is in charge, or is anyone in charge? How do we keep it from getting out of hand? and someone exposing all of us, and then all of us are hunted into extinction again. My heart was racing and thundering, and instantly my palms were sweating nervously as I pictured it all. We could overrun ourselves before we even knew what the hell we were doing. Then we need to start slow, Borden said, and I was instantly grateful that he could think logically when I was losing all of my ability to do so. We start with Mary Beth. We get our feet under us. We keep learning ourselves. And we slowly, slowly expand. We need a school, I said, as the realization hit me. We need somewhere safe to learn and teach. We need a safe, controlled environment where we can explain it all, especially our history and the risk we are always under. We need to go about this the way any other leaders get trained and educated. First, we need teachers who know what they're doing, Nathaniel said, raising an eyebrow. How can we teach others when we hardly know anything? It's all been lost and scattered around the world. We need more books, more information, Borden said, clear and concise, proving that he would indeed be a successful person someday. We need more training and experience, and then we need money. We need that school, and we need leaders to start it all. This escalated so quickly. I'd come here to talk about a test, something to show us who the others were. And here we were, talking about opening our own school, about discovering dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of others. I sat back in the couch, thinking through it all. I'm done, I said. I didn't mean to speak the words out loud. I don't have time for anything else. School, Alderidge, all of that. It doesn't matter anymore. Let the rest of the world get their degrees and their normal jobs. I need to be putting my time and my focus on this. I looked up at the two of them, and with the words, I felt my confidence growing. I'll finish this semester, but once it's over, I'm calling it. This is my last semester, Borden said. I'll graduate at the end of April, and then I'll be in control of all my time again. We can do whatever it takes. I almost didn't want to look at Nathaniel. I knew how important his education was to him, how hard he'd fought to get here. I didn't want him to feel like he needed to end his as well, when after this semester, he would only have one year left. We'll give this everything we've got, he said instead, and I understood him then. He would set his priorities, but nothing had to be decided 100% right now. And we'll do whatever it takes to bring us together. Chapter 6 We came up with a plan. We needed something actionable or I would go out of my mind with how overwhelming it all was. We needed a list, a time frame, a course that would set us down the path to accomplishing our goals. We would tell Mary Beth what she was. We would have our lesson with her and Borden. We would work on enchanting the pencils, but not just to reveal who the mages were, but also anything that possessed magical properties, including books. Once we had that, we would go through every book in the Aldridge Library, as well as the Boston Public Library, as well as every book and record we could get access to in Salem. 
and every other place that had books within a 20-mile radius. That alone might take us the entire year, even more, but it was clear and promising. And we would study. We'd learn and study until we were exhausted, and then we'd work some more. And once we felt like we had a grasp on this, when we felt ready, we would extend. We would start testing and reaching out to others. We would create that school. Somehow, someday. It was overwhelming, but it was a plan, and we needed one of those. We needed direction. So, as Friday approached, I set step one into motion. I asked Mary Beth if she wanted to get together on Saturday, and she happily agreed, and we made plans to meet at the main doors of the school at 10 o'clock. At 9, Nathaniel and Borden and I got together at the solarium, and we went over the plan. The weather was warm for the first time in forever, so we decided it was time to return to Asteria House. At 10 o'clock, we walked across the grounds, and there Mary Beth was, waiting for us. Another group outing, she said with a smile. I'm kind of liking the direction this is going. I've always wanted to be part of a crew. I laughed and shook my head. You have no idea. We're even diverse, she said, as she started walking with us without even knowing where we were going. We have one of each grade. Borden, the wise senior. Nathaniel, the handsome, brooding junior. Me, the sophomore. And Margot, the freshman who is probably smarter than all of us. You forgot your own descriptor, I pointed out as I raised an eyebrow at her. Mary Beth, the sophomore, who adoringly always speaks her mind. She shrugged with a smile. What good does beating around the bushes do? A hunter, this one, Nathaniel said. She's just trying to quickly expose her prey. Direct and swift, Mary Beth said in agreement as we stepped out onto the beach and set off south. Where are we going, by the way? We've got something we'd like to show you, I said, trying to put her at ease. This isn't like some weird sex square, is it? Mary Beth asked, though her tone was still joking. Because I might be open-minded, but when there's more than two people involved, I kind of have to draw a line. Wow, I said, nodding my head with a smile. That was quite the jump, Mary Beth. Well, think about it, she said with a laugh. She was saying all of this for fun. There's you and Nathaniel, and anyone looking at the two of you knows you're going to be together forever. And Borden doesn't really make sense, considering everyone knows David was trying to get with you last year. Now Borden just follows the two of you around. And here I am now. So what am I supposed to think? Or is this just really a poorly executed date set up for him? What, are you saying you wouldn't date me? Borden asked with a mocking smile and raised brow. Mary Beth actually took several long moments of evaluating him openly. I mean, you are kind of hot, in that good boy way, classically pretty, and I know you're rich, but I think I kind of have a thing for bad boys with dark hair and brooding eyes. Borden just laughed, shaking his head. Say what you really mean, Mary Beth. I teased her. No wonder you were let down by that guy last year. Bad boys tend to have their reputations for a reason. But they make life oh so exciting. She said with a smirk and a shrug of her shoulder. We got to the bank leading up to Asteria House and turned up onto it. Nathaniel pulled me up, followed by Borden, who extended a hand down to Mary Beth. Don't be getting any ideas, pretty boy she said as she took his hand and let him pull her up. You are ridiculous, Borden said, and from his tone, I could tell he was playing, but also a little bit serious. As long as I'm not boring, she said, winking as she walked past him and came to my side. 
she looped her arm through mine and followed me without question to the steps leading up into the abandoned house. I literally don't even know how to react to the dynamic going on here, Nathaniel said from the other side of me. I just laughed and hugged into his side more, rising onto my tiptoes to press a kiss to his cheek. You'd better get used to them, Borden said to Mary Beth. It gets a little stomach-churning at times. Don't be jealous, she said. They're ridiculously adorable. So what if I am a little jealous, Borden said. I'm a senior in college, and the most serious relationship I've ever had is with my financial advisor. Mary Beth gave a pitying noise. Okay, fine, I'll go on one date with you, but you're paying. It's too late, Borden said, shaking his head. You've already told me you aren't attracted to me. You've bruised my ego. Let's all just move on with our lives. As we all laughed, I felt good, peaceful, like things were falling into place, and that even though we were all so different, this was how things were meant to be. I kind of loved the four of us together as a crew. We stepped into the empty bedroom, and as Mary Beth and Borden looked around, I knew neither of them had ever been here before. We worked our way through the bedroom into the massive living room. Nathaniel and I had nailed sheets up over the broken window in an attempt to keep out the cold rain and snow. They flapped slightly in the breeze, but it was indeed warmer in here than outside. This place is kind of freaky, Mary Beth said as she let go of me and walked around. Didn't the Asteria family just walk away from this place after that storm? Nathaniel nodded. It's been about 20 years since anyone lived here. So, you guys are the type that likes abandoned houses and spooky graveyards? She asked as she ran her hand over the back of a chair that had no bottom to it anymore. Not exactly, I said, as my heart rate started spiking. We're the type that has something to share with you, and it's about yourself, something you never knew. Mary Beth looked back at me then and for the first time, she got a look of concern on her face. I glanced at Nathaniel and wondered if this fear and uncertainty was how he felt the first time he told me. We have a common ancestor, I said, turning my attention back to Mary Beth. Mayor McGregor was killed in Salem for being a witch, because she really was one. For the first time ever, Mary Beth didn't have anything to say. Her eyes slid from me to Nathaniel and then to Borden, as if she was waiting for either of the two of them to laugh at my joke. There was a surge of magic between 1500 and 1700, Nathaniel said, stepping in and filling in where I was lacking. You've heard of the trials here in the States but there were full-on witch hunts in just about every part of the world between those years. Europe, Asia, much of Africa. My ancestors were killed in England, Borden's in Scotland. All three of us are descendants of people who had magical abilities. I slid the bag from my shoulder and pulled out the telekinesis book. I made up all that stuff the other day, I said as I opened it and walked toward Mary Beth, who still stood there silent and staring. I have no idea if your grandmother donated it, but Nathaniel found it almost a year ago, and only certain people can read it. I set the book down on the table in front of her, open. Can you read it now? I asked, and my heart continued to hammer and race. Mary Beth's eyes dropped to the book. Her eyes darted back and forth, and the longer she looked at it, the more her brows furrowed together. Wait, the other day I could read it just fine, she said, looking up at me for a brief moment. Is this a different book? I shook my head. That's why I asked if you knew Gaelic. That's what it's written in, though we found out it's just utter nonsense. 
I stepped forward and gently grabbed her wrist and moved her hand toward the pages. Touch it. She gave me an uncertain, questioning look, but she did it. And exactly like I had, like Borden had, she leaned in closer, her brows concerned. She withdrew her hand and then touched it again. You can read it when you touch it, can't you? Borden asked. She glanced over her shoulder at him, awe and confusion on her face. She looked back at the book and did it again. How did you guys do this? I've never seen this kind of circus trick. It's not a circus trick, Nathaniel said. You share Mayor McGregor's blood, just like I share William Nightingale's, and Borden shares Christian Stewart's. They were mages, and so are all four of us. Mary Beth looked back at us, and for the first time, I saw something new in her eyes. A mix between concern and maybe just a little bit of fear. Okay, I thought you guys seemed fun and maybe a little weird and adventurous, but I didn't realize you were all delusional. I didn't even have to say anything. Borden turned for the massive fireplace, which still had a few logs in it from the last time Nathaniel and I came here. He rubbed his hands together, and they instantly sparked with electricity, something Nathaniel and I couldn't do. And then he snapped his fingers, staring intently at the logs. They instantly lit on fire. There was a rustle of paper from upstairs, and two seconds later, a train of four paper airplanes came swooping down the stairs and circled around Mary Beth. I closed my eyes for a moment and reached out to every speck of dirt that was lying on the ground and asked it to lift. When I opened my eyes, there was a massive amount of dirt floating in the air. Trust me, we all know how you're feeling, I said, even as I kept my concentration. But we're not delusional. Mary Beth's breath was coming in and out in sharp, unsteady pulls. She kept looking around, from the airplanes that continued to fly around the house, to the dirt I was making levitate, to Borden's fire that had leapt to life. How are you doing this? She breathed shakily. We're mages, I said, trying to keep my tone calm and soothing. And we can teach you how to do it, too. A laugh percussed out of her chest, startling me. It was followed by another one, and then a whole string of them. Her hand darted out, and she snatched one of Nathaniel's paper airplanes out of the air as it passed by her. She turned it over in her hand, checking for wires. I gathered up all the dirt in the air, and I sent it out one of the broken windows upstairs. Mary Beth watched as it raced up the stairs and then we all watched through the window as it fell to the ground outside. Show me, she said in marveled wonder. I want to know how he started the fire. In the end, Borden didn't learn anything new. We went over the same things we taught him, the coin of compulsion, which didn't work for Mary Beth, and then fire starting, which Mary Beth also wasn't able to do. Yet, the three of us hadn't had a hard time with either of those things to start with, but maybe we'd just gotten lucky. Maybe for Mary Beth, it was just going to take practice and time. She had a million questions. We answered what we could. Nathaniel told her the history, our speculations that we'd been hunted to extinction. We told her that we thought there were others out there, but that we needed to figure out what we were doing first. We told her the plan. We told her about the pencils we planned to enchant to test with. I told her why after this semester, I was dropping out of school. And she was fascinated with it all. She was no longer scared. I'm in, she said, as the day outside grew dark. Apparently I'm garbage at this, but I'm in. This is the most crazy, insane, Beautiful thing I've ever seen, and I'm with you all 100%. I beamed with excitement at her acceptance. I crossed the space and wrapped my arms around her shoulders. 
Welcome to the crew, then. Over her shoulder, I just saw Nathaniel shake his head with a smile. Chapter 7 Maybe we'd bitten off more than we could chew with Mary Beth. From the moment we told her what she was and showed her what we could do, she was all over it. Within days, she had a record of her family history tracing back to the 7th century, which, of course, Nathaniel drooled over. We were able to target the mage line exactly, going from Mare all the way back up to the McGregor line. We found they were clan leaders at one point and had a large family. Most of them were killed in a war in the Battle of Flodden. However, Nathaniel was unable to confirm the possible Foster line. The name he had considered, the one he knew was killed, was nowhere to be found in Mary Beth's ancestry. But with all of these branches, I had to wonder how many of them were mage lines. How many of these direct descendants were mages? All of them? Or did it stem from one particular ancestor? Did anyone with a mage ancestor become a mage? What if it was limited to only certain people? How pure and direct did the blood have to be to carry it on? In the end, we were left with more questions than answers, but no one was complaining. And Mary Beth had hired a personal librarian to go through her family's books and make a catalog of the ones that could possibly be related to magic. The books were to be shipped directly to her dorm here at Alderidge. And every night that first week after we told Mary Beth what she was, we all met in my mother's secret office after Nathaniel got off of his shift. We worked for an hour on enchanting the pencils. We studied that glamouring book. We practiced glamouring all kinds of things. In the end, we found hiding text was actually easy, so long as we had another book filled with another language. It was almost like psychic copying. We made it so every book my mother had found couldn't be read by anyone but a mage. But no matter how much Mary Beth tried, she wasn't successful at accomplishing anything. Though we weren't all that worried, because Borden couldn't make the glamouring work either. We moved on to the wands. We needed to recognize mage blood, Nathaniel said one night. He leaned against the desk, his arms folded over his chest. He looked exhausted, and I know how little he was sleeping these days. Between school, work in the library, our work here, and his homework, I was getting worried. We can't have it reacting to normal human blood. I think we need to do something with actual, physical blood. Everyone, come here, Borden said, as he grabbed an empty glass and set it on the table. He then pulled out a pocket knife with a box of matches. He pricked the pad of his thumb and squeezed it into the jar, letting out a few drops. He wiped the knife off, held the blade over the flames for a moment, and then passed the knife on to Mary Beth. She didn't even hesitate as she pierced her skin and let her blood run into the glass. Nathaniel and I looked at each other. Apparently, neither of us were as bold and brave as Mary Beth or Borden. We hesitated. But after just a moment, Nathaniel pierced his skin and dropped his blood in the jar, and then I did the same. Now what? Borden asked, as he watched our blood, which all looked the same, mix and mingle in the glass. We stared at it for a few moments. We didn't know what we were doing. We had no instruction manual, no wise old teacher. It was just us, four college kids trying to do magic. What if we soak the pencils? Mary Beth said. The blood needs to saturate into it, and I don't think any of us wants to pour in that much blood. But even if it's diluted, it will still soak in. She grabbed a glass of water that had been sitting on the other end of the table and poured it into the glass, turning it pale pink as our blood mixed. Nathaniel grabbed one of the pencils that lay on the desk, stirred it till it was all blended together, and then dropped it into the glass. It sank all the way in, covered from tip to eraser. The glamour reveals what's real. Nathaniel said, as he held his chin on his bald fist. 
so we're going to have to transfigure it to look the way we want it to when it reveals a mage. I like your glowing idea, I said, glancing over at Borden. He just smiled. Right, Nathaniel said with a nod. He stood and held his hands over the glass. His focus was intense as he looked at the glass, and I watched as they glowed, gold floating in the air. It didn't matter how many times I'd done this or seen Nathaniel use magic. It seemed impossible every single time. It changed from tip and then to eraser. The pencil turned white and then clear, as if it were made of glass. And then it started to glow a soft blue and grew brighter by the moment. That is incredible, Mary Beth said in a bold statement as she watched it happen. Nathaniel just smiled, pleased with himself. It was by far the best transfiguration any of us had yet done. Now the glamour? I asked. Nathaniel stepped back, indicating his hand for me to do the honors. I held my hands around the glass and let my eyes slide closed. I pictured it looking like a normal, everyday pencil. I pictured it having yellow sides and a rubber eraser. I imagined it looking like any pencil I'd ever used in my entire life. Brilliant! Mary Beth breathed out. I opened my eyes, and there it was. It looked like any normal pencil again. Cautiously, Nathaniel grabbed it by the eraser. The second his fingers touched it, it looked crystal clear and glowed blue again. What does it look like to you? Nathaniel asked looking around. Like a glowing blue wand, Mary Beth said with a smile of amazement. It's a wand, Borden concluded in agreement. I just smiled at Nathaniel and nodded my head. Now we need to test it, Nathaniel said, holding it firmly in his grasp. He turned for the bookshelves and the boxes discarded in the corner. He wrapped the sleeve of his shirt around the wand, and instantly, it looked like a normal pencil again. Nathaniel touched it to the spine of the fire starting book, and it faintly glowed blue and looked somewhat opaque. Not the same reaction as touching an actual mage, I said, but still a change. Borden grabbed a handful of the books from the boxes and set them on the shelf next to the fire starting book. Nathaniel touched the eraser to the spines, and it still looked exactly like a pencil. He looked back at all of us in awed wonder. He reached over and touched it to the book on altering and stealing memories. Once more it changed, turning crystalline and blue. It works, Nathaniel said breathily. It works. We need to test it on a person next, Borden said. Come on, I said, gathering up my things. We're going to my house. We can test it on my dad. Won't he wonder why we're acting like lunatics? Mary Beth questioned as she gathered her things as well. Professor Bell knows everything, Nathaniel explained as he carefully slipped the wand into his breast pocket. We thought he deserved to know, considering what happened to his wife. We hadn't told either of them what that meant. So on the walk over, I got to explain the whole painful backstory of how my mother disappeared, how the police thought my father did it, then had no explanation, and how all of us, Nathaniel, my father, and myself, thought she disappeared because of something to do with magic. I explained how I couldn't keep it from my father, how Nathaniel and I had told him everything. Neither of them could complain. What would they say? So, they didn't hesitate when we got to my front door and I walked in. Dad was in his usual place by the window, reading a book. I couldn't tell what kind it was, but it didn't matter. He read them all. I was wondering when you'd be getting home so I could go to bed, Dad said, as he lowered his reading glasses. And then he watched as the other three marched in. I see you've brought company, Nathaniel. Dad nodded to him in greeting. Arthur? Nathaniel acknowledged back. 
Dad, this is Borden Stewart, who I was telling you about, I explained. Borden gave a nod. And Mary Beth Foster, Dad said, recalling her name easily, even though he'd had thousands of students over his career. It was a pleasant surprise to hear you were one of the select few. Mary Beth just blushed and smiled, and for the first time, didn't seem to know what to say. So, we've been working on something, and we need to test it, I said, looking at Dad again, and my appreciation for him grew tenfold. I knew he'd do it. Even though all we had to do was touch him, I knew he wouldn't hesitate, and I knew how excited he was going to be. Will you be our guinea pig? He looked nervous, because we hadn't explained anything, but he shrugged. Of course. Nathaniel handed me the pencil, and I took it with my sleeve pulled down over my hand so I wouldn't touch it with my skin. It looked like any ordinary pencil. I extended it and touched the eraser to the back of my dad's hand. It stayed a pencil. I then withdrew it and grabbed it with my other hand. It glowed a brilliant blue and crystal. Dad jumped back just a little, his eyes wide as he looked at the glowing wand. It works, I said in a breath, a wild smile spreading on my face as I looked back at the others. We did it! Not a single one of them contained their excitement. There were whoops and cheers and smiles. We need to make more, Nathaniel said beaming down at me with excitement. We need three others, and then we need to go browsing at Alderidge. Chapter 8 We created more wands, and the very next day, we all met in the library after our classes. I work till nine, Nathaniel said, looking around at the others. I'll be testing all afternoon with the books that come in. You all hit the ones that are on the shelves. You find anything, you take it to the McCallum room, and we'll all go over everything tonight. That sounded perhaps a little too hopeful to me. I wasn't sure we'd find anything at all. But still, I gave a nod and broke off with Mary Beth and Borden. I'll take the fiction on this side, Borden said, nodding his head in one direction. I've got the nonfiction on the shelves, Mary Beth said nodding to the shelves on the other side. I'll make my way through the rooms, I said. We dispersed. There were six rooms, all named after families that donated money or other significant things to the university. I made my way to the far room first, the item room. There weren't very many books in here, even though it was a large room. Two large couches faced each other with a big coffee table in the center. A big fireplace sat at the opposite wall from the door, an ugly painting of a boat at sea hanging above it. My hands were gloved as I pulled my wand from my pocket and went to the first shelf. I looked around to be sure no one was looking. They weren't. Rarely did anyone ever use this room. With nervous anticipation, I tapped the eraser of the pencil to the spine of the first book. Nothing happened so I slid over to the next book. On and on, I lightly dragged the eraser over the spines of books. I went through an entire bookshelf of them, and my wand remained looking like a pencil. I moved on to the next shelf, and then the next. One by one, I watched my wand intently, waiting for it to glow a faint blue and turn crystalline. I didn't expect it. Really, I didn't. I knew the odds were nearly zero, but still, I felt my stomach sink in disappointment when I came to the end of the last shelf in that room, and not a single book had revealed itself to me, but I pushed it aside and moved on to the Clark room, book after book and no glowing wand. I shifted over to the Weir room, nothing. I felt like I was starting to go a little cross-eyed by the time I got to the Gavin room. All of the spines were starting to blur together, looking exactly the same. I told myself to pay close attention. I might just zone out and move on too quickly, not realizing when the wand began to glow blue. 
I stepped into the foster room and started running my wand along the spines. My back was starting to protest a little, with all of the up and down and bending over. I was getting frustrated. My hope fizzled out. But as I got toward the last shelf in the room, my heart instantly leapt into my throat. My wand was glowing faint blue. My heart hammered, thundering in my chest. I slid my wand into my pocket and carefully pulled the book from that bottom shelf. Almost all of the books in the foster room were Latin. But Latin was my major and what I'd been working on since I was 12. There was no title on the cover, but I still ran my hand over it anyway, feeling a shiver working its way up and down my spine. Gently, I pulled the cover open and my eyes scanned the page. It talked about weapons. As I flipped through the pages, I found illustrations to go with the words. Swords and whips and knives and arrows. It talked about how to enchant them with magic to make them even more powerful than their natural selves. It talked about how to hide them in everyday objects, like rings or cloaks. My eyes lifted from the book and drifted around the room. This was great. Any discovery was priceless. But this wasn't exactly what I'd had in mind. I wasn't planning on getting into any battles anytime soon. I was sure hoping not to have to defend my life or anyone else's. Maybe that would come in handy at some point. Maybe if the other mages in the past had known how to enchant weapons, they wouldn't have been hunted to extinction. But maybe they did. Maybe taking up arms put bigger targets on their backs. I told myself to just be grateful, and I slid the book into my bag. I grabbed the wand again, and I continued scanning along the shelves. I finished in the foster room and moved on to the weir room before making my way to the last room, the McCallum. Such a strange room. It was tiny, barely even a room, but it was packed. Stuffed to the brim with such an odd assortment of books. I wondered what its history was and vowed to ask Nathaniel later. Surely he would know. And if he didn't, he could find out. Book after book I scanned, running the eraser along the spines. And I was just finishing when Borden stepped inside, and I looked at the time. 9.02. Anything? I asked. He shook his head. Nothing. And I got through the entire fiction section, both downstairs and up. Disappointment filled my chest but I didn't get a chance to respond because Mary Beth walked in just then and my heart flew when she was wearing a brilliant smile. You found something? The words breathed out of me. She nodded her head, hardly able to contain her excitement. Nathaniel walked in just then and from the look on his face, I knew he hadn't found anything. Come on, I said, withdrawing the key from the bag. We need to get out of earshot. I unlocked the bookshelf and we swung it open, revealing the spiral staircase. We need to check these books as well, I said, as Borden pulled the bookcase closed after us. I'd thought about these books before, and we'd even looked through some of them. None had seemed promising. But as we trailed our wands along the spines, I really, actually paid attention to them. These were rare books. Valuable. They were first editions and lost books. This was a treasure trove. These books, Nathaniel said, letting out a breath. I can't believe I never bothered to go through them more, but... Some of these are probably worth thousands of dollars, Mary Beth said, and none of them are cataloged into the school system. Dad said Mom was bringing home a lot of books, I said, as I ran my fingers down the spine of a book I knew had to be worth at least $10,000. She was looking for magical books, but she must have come upon a lot of other valuable ones. This? I looked around, wondering in awe that I hadn't really paid attention before. This was her retirement. This? This is a fortune in here. 
yet it feels like a sin to sell any one of these, Nathaniel said. These are the kinds of books people pay professionals to track down. They pay hundreds, thousands for these titles. This, Margot, your mother collected treasure here. I shook my head in wonder. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what to do with them. But this felt like as much of a legacy as what we were doing up in her office. This felt like an echo of my mother's voice, almost as if it were whispered directly in my ear. Anyone find anything? I asked, moving on. Nothing, Borden said. Nope, Mary Beth reported. Let's head upstairs then, Nathaniel said. My mother's office was fairly large, thankfully, so it didn't feel exceptionally crowded, even with all four of us in it. Borden took a seat on the couch, crossing one ankle over the opposite knee. Mary Beth sat in the macrame swing and pulled a book out with hands that were shaking. She was so excited. It was in the fiction section, with a bunch of medical thrillers, she said. It looks like it was damaged by water, so some of it isn't legible anymore. But it looks to me like a book about healing. Nathaniel looked over at me, which drew Borden and Mary Beth's attention. What? Mary Beth asked. I shook my head. Nothing. It's just that we knew it was possible. You're saying you've done it before? Borden asked. My gaze darkened a bit at his words. The night the boys attacked Nathaniel. I tried to block out the image of Borden holding Nathaniel while David punched him, of him just standing there while David tried to drown the love of my life. But it was nearly impossible. His ribs were broken. They split his cheek, which needed stitches, and his lip was cracked. They gave him a black eye. He wasn't in good shape, so I put my hands on him and I willed his body to heal. Mary Beth looked from me to Borden, her eyes narrowing a bit. She didn't really know what had happened in our past, how Nathaniel and I had to forgive Borden, just how far things had gone that night. My stomach was a tight ball, hard and queasy. I'm sorry. Borden said, and in his eyes, I knew that he meant it. It didn't erase it, though. I never should have gotten involved that night. It's going to haunt me for the rest of my life, and I'm going to apologize every chance I get. It's fine, Nathaniel said, stepping between my heated gaze and Borden. His eyes slid from Borden to me, and in them, I saw him begging me to let it go to not let it eat me up. I looked away, but there was still a bad taste in my mouth. Whoa, Mary Beth said, trying to break the tension in the air. Sounds like there's a little more history between the three of you than I realized. It's in the past, Nathaniel said, his tone hard but even. We're all letting it die. I took one deep breath through my nose, telling myself to believe what Nathaniel said. So, I know it works. I think this is important for us all to learn, because who knows what we're going to have to deal with in the future. Mary Beth cleared her throat awkwardly and fidgeted with the book in her lap. Roger that, Commander. Another heavy moment pressed down on all of us, and I knew I was the one causing it. So, I chose to move on, because there was nothing else I could do. I pulled the black book out of my bag, and I laid it on the desk. It's in Latin, I said. There's no copyright date, but I'd guess it's old. Like, really, really old. But it's about weapons, how to enchant them. That brought on a whole new kind of weighted silence. It talks about swords and arrows and shields, I continued. It's got some kind of gruesome pictures. So if we ever need to go to war, we're prepared, Mary Beth said, trying to lighten the mood. Not the most helpful discovery, I said. 
feeling my mood continue to darken and sour. Anything counts, Nathaniel said. I think that's all we can do for tonight, you guys. Thank you all for your hard work. This was huge. Two more books found in Alderidge. We'll make a plan for more in the coming days. I think we should all get some sleep. They must have understood there was nothing more I wanted to talk about, that we were all too tired to do anything helpful tonight, because without another word, Borden and Mary Beth stood and made their way to the door. Night, Mary Beth called as she disappeared down the stairs. Borden left without another word. I stayed there, my eyes fixed on one certain point on the floor. I could feel my mood darkening with each passing moment. I was feeling the sand under my feet as I sprinted across it. I was seeing Nathaniel being pushed under the waves, the dark water turning red with his blood. I was hearing the way he wheezed as I held him in my arms on the beach, and then the way he collapsed into unconsciousness. Hey, Nathaniel said. He stepped in front of me and hooked a finger under my chin, making me look up at him. Come back from the dark. It's not as easy as saying the words, I said. My voice was hoarse and tight. Borden has done things he's not proud of, Nathaniel said. He's apologized, and I've accepted it. I'm fine. But my eyes fixed on the scar on his cheek, where one of the society boys had hit him, splitting his skin and spilling his blood. My hand reached up and my thumb brushed over it. Nathaniel just raised a hand up to cover mine. Scars remind us of the trials, of where we've come from, and how much stronger we've grown. He said wisely, But I don't let any of mine define me, Margot. Please don't let my scars trap you in the past. His words reached down into my heart, wrapping them around that fragile organ in my chest. I felt my eyes pool with moisture. My lower lip trembled. I just can't stand that anyone has hurt you, I said, the words cracking. I'm wary to let anyone who's done it in the past into our circle. You might have this innate ability to forgive, but it's not so easy for me. Nathaniel wrapped his hands around my waist, pulling himself closer into me. Then just trust me, he said. And know that if it comes down to it, I will let go of that self-control if it means protecting you, Margot. How selfish am I then? I asked, my voice cracking further. That's what love is all about, isn't it? Nathaniel asked, his words quiet and soft as he lowered his forehead to touch mine. Maybe the selfish version of it, I said, feeling worse. I think love is selfish sometimes, Nathaniel said, brushing his lips over my forehead. We let ourselves sink so deep, we don't know which way is up. I closed my eyes, pushing out two tears. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself, to get a grip on my emotions again. When I felt like I had more control once more, I looked up at Nathaniel again. I love you. Maybe too much sometimes. But that's not going to change. So I'm just going to work on myself and try to become a bigger person. Nathaniel brought his lips to mine, and in them, I felt peace. I felt strength I didn't always have. But I felt promises that together, we'd get through whatever challenges came our way. I love you too, Margot, Nathaniel said as he looked into my eyes. And that's what love is too, borrowing one another's strength whenever it's needed. Chapter 9 My mood wasn't much better the next day. I knew I was being immature and that I needed to let things go but it wasn't so easy for me. So, when I sat down at my desk on Friday, Mary Beth turned around and studied me. 
I'm taking you out for ice cream after class, she said. No arguments. And I couldn't help but smile at that. The class was long and boring. Professor Doom and Gloom was really on a roll that day, talking about all the woe is me and life is terrible stuff of our latest dark and depressing read. I was ready to crawl in a hole and die by the time he was finished and dismissed us all. Is he trying to drive us all to take our lives? Mary Beth asked as we gathered our things and walked out into the hall. Seriously, I think I need to go talk to Dean Lowell, I said as we weaved our way through the bodies. Yes, there are some great things to be learned from the tragedies, but come on, hope and light are pretty great too. Mary Beth nodded in agreement, and we pushed through the last of the throng to the front doors of the school. It was still cold out, but the temperatures were above freezing. Most of the snow had melted, leaving everything soggy. But I didn't complain as we made our way across campus and down the road to the shop. I ordered pistachio, and Mary Beth got cherry. So, she said, as we settled into a booth at the far back of the shop. It was nearly empty, save for an older couple at the very front, debating on what kind to share. Borden did something bad to Nathaniel. He used to run with the society boys, and therefore you hate him. Now he's different, but hard things don't just disappear. I blinked at her. My tongue halted on my ice cream. Didn't realize you were a psychic mage. She just smirked and took a big bite out of the top of her cone. Who does that? You're just really, really bad at masking your emotions, she said as she swallowed all that ice cream. But I'm not here to try and tell you to get over it. Borden did something he shouldn't have. You're allowed to be ticked for a while. Thank you, I declared. Even as I said the words, my chest felt lighter, better. Nathaniel keeps brushing it off like it was no big deal. And to Borden, it's in the past, so there's nothing he can do about it. But I'm the one who had to see all of Nathaniel's blood in the water. I'm the one that watched them all try to drown him. I'm the one who had to let it go, knowing the police couldn't touch those boys. Damn, Margo, Mary Beth said, shaking her head. Spit it all out. That shit is crazy. They made our lives miserable for months, I said, feeling myself amp up, hotter and hotter. Borden was there, helping David corner me. He was there smacking Nathaniel around. He says it was because the boys made him angry, and that's how he could use his magic. But that's such bullcrap. There could have been plenty of other things that made him angry so he could use his magic that didn't involve physically harming another person. It's not right, Mary Beth said, shaking her head as she looked the side of her cone. No, it's not, I said, letting it all come pouring out of me. Because even though he apologized a few times, it doesn't mean it never happened. And it doesn't mean I don't still have nightmares about it. And Nathaniel needs to stop telling me to just get over it. That's right. You need to feel what you feel. Mary Beth nodded, chomping down on the last of her cone. You literally ate that thing in like five bites, I said, instantly sidetracked. That's insane. How do you not have a major brain freeze? Mary Beth shrugged. Apparently, you never paid attention any of the other times we've eaten around each other. It's just how I eat. Like a vacuum? I asked in a laugh. She just smiled and wiped the corner of her mouth with a napkin. I laughed, shaking my head. And finally, I felt all of my anger and frustration seep out of me. Thank you, I said, meeting her eyes. I needed to vent. Do you feel better now? She asked as she folded her arms on the table and leaned forward. I do, actually. I said with a nod. It was kind of just pooling inside of me, 
and poisoning me from the inside out. Good, Mary Beth said with a nod. Now we can talk about my problems. I think you may have made a mistake in thinking I'm a mage. I blinked at her twice. I've been working my tail off every single second outside of class, and I still can't do a damn thing, Mary Beth said. And with each word, I could see the distress in her eyes growing more and more. You all say there's nothing to compelling a coin, but I tried to get my roommate to confess to stealing my leftovers, and she just straight up lied to me. I can't start a fire, I have no idea what my affinity is, and I can't make even a speck of dust levitate. We didn't make a mistake, Mary Beth, I said, keeping my tone even. You could read the telekinesis book. You can make a wand light up. My dad can't do either of those things. You just need more practice. So, I might still be a mage, she said. Just the very worst one in the entire world. You're being too hard on yourself. I tried to talk her down. Who says magic is easy? Who says it isn't different for everyone? None of this was hard for you, Mary Beth pointed out. Nathaniel has said so, and Borden has only been doing this for a few weeks longer than me, and he doesn't seem to have any issue. So why can't I make anything work? I just looked at her, because even though I didn't want her feeling bad about her abilities, she was right. None of us had struggled with magic, not to the extent Mary Beth did. Sure, Nathaniel couldn't do alchemy, and I couldn't get it to stay, and transfiguration was extra tricky. But we could do things, even if it was in a limited capacity. Mary Beth had yet to do a single bit of magic herself. So far, everything she had done was simply a reaction to her blood. I don't know yet, I said honestly. We don't know hardly anything about ourselves what we can and can't do, and even why we can do what we do. Maybe there's a reason your magic hasn't been able to unleash yet. But we'll find answers, at some point, or maybe it will just click one day. I reached across the table and took her hands in mine, holding her gaze. I know it has to be frustrating, but I know you're where you belong, and that's with us. And even though I'm a little peeved at Borden, he belongs in our circle as well. We need each other. We need you, Mary Beth. She let out a hard breath between her nostrils and gave me a thin-lipped smile. Thanks, she said. I guess I needed to vent. What are sisters for? I said, winking. She just laughed and sat back in her seat. All right, I'll keep practicing. How about we head to that creepy abandoned house you're kind of in love with, and you can help me practice? I just laughed and shook my head. Yeah, I agreed. Let's go. It was a 20-minute walk to Asteria House. As we approached, I took a moment to appreciate the view. Normally, I came up from the beach, but from the road, it was even more impressive. There was a massive stone fence that ran around the entire property. Iron gates partially blocked the way down the cobblestone driveway. There was a beautiful tower in the center of the house, looking out over the ocean from a third-story level. Big bushes and trees dotted the landscaping, and there was even a pool on the south side of the house, covered by an atrium. This place really was beautiful at one point, Mary Beth said as we both took it all in as we walked right up to the house. The Asteria family must have been seriously loaded to just walk away from this place. Can you imagine what it would be worth if it was fixed up? I said, as we walked up the porch that was in surprisingly good condition. But as we got to the double front doors, we found they were busted, as if someone had kicked them in. Can you imagine how much money it would take to fix this place up to make it livable? 
she asked, raising an eyebrow as we stepped inside, only to immediately step to the left to avoid the massive hole in the floor. Looking up, we found the reason was due to a hole in the roof, which had let in years' worth of rain, causing the floor to rot out. Come on, I said, nodding my head toward what was once the kitchen. Mary Beth followed me in, looking around for spiders and signs of danger. I walked to the far back counter, to a line of rocks that were sitting there. They looked ordinary, nothing more than stones taken from the beach. But I grabbed one, pricked my finger, said the words, and watched as the stones slowly changed from gray to shimmering gold. Mary Beth's eyes widened in absolute wonder. You're telling me you know how to turn rocks into gold, and I can't start a simple fire? I smiled, but it was awkward and forced. That's what I'm trying to do, anyway. As the entire stone turned to gold, I set it down on the counter and looked at it. I'm getting better at it, but I can't make anything stay gold. Within a few hours, it changes back. Fool's gold? Mary Beth said. I thought the exact same thing. I said with a smirk. I could certainly trick someone for a little bit, sell it, but they might get a little peeved when they go back to it and all they have is a simple rock. Is it possible? She asked as she crossed the decrepit kitchen and picked up the lump of gold. To make it stay permanently. The book doesn't say anything about the gold changing back, I said, as I turned for the fireplace. I rubbed my hands together, creating heat, and then snapped my fingers, instantly causing flames to jump to life in the fireplace. So I have to be doing something wrong. I just can't figure out what it is yet. It shouldn't. But that makes me feel slightly better that I can't do anything, she confessed as she tossed the gold from one hand to the other. Yet, I corrected her as I walked back into the kitchen. And Nathaniel can't do it at all. He's tried. Borden doesn't even know alchemy exists. Mary Beth raises an eyebrow at that, a smirk on her lips. Guess the secret's out, I said. I trust you more than I trust him. She smiled and I appreciated that she didn't try to lecture me with some speech about growing up. So, what's the plan once you figure out how to make it permanent? Mary Beth asked as she looked down at the gold in her hands. Because once you do, you'll suddenly be exceptionally wealthy. I leaned against the counter, looking around at the destroyed house. I never really cared about being rich. I mean... We never had much growing up, though we always had enough for our needs. I've just kind of always associated being rich with being an asshole. Hey now, Mary Beth said. I laughed. Until you came along. She smiled, and all was well again. So having a lot of money never equated to happiness for me. But having some would make things easier. I turned and looked out at the ocean through the cracked window. I'd like to be able to buy a house for me and Nathaniel, have enough money that we didn't have to work outside jobs, so we could just work on magic, resurrecting it all. It's going to take time, our entire lives. I don't think we're going to have time for everyone's regular version of normal. Mary Beth looked around the house. You should buy this place. She said simply. I looked over my shoulder at her. What? She shrugged. You already love this place. It's private, big enough that we could all live here and not bother each other. We're all going to be roommates now? I asked, laughing at the idea even as I pictured it. Why not? She asked. We all get along, for the most part. Resurrecting magic will happen a lot quicker with us all working toward the common goal. It would be like a boarding school. A school. 
We talked about a school, how one day it would be needed. I turned back around and walked into the living room. This place really was massive. It would totally work as a school, Mary Beth said as she followed me in, looking around. It really would, I said, an excited smile pulling in one corner of my mouth. A home and a school. And instantly, I was having all kinds of ideas, making all kinds of plans for the future. Chapter 10 I walked through the doors of Alderidge on Monday, and shouting and cheering floated all the way down the hall from the common room. Being human, curiosity got the best of me, and I followed the noise. A thick ring of students was circled up around the center of the common room. I pushed my way through, getting closer and closer to the scuffle happening in the middle. I stepped into view just as David pulled back his fist and connected it with Borden's jaw. He spun hard to the side, falling to his hands and knees. I couldn't see where it was coming from, but I watched as blood dripped onto the tile floor beneath him. David, flanked by Gerald and James, took another step forward, but Borden spun around, fists swinging. He caught David square in the face, and he went careening back onto the tile his head hitting it hard as he fell back. James and Gerald didn't hesitate. They launched themselves onto Borden. There was blood all over the place, streaking the floor, on their faces, fists, their clothes. It was getting worse by the minute. I focused on one particular puddle of blood on the floor. While everyone else was watching the fight, I asked the blood to move beneath James's right foot. I brought another beneath Gerald's. Like a perfectly orchestrated dance, they both slipped, falling forward and smacking their heads together like it was an old cartoon. Borden! A voice boomed, and I found myself more than a little shocked when it was Nathaniel who broke through the crowd and grabbed him before he could lay into anyone again. It's over. It's over. Let's go. It's not over, Borden said and his voice shook with untamed rage. Not this time. David propped himself up on an elbow, glaring death at Borden, his former right-hand man, as he ran a thumb over his bleeding lip. Come on, Nathaniel said, as he pulled and shoved Borden away from the crowd. The bell rang, and knowing they had somewhere else to be, and seeing that the fight between the society boys was over, the crowd broke off. I sighed, because I knew that all I could do was go with Borden and Nathaniel. Borden was shaking with rage. I'd never seen him so angry. His bloodied hands were still curled into fists, and he looked like he would snap if Nathaniel breathed wrong. His eyes were dark and dangerous, his lips set in a thin line. The breath heaved in and out through his flared nostrils. Nathaniel peeked into a classroom, and when he deemed it empty, he opened the door and shoved Borden inside. What happened? Nathaniel demanded after backing Borden into a wall. He took four deep breaths again, harsh and wild. He ran his hands through his hair, and I realized his hands were shaking. I got a letter from the dean this morning, delivered right to my dorm, Borden said. I've been expelled. What? I said, folding my arms over my chest, my eyes widening. On what grounds? Cheating and falsifying grades. Borden glowered. My economics professor is claiming he saw me cheating off Howard Starling on the last test, which I didn't do great on because I've been working on mage stuff. Yet they still think I cheated off Howard. And then... My professor says I went and changed my overall grade from a C to an A. Do they have any evidence? Nathaniel asked, his voice calm and even. Of course not, Borden scoffed. But this is all backed by the society boys, and I no longer have my father's support. They're framing me. 
And now I've been kicked out of school? I'm supposed to move out of my dorm in a week because it's designated for students only. I'd been hard on Borden before, but things were different now. I was watching his entire life fall apart. I hadn't had to sacrifice anything yet, but Borden was losing everything. His family, his social circles, his school, his reputation. It was all disappearing because he was committed to doing this, to learning magic, to bringing back a race of people who had been hunted into extinction. You can stay with me, I said around a dry, thick throat. We have an extra bedroom at my house that's just being used for storage. We can clear it out and you can stay there. I don't think Dad will mind. Borden stared at me, still breathing ragged and hard. He stood there with his hands on his hips, and suddenly, I saw him different. As someone who was vulnerable, simply human, subject to faults and mistakes, someone who could be torn down in days or minutes. I can find my own place, Margot. Borden said, looking away. But thank you. I appreciate it. We need to stick together. Nathaniel countered. It doesn't do any good if you're far away. I'm not going back to New York, Borden said, his tone a little harsh, but I forgave him, considering the circumstances. There's plenty of housing in Harrington. I'll find a place close by. And I knew it then, that the plan I talked about with Mary Beth needed to happen sooner than later. We needed a safe place, somewhere that was ours, somewhere that we could all be together. I had to get a grip on alchemy. I had to come up with the money to buy a Steria house for us all. And I had to fully forgive Borden and move on with our lives. Nathaniel came to my house that night. It was becoming the normal. He'd come over after his shift at the library, if we weren't all gathering to practice magic. He'd eat the leftovers from whatever Dad or I made, and we'd go up to my room to talk. Or we'd hang out in the living room with Dad. Or we'd go for walks across the frozen campus. Tonight, we went up to my bedroom. Dad had been feeling a little under the weather so he'd gone to bed just after eight o'clock. Nathaniel and I tried to keep quiet so we wouldn't wake him up. I think maybe we need to do something to help Borden, I said as Nathaniel and I laid in the bed, facing each other. Nathaniel's eyes were closed, though I could tell he wasn't quite asleep. What do you suggest? He asked without opening his eyes. Borden is in his last semester so it's not fair that he get expelled in the last few months before school is over, I said, largely talking to myself. This is all David's doing. I know Borden didn't cheat on that test. He said so himself that he didn't do very well on it, and I believe him that he didn't go change his grade. Nathaniel made an acknowledging noise, but hardly stirred and still didn't open his eyes. I think maybe I can go to the dean and make him forget that any of this happened. Revoke the expulsion, I said, going back to that night that I altered the society boys' memories of what happened the night they tried to drown Nathaniel. It would serve David right to have this all rewind on him anyway. Sounds like a good plan to me, Nathaniel muttered, though I wondered if he'd really heard what I'd said. But I just smiled and leaned forward. I pressed a kiss to his cheek. He smiled slightly, though he was too tired to even do anything more. I pulled the blanket up over the both of us. I snuggled myself in, and Nathaniel lazily laid an arm over my middle. He was breathing deep and low in a matter of seconds. I just smiled, looking up at the ceiling. Chapter 11 Dean Lowell got to his office every weekday at 7 a.m. I knew that because I'd known the man my entire life. 
He'd come to family Christmas parties and Easter Sunday dinner. I'd been to his house dozens of times for faculty parties and even went for the wake for his wife when she died four years ago. I knew his habits well. So, I woke up early the next morning, leaving Nathaniel still sleeping in my bed. I dressed in the bathroom and slipped downstairs before Dad had even gotten up. I pulled on my coat, and I set out across the crunchy, frozen grounds. I made my way down the silent halls, occupied only by the day shift janitor Paul. I turned the corner and saw the heavy wooden door at the end. Confidently, I knocked. Come in! His deep voice boomed from inside. I turned the knob and walked in. Margo! Dean Lowell greeted me with a surprised but warm smile. This is quite the surprise. How are you? I'm fine, I said, as I took a step inside. How's Barnabas? That was his cat, a grumpy, ancient thing with only one eye and one and a half ears. He had a habit of going out into town at night and getting into fights. Getting on rear by the day, the dean chuckled. Dean Lowell didn't have any of his own children, so Barnabas was as close as it got, and it showed. I smiled and took another step closer toward his desk. I came here this morning because I wanted to talk to you about Borden Stewart. Instantly, Dean Lowell's expression grew a little darker. Why? I took yet another step closer into the office. Borden didn't cheat, and he didn't go and change his grades, I said, pushing confidence into every word I spoke. I don't know if you are aware, but Borden recently left the Society Boys, and there's been a falling out because of it. I think David Sinclair has taken it quite personally. He's been at Borden's throat ever since. Dean Lowell braced his elbows on the desk and clasped his hands together. Well, I am sorry to hear there has been contention between Borden and David. I did not base my decision on anything said from David. I went off of the word of Borden's professor. He showed me the grades himself. But there weren't any sure signs that it was Borden who did it. I pointed out. With declining grades, Borden seems to be the only one who has reason to do so. Lowell came back. I have reason to believe that the society boys are sabotaging Borden, I said, taking another step closer. They're going after him personally. They're trying to destroy his life because he made the decision to step away from them. Would you take any of that knowledge into consideration and possibly overturn his expulsion? Dean Lowell's eyes darkened, and I saw that he was taking me less and less seriously by the moment, which made me feel less bad for what I was about to do. My decision is final, Margot he said, his voice firming with each passing moment. You are a good friend to Borden for coming here on his behalf, but I'm afraid I can't do anything different. I sighed. I was afraid he would say that. He sat back in his seat just a little as I stepped forward, closing the distance between us, but he didn't have a chance to do much of anything else before I placed my fingers to his temples and closed my eyes. Instantly, he was still. I brought up my own recollection of the event, even though I had no connection to it. I dove into Lowell's mind, searching for the instance of the professor coming to him and telling him about Borden's cheating on the test and about his grade changing. I felt the memory pulse and quiver as I pushed my will into it. And then the memory broke. Cracks formed, and I slipped inside. I put it in Lowell's memory that the professor did come to him. He did tell him about the cheating and the grade changing. But Lowell investigated the matter himself. He went to Borden. He interrogated the society boys. And he got them to confess that they were trying to sabotage Borden. Dean Lowell cleared Borden. He knew Borden had done nothing wrong. And then I planted it in his mind that he needed to write two letters, 
one to the economics professor that Borden was cleared, and the second to Borden himself, saying that his expulsion was reversed, and he could finish out the semester in good standing. I paused there, with my fingertips pressed into Lowell's temples. I searched to be sure that I'd done everything I could, that I'd altered his memory solid and deep, and then I released the dean. He blinked several times, looking around the room slightly confused. I walked back to the door, pausing there. Forgive me, Margot, Lowell said. I seem to have spaced out for a moment. If you'll excuse me, I have a few letters I need to write. Of course, I said with a nod and a small smile. I ducked out of the office and closed the door behind me. I waited just down the hall, where I still had a good view of his door. Ten minutes went by, and then twenty. Twenty-five minutes later, his door finally opened. He held two envelopes in his hand. He immediately cut down the hall, and I sprang to my feet to follow him. He first went to the professor's office. He walked right in, and I waited outside where I could barely hear their words. Lowell explained that he'd looked into the matter and determined Borden wasn't at fault and he'd been falsely accused. The professor seemed confused and surprised, but what could he do? He couldn't overturn the dean's decision. I waited down the hall until Lowell walked back out and headed toward the front doors. I followed behind as he walked out the doors and cut across the grass toward the dorm where Borden lived. I stayed out of sight as he knocked on the door and waited for one of the students who answered to slip back in. One minute later, Borden appeared at the door. His hair was a mess, and he wore an old Aldridge sweater and pajama pants. I couldn't hear the words Dean Lowell spoke, but I watched as Borden's eyes grew wide with surprise and then his expression filled with gratitude. A big smile broke out on his face, and I realized then that I'd never seen Borden really smile before. It was nice. Dean Lowell shook Borden's hand and patted him on the shoulder, and then he turned and headed back to Aldridge. Borden looked up from the letter in his hand, and just then, his eyes met mine. I gave him a little smile, and Borden lost his. We just looked at each other for several long moments, and then Borden nodded at me, his lips pressed into a thin line, the message of thank you received. It was a truce, a show of forgiveness. I'd never forget, but I was ready to put it in the past and stop bringing it up. With another nod, I turned, and I walked back to the university's doors. When I walked out of my humanities class, Borden was waiting across the hall. I walked to him, a thin-lipped smile on my face. Thank you, he said as he stood straight. You didn't have to do any of that, and I know I don't deserve it, but I really appreciate what you did. I nodded. Look, I'm never going to forget that night. It was the second worst night of my life, only coming in after my mother disappeared, and I realized she might not ever come back so there might always be a dark cloud when it comes to that night. I looked down at the ground, and I tried very, very hard to dispel that night from my thoughts, but there was blood and seawater in the back of my mind. But I'm moving past it now, I said, as I looked back up at him. I'm deciding to trust you, and to accept that you are a part of this family now. He started to say something, but I cut him off. Just know that if you ever turn against us, I know things you don't, and I won't hesitate to use them to protect myself and Nathaniel and my father. I expected Borden to call me out for threatening him, because it was a threat and a warning. I won't let you down, is all he said instead. So. I just gave a nod, and together, we turned down the hallway. How would you like to learn how to alter memories? 
I offered in peace. Chapter 12 The beginning of March, we had an extended weekend with Friday off. So, the four of us made plans. We borrowed Dad's car and piled in with our packed bags. Mary Beth brought snacks, even though we weren't going all that far on this road trip. And then we pointed north and headed into the city. We parked where we could find parking in the sprawling city that I adored so much. I slipped my hand into Nathaniel's and gawked and stared as we walked down the sidewalks of Boston. I took in the churches and the old brick buildings. I smiled at the masses of people walking in a hurry, none of them ever making eye contact. I don't get it, Nathaniel said, as he looked over at me, smirking at my happiness at walking around, surrounded by a million strangers. It's just different, even though we're only a few miles from home, I said, sighing. Don't you feel the history here? Harrington was founded in 1692, Nathaniel said. There's plenty of history there. Sixty-two years is a whole generation, Mary Beth pointed out with sarcasm. In all seriousness, Borden said as he walked behind us, Boston and Harrington look nothing alike, architecture-wise. Most of these buildings are hundreds of years older than Harrington's. No brick or stone, no cobblestones, just houses and newer businesses, and Alderidge. Fine, I'll give you that, Nathaniel said with a smile. I can appreciate the architecture. Speaking of, we rounded the corner just then and came to the front steps of the Boston Public Library, the second largest in the country. I smiled in giddy anticipation and looked back at the others. Each of them pulled on a pair of thin gloves and pulled out their pencils, ready to find more magical books. I reached into my own pocket and pulled on my gloves as well. We walked up the stairs and immediately went to pick up a map. We split the library in half, with all of the rooms and halls covered by teams. Nathaniel with me and Mary Beth with Borden. With a nod and an agreement to meet back outside on the steps in three hours, we went our separate ways. Nathaniel and I headed to the rooms we were to cover, and I just hoped we didn't draw any attention. We really should probably hit the Harvard Library as well someday, Nathaniel said, as we worked our way through the first room. We ran our pencils along the spines, watching over our shoulders to be sure no one was watching. You really think so? I asked as I paid close attention. It's a huge library, Nathaniel said as we moved along. And it's in the same region. I don't know why there would be more at Aldridge than there. Is their library open to the public? I asked. The special collections, archives, and government documents are, Nathaniel said, which is likely the majority of what we'd want to investigate anyway. And who knows? Maybe someday we'll recruit a mage who's a student there. It actually made me nervous, the thought of expanding our circle Excited, yes, but who knew what the dynamic would be like as we expanded? So far, it worked with Borden and Mary Beth. But what if we found some jerk or some stuck-up princess who didn't think like we did? We were putting ourselves in danger with each invitation we extended. But the more people we had on board, the quicker our work would progress. We worked our way through this room and then moved on to the next. My hands started getting tired and cramped as I held my pencil so carefully. I switched to the left and rang my right out, opening and closing my hand. The library really was beautiful, old and historic. It was absolutely one of my favorite parts about Boston, even though it had only been built in 1852. There was something about ancient books and the wisdom they held that made it feel older. Some buildings just have a feeling in them. This library was one of them. As we moved on to the sixth room, I felt my heart beginning to sink. What if we don't find anything here, Nathaniel? 
I asked as my shoulders slumped. We walked from one room to the next. Or what if what we're looking for is locked up in the special sections behind glass? It seems nearly impossible to me that we won't find something, he answered, and from his tone, I could tell he was getting frustrated. We found several books at Aldridge. This library is about eight times bigger. The odds just don't seem right. I mean, my mother was coming here regularly and going through all these books, I said. As we stepped into the next room, I dropped my voice. Maybe she already found everything there was to find here. It seems unlikely, Nathaniel said, as he held up his pencil. Considering we have a much easier method than having to read through all 17 million books that exist within these walls. He was right, but I was simply trying to make us feel better. At 20 minutes to the time we were supposed to meet back out front, Nathaniel and I stepped into the last room. These were foreign language books. There were quite a variety of them, and they varied in age quite a bit from the look of the spines. I let go of hope. We weren't going to find anything here. Mom had already found everything there was to find. We would move on from the library empty-handed. Shelf after shelf, we moved through the books. My pencil stayed looking exactly like a pencil. All of these books were just that. Books. Every one of them held their own kind of magic. Just not the kind we needed. Nathaniel and I got closer and closer. We'd started on opposite ends of the room and slowly worked our way toward the middle. I let out a sigh as I came to the end of the last shelf. But suddenly, Nathaniel froze. I looked over my shoulder. And like a miracle, the wand in his hand was glowing blue. He looked over at me, his eyes filled with wonder and relief. I jumped to his side and he pulled the book off the shelf and immediately flipped it open. It was written in a language I didn't even recognize. The characters didn't make sense to me, and it certainly wasn't Latin-based. You recognize this at all? I asked. Nathaniel shook his head and looked up. There was a woman working at the desk at the entryway of the room, bent over a volume. He crossed to her. Excuse me, he said as he opened the book and laid it down on the counter. Can you tell me what language this is written in? She peered at Nathaniel from over her reading glasses. She seemed annoyed at being disturbed, but she pushed her book aside and pulled Nathaniel's closer to her. She closed the book and looked at the spine. Sanskrit, she pronounced, and pushed the book back toward Nathaniel. He muttered a thank you and requested to check it out. The woman continued to act annoyed at the disturbance, but she did her job and stamped a card that said the book was due back in two weeks. Little did she know that we were most likely never going to return it. I don't even know where Sanskrit is from, I confessed as we walked out of the room and started making our way back toward the front doors. The Middle East, Nathaniel said, though it's largely considered a dead language. Only a few people in Nepal claim it anymore. I shook my head, both at the ridiculousness of that and that Nathaniel knew the information off the top of his head. I don't suppose you know this particular language? Not at all, he said. I could feel the gears turning in his head. I don't think any of the professors at Alderidge know it either. There are no courses at our school. We really might have to make a trip to Harvard sometime, just to see if they have anyone who knows it. We walked between the lion statues in the main entryway and then down the stairs to the front doors. Mary Beth and Borden were waiting outside already, hugging their coats tight to themselves to keep warm. Nothing? I asked in shock, noting their empty hands. Nothing. Borden confirmed and I could see the disappointment in him in his shoulders. And what we found is in a dead language very, very few people still know. 
Nathaniel said in a frustrated huff as he held up the book. I was trying very, very hard not to let out all my frustrations. I wanted to vent and rage that this was impossible. Trying to recover every magical book in the world was just too much. It was too big for us. But I kept my mouth shut. Come on, Mary Beth said wisely. We all need food. No use in us all getting hangry. She led us to a sandwich and soup shop she'd been to before. We ordered and all sat at a table by the window that looked out onto the busy street. I was joking before, saying that my mother probably picked through every magical book that was here, I said, as I picked up my roll while we waited for our food. But maybe she truly did. She had years of combing through that library. No one really said anything, because we were all thinking the same thing. She missed four books at Aldridge, and she had access to that library every single day. We're more likely to find something in Salem, I said, trying to sound confident, to bring up the mood in the room. We know there were two witches there, maybe more. There has to be something real left over in that town. I've never been to Salem before, Mary Beth said. I felt the forced excitement in her voice, and I appreciated that she was trying to pick up the mood. Think we can go find the sites where they hung the witches? Those were your literal ancestors, Borden said, glaring at her. You really want to see where they were murdered? Mary Beth made a face and shrugged. Maybe it will help us tap into something, unleash whatever is locked up in me. Maybe it will be some magical place for me. She was kind of trying to be funny, kind of not joking. Maybe, I said, because I wanted her to feel better. We ate our lunch, and then we all trekked back to the car. It was a 50-minute drive from Boston to Salem. No one said much of anything. We were all lost in our own heads, overwhelmed with the task at hand. Would we just spend our lives knowing a couple of tricks that helped us out every now and then? Had we been thinking we would become something more than what we ever could? Maybe we were just being arrogant, thinking we were special, different from all the other people around us because we had special blood. Really, we were just a couple of college kids who could make things float and alter people's memories. We pulled into Salem at two o'clock. It was an exceptionally sunny day. I was grateful for that, at least. The public library was a nice-looking red brick building. The sign out front said it had been built in 1887, so like the Boston public, it really wasn't that exceptionally old, considering how old the towns themselves were. But determined, we walked inside. I felt defeated already. This looked like any small-town library. There were rows of books scattered throughout the building. There was a stairway that went up to a second floor. The building really wasn't that big, and I wondered if it had even been a home at some point, because it wasn't any larger than any of the houses around it. I could tell everyone felt the same way I did, as we all broke off in different directions. Their heads hung low, shoulders slumped. I ended up in the children's section. As I looked at the spines, I could tell that most of the titles were recent. If I had to guess, I would have said most had been published in the last 20 years. Considering Mary McGregor was killed in 1693, I wasn't hopeful. But still, I ran my pencil along the spines, one by one, being thorough and dutiful. One shelf. Two. I reached the end of the children's section, and then moved on to the teenage section. Shelf after shelf, I checked books, running my pencil along. I nearly leapt out of my skin when my pencil glowed blue. My heart was in my throat, and I sucked in a wary breath. With shaking hands, I reached forward and plucked the volume from the shelf. I opened the book to the middle, and I watched 
as the words shifted and rearranged themselves. This glamouring was different from the telekinesis book. Just the movement was different. Shimmering and rippling. It was like water. But one moment, it looked like a typed, ordinary book. And the next, handwritten words filled the pages. My eyes scanned down the page, and my heart started beating faster and faster. It was told from the perspective of a young woman who met a charming young man back in Scotland. They married, and after the birth of their three children, made plans to move to America. And at the bottom of what I realized was a journal entry, it was signed, Mare McGregor. Tears instantly pooled in my eyes, and I clutched Mare's journal to my chest. I'd heard history and stories about my ancestor for my entire life. We have the journal account of her son, Tavin, but to read Mare's own words, to hear it in her own voice, hand, goosebumps washed over my arms instantly. Out of curiosity, I opened the front cover of the journal. There was an envelope pocket glued there, as well as a checkout card, but it hadn't been stamped even once. Either they had just barely gotten this book, or it was somehow glamoured in a way that no one ever noticed it. My bet was on the latter. I smiled and pulled my wand out again and finished making my way through these titles. There wasn't another mage book in this section, but as I walked out into the hall, Borden walked down the stairs, holding a book. You found something? I asked in a breath. He nodded, a hopeful smile pulling in the corner of his mouth. Looks like it's a journal. Mine too. I said excitedly, from Mayor McGregor, my ancestor. Borden actually smiled, something he so rarely did, but he didn't get a chance to say anything else, because just then, Nathaniel stepped up, looking disappointed, until Borden and I held up the journals we discovered. We collected Mary Beth, who didn't find anything. We checked out the journals with no intention to ever return them. This time, as we walked outside, we each felt a little lighter. Guess we should have had a little more faith in Salem, I said, holding the book tight to my chest. Mare's actual journal, Nathaniel said in disbelief. I can't. That's... This is incredible. Yes, yes, Mary Beth said. We're all very impressed. Come on. I wasn't kidding about that sight. So down the streets we walked. We wound our way around the streets with homes, and then down a trail, until we popped out onto a ledge. We were surrounded by houses and trees. Through them, since they were still bare in the winter, we could see out across town. Goosebumps rose up on my arms, and the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Nineteen people died here. Over 200 people in this town were accused of being witches. But in the end, 19 people lost their lives. Two of them were exactly what they were accused of being. I think of Mare and hug her journal closer to my chest. She wasn't much older than I was when she was hanged. Just a few years older. She should have had so much more life ahead of her. Just then, I wished I could talk to her to learn what she knew. I wished I could warn her, tell her to get out of Salem, to warn her to be more careful with her magic, to not expose herself. But I couldn't do that, and it made me all the more grateful to be holding her journal in my hands, like a thread from the past, stretching between me and her. It feels different here, Mary Beth said. Some places just have a feeling you know? This place? It feels dark. I nodded, because I could feel it too. Kind of like a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I felt uncomfortable. Really, I didn't want to stay here long. We need to be careful, Nathaniel said. His eyes were narrowed as he looked around. Not just at the site and the trees, but the entire town. 
the last known practicing mages were killed right here. Let's not end up like them. We each nodded in agreement. Okay, Mary Beth said, taking in a big breath. Let's see if there's anything special about this place. She took up a wadded tissue from her pocket and laid it down in the dirt with some withered leaves. She took a moment, calming and gathering herself with her eyes closed. I prayed that this would work. I knew how badly she wanted this to work. Her eyes opened. She rubbed her hands together, far longer than the three of us needed to. She snapped her fingers her eyes fixed on the tissue and the leaves. Something prickled along the back of my neck. I could feel magic here. I could feel pain here. I could feel fear here. But as Mary Beth stared at the tissue and the leaves, nothing happened. They didn't start on fire. She looked up with a vacant expression on her face. I could only imagine how she felt the hollowness in her stomach, the sick bile in her throat. But she didn't cry. She didn't get angry. I reached out a hand and touched her shoulder, trying to give what little support I could in her moment of frustration. Let's get out of here, she said, offering me a thin-lipped smile. She reached out, grabbing a tree to hold her steady as she stepped over another fallen one. And suddenly... I was blind. One moment I could see the trees, and the next, it was dark. I blinked, over and over, trying to clear my vision. And then it was all there. The hillside, the grove of trees. But the houses in the distance were different. There were fewer of them. There was smoke filling the air. Heavy clouds covered the sky. A row of people stood in front of me, wearing old clothes and solemn expressions. A chill went down my back. Fear spiked in my blood. I turned to look at what they were staring so intently at. There were bodies hanging. I couldn't make out their faces, but I saw them hanging lifelessly. And there among them, in the very center, I felt her. I had no logical reason why I knew it was her, but I did. Mare McGregor hanged before me, her eyes staring blankly at the ground, a noose around her neck. Nineteen bodies dangled from ropes, hanged for witchcraft. Margot! A voice echoed from the back of my mind, a whisper, desperate and pleading. Margot! I sucked in a gasp and blinked, and instantly, it was daylight once more, and Nathaniel was standing before me, shaking me and shouting. I blinked, trying to get my bearings. Did you see that? Nathaniel looked at me in confusion. Was that? Was that? Mary Beth's fingers dug into my arm, and I looked over to meet her eye to eye. She was white as a sheet. I looked around, trying to make sense of what had just happened. You, did either of you see that? I asked, looking back at Nathaniel and Borden. See what? Borden demanded, looking nervous and confused. The hanging, Mary Beth said as tears started welling in her eyes. She hugged her arms to herself, looking around at this cursed space. Mare McGregor was hanging right there. She pointed to the exact spot. What? Nathaniel started, shaking his head in confusion. I don't understand. As soon as I was touching Mary Beth and she touched that tree, everything went dark, I said, attempting to explain. And then it was all there, the townspeople watching, and everyone. My stomach rolled, and I had to take three slow breaths to keep from throwing up. I saw Mare hanging, dead. Suddenly, Mary Beth took off down the hill. She was crying, shaking from head to toe. She couldn't do any magic, 
but it was undeniable that she had a connection to magic, to Mayor McGregor. I want to leave, I said, feeling all my insides shaking with fear. I don't ever want to come back to this place. My legs felt like trembling stumps as I set off after Mary Beth. I could feel the evil and the dark coming out of the very ground. I could swear there were screams seeping up from the dirt. Nineteen people died here because of mass hysteria. Two were really witches. My actual ancestor died because of what she could do. I wanted out of Salem. I felt better once we'd left the immediate area. I still couldn't explain what had happened, but the overwhelming feeling of darkness lifted from my chest once we were back on the main road. We still had work to be done here, so we stayed. We had dinner at an old pub. We were worried they wouldn't let us in, considering I was 19 and Mary Beth 20, but they seemed the type that didn't care, and we didn't order any alcohol anyway. The food was excellent, and when we were finished, we wandered out onto the beach. Nathaniel wrapped his arms around me as we faced the ocean and the nearly non-existent light. It was pushing seven o'clock, and considering it was only the beginning of March, there wasn't much of anything to see anymore. But we all lingered there, staring at the ocean like it could give us answers. I don't think we're going to find much here, Borden said. He kicked the toe of his shoe into the sand, sending it spraying out toward the small waves. There's still the bookstore, Nathaniel pointed out. We might find something there. I mean here, in the entire United States. Borden clarified. If you think about it, this country was only occupied for a short amount of time during the surge. There could only be a small number of mages who even came to America unless some of the Native Americans were mages, and we know they didn't keep much of a written record, so that's not going to help us. You think everything we need is in Europe? Mary Beth asked. In the UK? Borden nodded, and something dawned over me that I had never considered before. He was right. Think about it. Borden pointed out. Every one of us traces back to the UK. Scotland and England, and who knows? Maybe you have mage blood on both sides, Mary Beth, and it's in Ireland too, most likely. And we know there were plenty of mage families in Germany. Where would we even start? Nathaniel asked. But I could hear the excitement in his voice at the prospect of what we might find. You know the history, Borden pointed out. We start with those regions. We trace back through our family history, and then we talk to the locals. Go from there. I glanced over at Nathaniel and watched his brows furrow together as he considered it. It makes sense, Nathaniel said, and it kind of felt like it was meant just for me, to help calm my nerves. Borden nodded. Flights to Europe are long, he said. This wouldn't exactly be a quick weekend trip like this one. And even spring break isn't going to give us enough time. Summer is the better time to go anyway. Mary Beth pointed out. The UK is kind of a miserable, gray place in the winter. Nathaniel and I looked at each other. They talked about extravagant vacations. Places that Nathaniel and I could never, ever afford to go to. Don't worry, you guys, Mary Beth said with a smile as she walked up the beach and looped her arm through mine. I'm not going to leave you behind. What are trust funds for, if not to bring your friends across the Atlantic Ocean? I could also use a new pair of boots, I said dryly. These ones got a little scuff on them. We'll hit the shops in the morning, Mary Beth said without hesitating. I was kidding, I declared, shaking my head at her ridiculousness. We should head in, Nathaniel said, squeezing me a little tighter and shifting to my side, taking one of my hands. It's getting darker by the minute. 
Our hotel was only two blocks away, and it didn't take us long to get there. We'd already checked in earlier, so with a quick good night and a plan to meet for breakfast in the morning, we went our separate ways. Mary Beth and Borden to their separate rooms, and Nathaniel and I to our shared one. I was frozen to the bone from standing out on the beach, so I showered, turning the water as hot as it would go. I brushed my teeth while Nathaniel changed into sleeping clothes. I pulled my hair up into a knot at the top of my head and then changed as well. As we both slipped into the bed, I let out a long sigh. I curled into Nathaniel's chest, wrapping an arm tied around his chest. Are you going to bed feeling exceptionally disappointed as well? I asked. Nathaniel snaked his arms around me, and in the dark, we clung to each other tightly. It wasn't what I expected, he said. But three books are better than none, even if we can't read a third of what we found. I chuckled at his professor-like wording. He was always talking like he was teaching a class, and it tickled me through and through. Poor Mary Beth, I said. Why do you think she can't do anything? She isn't doing any of it wrong, and we know she has to have mage blood. With the telekinesis book and the wands, and now that vision? We've seen her genealogy tree. Nathaniel shook his head. I really don't know. There's so much about ourselves we don't understand yet. But maybe this trip to the UK will reveal some secrets. I could only hope so, if for Mary Beth's sake alone. Nathaniel turned his head and pressed his lips to my temple, letting them linger there. Get some sleep. We'll figure it all out in the morning. I let my eyes close and let out a relaxing breath. It was ridiculous, what he'd just said, but there wasn't anything else I could do today. We'd accomplished so much already. I love you, I said softly as sleep gripped me. I love you too, Margot. Chapter 13 We headed home Sunday afternoon. Saturday turned out to be a bust. We visited the bookstore and didn't find a single thing. We went to every library within a 20-mile radius, and we found nothing. This trip was supposed to give us hope, but in the end, we all rode home in silence feeling defeated. We were reaching for the stars, doing something impossible, trying to resurrect a dead race with no basis of how to do this. We all drove home in silence. We dropped off Mary Beth and Borden at their dorms, and when we got back to my house, even Nathaniel had to go back to the solarium and get some homework finished. Alone, I walked back into the house, my bag in one hand. Dad was in the kitchen when I walked in, humming as he started something for dinner. Margo, he said with a smile. How was your trip? I grunted out a sound of defeat and annoyance. I dropped my bag on the floor and then walked into the kitchen, moving over to the dining room to sit at the table. Not what I was expecting. We found two journals and one book, but the book is written in Sanskrit, and according to Nathaniel, no one speaks it anymore. True, my father, the history professor, said. Sanskrit died out in the 12th century, and only a small sector in Nepal still speak it. Know anyone from Nepal that can come translate for us? I asked, knowing the answer. That would be a no. Dad said, and he still wore a smile as he continued chopping vegetables and putting them into the pot for soup. But I do have some exciting news to share. I perked up at that. I sat up a little straighter. You know that study grant I applied for five years ago? He asked. The one to go to Scotland and study the McGregor land and history? I'd completely forgotten about it. My parents had come and talked to me about it a long time ago, because if they got it, it would mean we would move to Scotland for a few months. Yes, I said. 
Dad looked over his shoulder and raised an eyebrow. I got it. What? I asked, my pitch rising in excitement. The letter came yesterday. He answered in jubilation. I've been approved for a three-month study beginning in May when the semester is over. This could be something significant for you and your friends, Margot. We're coming with you, I said. He looked back at me, seeming surprised. We were actually talking about it over the weekend. If you think about it, each of our lines trace back to the UK. There wouldn't be much here in America for us to discover, because there wasn't enough time for them to establish here. We... we were already planning a trip this summer. That's very exciting, Margot, Dad said. But I don't know that I can afford another international flight and board. The grant only covers myself, and they revoked your mother's place, obviously, considering. I shook my head. I don't love it, obviously, but Mary Beth has already said she will pay for me and Nathaniel. In fact, she's already hiring her family's personal librarian to go investigate where we should start. But she hasn't told them why or what you all are, has she? Dad asked. His brows furrowed in concern. I shook my head. She knows to be discreet. He nodded and returned to his work on dinner. Dad, there's something else I wanted to talk to you about, I said feeling my stomach sink a little. I knew we were going to have to have this conversation, and now seemed the time. He finished his work at the stove, wiped his hands on the towel hanging there, and came to sit at the table. When is the baby coming? He said it as a joke, but also somewhat seriously, and at this point, it was becoming an ongoing thing him jumping to the conclusion that he was going to become a grandfather any day. I smiled and shook my head, and he smiled. That's definitely not it, I said, even as I blushed a little. Someday I'd stop doing that. No, I needed to tell you that this is going to be my last semester at Alderidge. He was quiet at that. He just stared at me with slightly widened, slightly surprised eyes. We're killing ourselves trying to balance everything, I said. And even though Nathaniel is hardly sleeping and looks like a zombie most of the time, I know he's not going to stop school. But I hope you'll understand. My path is changing. I know I'm not going to be a Latin professor anymore. This, everything we've learned in the last six months, it's where my life is leading me and I don't see any use in continuing classes for something I'm not going to need. I need to devote all my time to this, to learning magic and bringing it all back, and someday creating a school where others like us can learn how to be what they are. A school? Dad asked, and I was ever grateful that was what he chose to question and focus on. A little smile pulled on my face. Yeah, I said. That's kind of the goal. Learn as much as we can, make some money, and open our own school so we can teach others. Dad stared at me for a moment, and it was okay that he was silent for a bit as he processed everything I'd just thrown at him. He'd earned that right, considering i just changed my entire life plan. It's... it's a surprise, he said reaching for my hands across the table. That's for sure. But I can't say I don't see the logic. I knew your path had changed from the day you and Nathaniel showed me what you could do. So, even though it's a little disappointing that the Bell Professor legacy won't become a legacy, I support your decision. A breath of relief expelled from my chest. A smile took over my face and I walked around the table so I could wrap my arms around my father. Thank you, I breathed. Thank you for always being there for me and supporting me no matter what. You're all I've got, he said, hugging me tight. 
and you're one of the smartest people I know. I know you're always going to make the right decision. I'd done it. I told my professor father that I was quitting school. And here we were, closer than ever. Chapter 14 I stepped out of class on Tuesday, headed to the library to work on homework, when I stopped in my tracks. There were pages taped to the walls, splashed all the way down the hall. They were handwritten, and my heart sank as I walked closer. I recognized that handwriting. I wouldn't have had to guess either, because just below each torn out, handwritten page was another piece of paper that read, Borden Stewart is a freak. No. I breathed as I crossed to the closest one. My eyes stared in horror. This was a page from Borden's grimoire. That was his handwriting, documenting his ability to fire start and his theories on what more he could do with it considering his electrical abilities. I grabbed the paper from the wall, tearing the corners as I ripped it away. Turning, I looked down the hall in horror. There were two dozen students in this hall, and every one of them was inspecting the pages that had been hung there. My heart hammered in my chest, and my mind was racing a million miles an hour, trying to decide what to do. I could light every one of the pieces of paper on fire instantly, incinerating the words that put us in danger. I could try to knock every student in this hall out, like I had done on the beach to the society boys. But there were so many of them. There were so many witnesses. So, I did what any woman could do. I stepped forward and started tearing the pages down, one by one. Hey! People called out as I tore away the pages they were reading. What kind of freak show was going on here? Others asked. Is this what's been going on in your weird little quad coupling? You shut your mouth about things you don't understand. I snapped at another freshman who said nasty things. You really going to believe everything the society boys tell you to? I glowered at another senior boy. I turned down the next hall, and there, I found Mary Beth doing exactly the same thing, ripping pages down from the walls. Holy crap! She breathed as I worked my way down the hall toward her. Could Borden have taken any more notes? I've got like 30 pages here already. He can't help it, I said, focusing on that, instead of the blinding rage filling me. It's in his nature to be detail-oriented. We turned down the next hall and worked our way through that one. And then there, at the end, we watched James Richards walk out of a classroom. I stalked straight for him, and without hesitating, I got in his face and pressed my fingertips into his temples. I dug, I ground, I clawed my way into his mind with my fingernails, not caring what I shredded along the way. I found the memory. I watched it as he and David and Donald slipped into Borden's dorm. I'd never been there but I watched it through their familiar eyes. Borden had his own room. They'd gone through all of Borden's things. They trashed his whole room. And then they'd found the grimoire in Borden's desk. They'd read through the first five pages. They'd laughed and scoffed and called Borden a freak. And then they'd taken it. During lunch, they went around the entire school, taping up the pages they'd ripped from the book. Along with the other pages, Borden Stewart is a freak, and they'd laugh their asses off about it all. Take them down. I pushed into James's mind. Take them all down and bring them to me. And if the society boys ever want to bother Borden again, you make them stop, or you come tell me about it. I released James, who took a staggering step back from me. He blinked five times and brought the palm of his hand up to his forehead as if he had a headache. He blinked at me a few times, confused at why I was there. What are you looking at? He snapped. But he didn't even give me the chance to respond. He staggered off down the hall, 
taking the pages down one by one. That's absolutely brilliant, Mary Beth said as she walked over to my side. Kind of freaky to watch. He just sort of froze up with this pained expression, and you were eerily still and calm. What did you make him go do? Take all the pages down and bring them back to me, I said as I watched him make his way down the hall. He took every single one of the pages down, shoving aside other students who were trying to read them. And if the boys ever decide to go after Borden again, he's to stop it or come tell me. Mary Beth shook her head. Someday, I'm going to be able to do something useful too. Until then, I bow down to your powers, Margot. And she actually did bow down in a dramatic way, bringing a lot of stares. Cut that out, I said with a laugh, even as I blushed from the attention. We're already getting targets on our backs. I can guarantee our names are on those pages. You need to wipe the memories of everyone in the school now? She asked, and instantly, her tone was serious as she realized just what this all meant. I shook my head. That would be impossible. We just need to lay low for a while. No one is going to take it seriously. Just then, a door to a classroom opened, and Borden stepped out. All the pages had been torn down in this hall, so he started to head down it, completely ignorant that anything was amiss. Ready to go ruin his day? I asked, looking warily at Mary Beth. She let out a sigh, and together, we set off down the hall to catch up with Borden. Hey, Borden, wait up! Mary Beth called out to him. He looked over his shoulder and slowed down. Um, something happened, and you need to know, I said. But first, you need to decide that you're not going to go get in a fight that gets you kicked out of school for behavior, considering I had to brainwash the dean into letting you back in. You're really bad at this, Borden said, his tone darkening. I know, I admitted. I just need you to promise that you're not going to go kill anyone. I've already started taking care of it. His look darkened, and he squared off to me. Slowly, I raised the torn pages of his grimoire. As his eyes fixed on them, they grew wider and darker, and the tension in his jaw grew tighter. They were hung up around the school. Mary Beth filled in. They were only up for about an hour, but they were seen. David and James and Donald broke into your dorm during lunch and took your grimoire, I explained. I know because I found James and dug into his mind. I made him go around the school and take them down and bring them back to me. Borden looked around, and I watched as his nostrils flared as he breathed out hard and quick. His hand curled around the strap of his backpack, his knuckles turning white. I made James stop the society boys if they go after you again, I explained. Or come tell me if he can't stop them. There's only seven more weeks of school, Mary Beth said. I'm sure we can deflect them for that long. And then it's over. You'll never have to see them again. But even as she said the words, I could tell she didn't believe any of them. Do you have any more classes today? I asked. I was getting more and more worried by the second, as Borden remained silent, but poised to explode. No. He ground out. Mary Beth and I are done too, I said, putting a hand on his shoulder. Let's get out of here. Let's go back to the solarium and put your book back together. We'll practice something new. Maybe we can read through Mare's journal and find something useful. Borden hadn't looked at either of us since we told him. He still didn't make eye contact. He was looking around, and as I looked out too, I saw all the glances he was getting. He'd been branded a freak now. His most private and secret journal had been hung around the walls for all to see, and now people were looking at him with evaluation in their eyes. 
Was he a freak? What had happened to flip the switch from being one of the most popular people in school as a society boy to someone who talked about magic and hung out with the school outcasts? But to his credit, he kept his head held high, he kept his shoulders back, and he didn't cower. Let's go. He ground out. His knuckles were absolutely white, and every bit of him looked ready to snap but he calmly took a step forward, walking down the hall. Mary Beth and I looked at each other, having no idea what to expect. The looks and stares continued as we made our way down the hall. People stepped out of our way, watching and whispering as we passed. Borden stared ahead, his eyes fixed on the doors at the end of the hall, as if none of them existed. Just before we reached the exit escape, James stepped into view. In his hands, he held a stack of ripped and torn pages. This was all that I could find, he said. His voice was almost robotic, flat and deadpan. His eyes seemed slightly confused, like he couldn't quite figure out why he was doing this. I don't know where else David and Donald hung their pages, but I think this is all of them. Borden had paused at the door. He looked back over his shoulder, and I could see the debate in his eyes. He was considering lighting James on fire, right then and there. James similarly looked at Borden, and it was like witnessing a true brain glitch. He looked angry and regretful and hateful and confused. Absent-mindedly, he handed the pages back to me, while still staring at Borden. I was holding my breath waiting to see if this was going to end in fists and blood. But finally, Borden pushed the door open and stepped out into the rain outside. Mary Beth and I glanced at each other and then scrambled after him. I tucked the pages into my coat so they wouldn't get soaked. I hadn't worn the right shoes for trekking through wet grass, but I didn't hesitate as I followed behind Borden as he cut straight across the grounds and headed for the gate that led into the abandoned garden an unstable north end of the university. I was well and truly soaked when we walked into the solarium. The second we were inside, Borden magically lit a fire in the fireplace and flung his backpack off his shoulder into the stone wall. Outside, the rain started falling harder, and something that Borden had told me about himself came back to me. He thought that maybe he called the rain, and with it, Lightning. A noise bubbled up from Borden's throat. Something feral, like a growl, like something from a dangerous beast. He turned, and his eyes cast around the space like he was looking for something to hit. Outside, thunder sounded. They're just bullies, Borden, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. They're just stupid boys with nothing better to do with their time. You can't let them have power over you. You diffuse them by forgetting all about them and ignoring everything they do. And I'm just supposed to let them get away with this? Borden asked. He looked over his shoulder back at me, and I froze in shock and fear. Borden's eyes were dancing with crackling white electricity. Where the irises of his eyes were normally brown, they were now shimmering with dangerous, white electricity. You gotta believe in karma, Mary Beth said, trying to keep her voice even and calm, to keep Borden calm. What goes around will come back around to bite them in the ass. Why get your hands dirty when the universe will take care of it? Because it would feel damn good to make them pay, Borden said, his voice low and dangerous. They deserve it, every one of them. Maybe, I said, cautiously taking a step toward him. But you going after them doesn't just jeopardize your degree. It puts all of us at risk for exposure. We're a family now, Borden. You have to help protect us all. And at that, something in his eyes softened. The cracking of thunder outside grew a little further away. 
his hands relaxed just a little from their tight fists. And right then, Nathaniel walked through the door. He was soaking wet, the rain dripping from his hair, his shoulders dark from being poured on. His eyes were slightly wild when he walked in, going straight to Borden. In his hands, he clutched a small stack of pages. Borden. He breathed as soon as his eyes landed on Borden, whose eyes were still glowing eerily white. Outside, a bolt of lightning cracked across the sky, illuminating the entire solarium. It was immediately followed by the deafening boom of thunder. They mean nothing, Nathaniel said. He crossed the room, laying the pages of the grimoire on his desk. He crossed to Borden and laid his hands on Borden's shoulders. A zapping sound filled the air, and Nathaniel spasmed. Immediately, he withdrew his hands and nearly fell to the floor. A scream erupted from me, and I automatically raised my hands to protect my face. Borden had just shocked Nathaniel. Borden's eyes widened with fear, and he took half a step back from Nathaniel. Nathaniel's hands still shook, but he just blinked, surprised, but undeterred. I'm fine. He reassured everyone, holding a hand up to tell me to stay in my place. Borden, I'm really sorry this happened. I'm sorry they're targeting you. I know how that feels, and it's an unsettling place to be. But you can't let them push you into a reaction. Borden turned his back to us and looked up at the sky through the glass ceiling. I don't know how you did it the last two and a half years. Dealt with all the shit we put you through. How did you never snap? How did you never kill one of us? Nathaniel took a step forward. I had years of practice. The society boys, they were nothing new for me. I've been brawling for my existence my whole life. I just learned it was better to deal with the garbage than land in juvie or prison. Mary Beth looked over at me then, and I saw her confusion and questioning then. She didn't know Nathaniel's history. She didn't know about his placements in foster care and group homes how he'd beaten dozens of boys to an inch of their lives, that Nathaniel knew how to fight and win. She didn't know that he'd hurt others so bad he'd spent two years in juvenile detention. You're a better man than I am, Nathaniel, Borden said. His words were growing hoarse and low. Outside, the storm moved further out to sea. I'll help you practice, brother. And cautiously, Nathaniel reached out a hand, once more setting it on Borden's shoulder. This time, he didn't get shocked, and the pages that had been lying on the desk floated into the air. I watched as they started to rearrange themselves, sorting into the correct order. I took the pages from my coat and released them into the air. Gently, they started sorting back together and Nathaniel carefully lowered them in front of Borden, where he could see the book that was beginning to take shape. We stitch ourselves back together, stronger for the damage, Nathaniel said. And I watched as Borden let out a breath, his shoulders deflating. He laid his hands out, and as the book magically formed back together, albeit without a front or back cover or spine, it gently landed back into his possession. I need to get back to work, Nathaniel said. You good? And I was surprised when Borden nodded his head. I'm good, thank you. Nathaniel clapped him on the shoulder once. You're welcome to stay here as long as you like. You can even stay the night if need be. I'll be back just after nine. Borden nodded in acknowledgement, but didn't turn around. Nathaniel turned catching my eye for just a moment as he cautiously walked back to the door. I actually have some homework I really need to do in the library, I said, guilt and dread sinking in my stomach. I can stay, Mary Beth said immediately. If you don't mind, Borden. He shook his head 
and didn't say anything else. I gave Mary Beth a grateful smile, holding her gaze to make sure she was okay with this. She seemed confident and comfortable, so feeling an immense amount of guilt, I walked to the door to join Nathaniel. It had stopped raining outside, so I felt a little better as we closed the door behind us and headed out of the garden. I only dared to speak when we closed the garden gate behind us and headed out over the grounds. How did you know? I asked. I heard the thunder outside, Nathaniel said, as he laced his fingers through mine. He held our combined hands up to his mouth and blew hot air into them. Only then did I realize my fingers were ice cold. And rain started pounding the stained glass window. It was supposed to be sunny today, and had been when I got out of class. I only know one person who can change the weather like that. I shook my head. That was kind of scary. Did you see his eyes? Nathaniel nodded, and I could feel his own worry saturating every inch of him. Do you think any of us can do anything that powerful? I asked in a rough whisper. Nathaniel shook his head. I don't know. Our natural abilities are a far cry from his. Borden doesn't even know much, and he's already more naturally gifted than the rest of us combined. I was worried. We didn't understand what Borden could do. But what I'd said to Borden to calm him down was true. We were all in this together. We were a family. And families don't turn their backs on each other, even when things get hard and scary. Chapter 15 I kept waiting for something bad to happen. The boys had done something terrible in spreading Borden's grimoire pages for the whole school to see. It seemed impossible that something major wouldn't happen after. But there were no fights. There were no confrontations. No other students questioned Borden or Nathaniel or me or Mary Beth. So maybe me making James try to stop anything that came up worked. For three days, Borden stayed at the solarium with Nathaniel. Nathaniel spent as much time as he could with Borden. And I felt a little on the outside because I knew they were having some intense talks going over some heavy things. But I was kind of grateful. I didn't know how to deal with this stuff. I'd never been bullied or picked on or been the target of anything but David's annoyingly misplaced affection. So I left the boys to themselves, and I took some time to myself. On a sunny afternoon in the middle of March, I went by myself to Asteria House, with my coat and a basket of snacks and a dinner I'd made for myself. It was kind of silly, but walking into a Steria house was starting to feel more and more like home every time. Even though it wasn't my home, and even though it was abandoned and in such terrible shape. But this was the place where we were most free to do what we pleased, to be ourselves. I walked up the sagging steps, and into the bedroom where we always accessed the house. As I walked through to the main living area, I couldn't help but imagine it fixed up. I pictured beautiful, clean windows and polished wood floors. I imagined tall, sweeping curtains and a grand kitchen fit to feed an entire household of people. We always worked on the main floor, but today I wandered up the stairs to the upper floor. There was a balcony that looked down over the main living room, and with the tall windows, there was a spectacular view of the ocean. A long hall ran either direction from the top of the stairs, and there were a dozen bedrooms and bathrooms, each in various states of disrepair. But in one corner of the landing, there was a spiral staircase. I climbed that today, hoping and praying that the stairs wouldn't collapse under my weight, because if I fell and got hurt, it might be days before anyone found me. I made it safely to the room at the top of the tower. It was the perfect office, having windows that looked out in every direction. There was even a desk in the middle, with an old mismatched wood chair pushed beneath it. I set my basket of food down 
and went to stand at the window, looking out at the ocean. It looked warm out there. The sun shone down on the gentle waves, and out in the distance, I could see some boats. Some seagulls rode the airwaves, barely even flapping their wings. I really was a coastal girl through and through. Massachusetts was my home, and I hoped I never had to move away from the ocean. I turned back to the desk and went to my basket. At the bottom of it, there were three rocks I'd picked up on the beach on the way here. I grabbed one, tossing it up and down as I walked around the room, thinking, Nathaniel and I theorized that I could do alchemy because I had an affinity for Earth, which at times I doubted. Earth was a little bit difficult to define. I could perform telekinesis on dirt, plants, even wood that had been changed into something else. Nathaniel's affinity was paper, but paper came from trees. So why couldn't he control wood as well as he could paper? There was so much more to this than we understood. I opened the book I'd brought with me, the one on alchemy. I sat down at the chair and propped my jaw on my fist, my elbow ground into the desktop. Mages were really, really terrible at writing instructions, I decided. They liked to tell stories and riddles. They talked in exceptionally general terms. Sometimes it felt like they left out entire sections or skipped steps, which was why we were taking such meticulous notes. Even then, I drew out my grimoire and looked over my notes from my last attempt at alchemy. Blood. Words. Will. I'd done it all, over and over, exactly the way the alchemy book said to do. But every time, within a few hours, my rocks turned back to rocks. The gold disappeared. I grabbed my rock again. I closed my eyes, taking deep breaths in and out, feeling its weight in my hand. I let my soul reach out to it, exploring every rough surface and every scratch. I felt the history of it and the time it had taken to form it and then shape it into this smooth shape. I need this, I mentally told the rock. I need to be able to use alchemy to make a safe space for us. I need to be able to support us. I need us to have peace of mind for the future. As if the rock could hear me, I begged it. And then softly, I muttered the words as I grabbed the paring knife from my basket. Spiritus sanguinis mei, et cor meum, ut quod fiorit ferum, et hoc in clara. I pricked my finger, and I smudged my blood into its rough surface. It soaked into the rock, staining its surface. And slowly, where once it was dark red, it changed to gold. Like veins running through the rock, it turned from gray to shimmering yellow. Within seconds, I could perfectly see my own reflection in the surface of the shining lump of solid gold. Once more, I closed my eyes and I reached out to every sense of earth I could find around me, which was a lot. I could feel all the dirt on the floor. I could feel the salt stuck to the outside of the windows. I could sense the sand out on the beach and the lapping waves of the ocean outside. I felt the bedrock beneath the house and the grass along the ground outside. Let it be changed. I thought out to whatever might hear me whatever might listen. Something tingled in my blood. I felt all the hairs on the backs of my arms stand on end. It felt as if something rushed up the back of my neck, up and over my scalp. My eyes slid open, and I looked at the gold in my hand. It looked exactly the same as all the other times I had done alchemy, but it felt different. With excitement, I sat at the desk, and I opened my grimoire to the first blank page. I scrawled out what I'd just done, what I'd thought. I accounted everything I'd felt and done. Let this be the one. I thought to myself, and to the gold, and all the earth around me. When I finished recording, I closed the book and took hold of the next rock. 
I did exactly the same thing, the same process, and I felt the same way. I repeated it with the third. By the time the sun started to set behind me, I had three shimmering gold rocks. I couldn't explain it. It just felt different. So, with nervous anticipation, I went home and I went to bed that night. I didn't sleep well. I had stress dreams all night long. But when I woke in the morning, my three rocks were still gold. Chapter 16 On Friday, we all needed a break from the normal. Classes were getting harder and more intense. Midterms were one week away. So, the four of us decided to go out to the movies. It wasn't a very good one. Really, it was probably the most ridiculous and low-budget movie I'd ever seen in my life. So my mind started wandering as Nathaniel's hand slid over my thigh. Through the dark, my eyes slid over to him. He was staring straight forward, his eyes fixed on the screen, but his hand ran a little higher up my thigh. I leaned in closer to him, appreciating his body heat in the cool theater. I crossed my legs, angling my entire body a little closer to him, and as I leaned in, our lips gently searched for each other in the dark. I sometimes missed when it was just the two of us, when we could spend hours making out whenever we wanted, when we could sigh heavily and take up all the space we wanted. Now, Mary Beth and Borden were almost always around. Now we were restrained to holding hands and quick pecks, so we didn't embarrass anyone. But here in the dark, I didn't care for a minute. I relished it as Nathaniel's hand slid up my neck, his fingers headed for my hair. I felt adrenaline flood my system as I parted my lips and his tongue lanced into my mouth. I ran a hand up his chest appreciating every rise and fall of his body. I was alive here in the dark, and I loved every second of it. In the end, I couldn't have told anyone what the movie was about, but I came out with wild hair and swollen lips, and I didn't even care. Well, that was uncomfortable, Mary Beth said as we walked out once the movie was over. She grabbed a handful of popcorn left over from her bin and threw it at me with a smirk. Don't be jealous, I said, as Nathaniel and I walked hand in hand. We're going to find you your bad boy someday. Do you want him to be a mage or just normal? Like it matters if he's a mage, she said, as we walked through the lobby and pushed our way outside. I'm most likely human anyway. You're all going to forget about me soon. Yeah, right, I said, as I hooked my arm through hers and hugged her in closer to me. Who could ever forget the insatiable Mary Beth Foster? She smiled, scoffing at our ridiculousness. How about you, Borden? She said. Do you hope the future Mrs. Stewart is a mage or human? I'm not exactly looking to hide what I am from the love of my life, Borden said, barely entertaining our game. If such a woman even exists. You don't think there's someone out there for everyone? Nathaniel asked. Borden just shrugged. I'm not so convinced that there's such a thing as the one. I think two people with common goals and attraction can be happy and in love, so long as they're committed. I couldn't say I disagreed with him, but he was stealing so much of the magic out of love. We'll find her someday, I said, and Mary Beth bumped his shoulder with hers, as if we were the same person. I've been thinking anyway. We're going to have to eventually start testing other students. I think that maybe, come fall, we could manage taking on another mage. Expand the circle? Mary Beth said. What if I don't like them? What if it's someone horrible like Marie Duncan? I knew what she meant. Marie Duncan was always chasing after David Sinclair, even though she was rich all on her own, considering her family. 
but she was mean and nasty, and she and David totally deserved each other. Well, if it's Marie Duncan, we can let her continue to exist in ignorance. I said with a laugh. But let's go into it with a good attitude. It's going to be someone amazing, who we are all going to love as family. Maybe it will even be someone one of you will fall in love with. Doubtful. Mary Beth and Borden said at the exact same time, which caused everyone to laugh. We were most of the way back to Aldridge by this point. It was pitch dark out, and the hour was pushing eleven. We should all be going home to bed. But it was the weekend, and the vibe certainly wasn't pointing us in the direction of separating. So together, we all headed toward the solarium, the one place one of us lived that had any kind of privacy. The weather was getting warmer by the day, and even a few daffodil starts were poking out of the ground here and there on the university grounds. A few more weeks, and we could start dressing in fewer layers. Nathaniel held the gate open for all of us, and single file, we worked our way down the stone path. And then I bumped right into the back of Borden, who had stopped right in his tracks just before the door. What are you doing? I asked, taking a step back, only to step right into Mary Beth. A curse slipped from Borden's lips, and my blood instantly turned cold. I stepped around him to see what was wrong. A few dim lights glowed from inside the solarium, so even though it was dark, I could still see just enough. The entire solarium was starkly empty. Chapter 17 Nathaniel pushed his way past us all and stepped into the solarium. He stood there in the empty space, looking all around, as if he was waiting for his things to magically reappear. Feeling absolutely sick, I walked in, taking in the barren solarium. I'd never thought of Nathaniel having that many things, but now that it was all gone, I realized it was more than enough to make it home for him. His bed was gone. His books were nowhere to be seen. The old leather couch had been hauled out as if it weighed nothing. All that remained was an empty wood floor. What the hell? Mary Beth breathed out as she looked around. They took everything. No, I said, my blood growing hotter as I looked around. I, I made Nathaniel invisible to the society boys. I made it so they would leave him alone. They, they shouldn't have even been able to do this. They didn't do this to Nathaniel, Borden said. His voice was heavy his words low. They did this because of me, because I've been staying here for the last week. James was supposed to stop them if they were going to try to do anything against you, I said, searching for any kind of reason, anything to make this all make sense. He was supposed to interfere. Anything could be the reason why, though, Mary Beth said. He might not have been around for this, they might have tied him up and locked him in a closet. This is David Sinclair we're talking about. He does what he wants. I don't even care about all of my stuff, Nathaniel said, as he walked toward the empty brick wall that once held his handmade bookshelf. But my books. My blood ran cold. Nathaniel, what books did we have here? He continued to stare at the wall while he considered what had been in the solarium, what had been in my mother's office, and what was at mine or Mary Beth's place. The telekinesis book. He said confidently. It was like his child, the first book he ever discovered. The coin of compulsion, the healing book, and the weapons one. I breathed out a curse. Four books. They'd gotten four of our books. A huge portion, considering the small number of them we had. We'll get them all back, Borden swore. No matter what it takes, no matter what we have to do, we'll get everything back, Nathaniel. I promise you. Overhead, a few raindrops fell from the sky. Borden turned to walk out, 
but my hand whipped out and gripped him around the arm. Black and red sparks fanned out with my hand, casting around Borden, and the second I touched him, he dropped to the ground. Instantly, the rain outside stopped. Shit, Margo! Mary Beth yelled as she crossed the solarium and dropped on the floor next to him. What the hell did you just do? I gaped, looking at my own hand and the embers that slowly fell to the ground. I... I didn't mean to do that. I didn't. Nathaniel crossed to Borden as well, crouching to the ground. He pressed two fingers to his neck and was really still for a moment. He seems like he's fine, Nathaniel said. Heartbeat is steady. I think he's just unconscious. Just like before. This has happened before? Mary Beth asked in horror. Like I said, there are some parts about all of this you've missed, I said, my throat tight. I looked down at Borden, who laid there, his expression slack, laying in a heap. We probably shouldn't stay here, Nathaniel said as he looped his arms under Borden's and straightened him out a bit so he wasn't laying at such a painful angle. If the society boys come back, we're in no position for a confrontation. Not with you knocking people out, and not if Borden wakes up. We all need to cool down and make a plan. Life was so easy and uncomplicated before you walked into my class, Mary Beth said as she looked over at me. Come on, grab one of his legs. I didn't argue. I stepped forward and grabbed one. Mary Beth took the other, and Nathaniel hefted his top half. Borden was heavier than he looked. He was only about an inch or two shorter than Nathaniel, but he probably outweighed Nathaniel by 20 pounds, maybe more. I'd never looked at Borden in anything more than a glance, but he was fit, strong and lean. He was made of muscle and healthy meals. So hauling him across campus was no easy feat. We half dragged him across the grounds, and we were probably grinding off the seat of his pants as we made our way down the sidewalk toward my house. I opened the door to my house, and we dragged him up the stairs and dumped him unceremoniously on the floor. Dad came clambering down the stairs at the noise. What happened? He asked, his eyes wide with panic. He's fine, just unconscious, Nathaniel explained. Was he attacked? Dad asked as he crossed the living room and did exactly what Nathaniel did, putting his fingertips to his neck to feel for a pulse. I kind of might have accidentally knocked him out, I said. Like what happened on the beach that night. I'm sure he'll wake up in an hour or two. My father looked up at me, his eyes questioning and narrowed. Well, was he trying to attack you? I shook my head. Like I said, it was an accident. There was an incident, Nathaniel said. Borden was getting worked up, and we were all a little nervous he might go and do something he would regret. Margot is telling the truth that she accidentally knocked him out, but she did diffuse the possibility of an altercation. An incident? Dad questioned. It looks like the society boys came and stole all of Nathaniel's shit, Mary Beth said never one to have much of a filter, no matter who she was around. Like, literally everything. Dad turned wide, surprised eyes on Nathaniel. Is it all right if Borden and I sleep here tonight? Nathaniel asked. Borden has been staying with me for the last week. Of course. Dad replied without hesitation. You're always welcome any night. Is there something I need to talk to Dean Lowell about, though? If the boys are getting out of hand... Yes! I cried. No. Nathaniel said calmly at the same time. I glared at Nathaniel. His non-confrontational ways annoyed me at times. If it gets any worse, we'll get the Dean involved, Nathaniel said, still looking at me. I believe the situation will blow over before long. 
and things can go back to normal. Normal is them always being assholes and tormenting you and causing hell for all of us, I said, my anger flaring hotter. What is it going to be next? Them burning all of our books so we're back at square one? They don't even know what they're doing to us, but they're just making things worse and worse, Nathaniel. What is it going to take? He didn't say anything as he held my gaze, and for once, I just wanted him to yell, to fight, to take this to action. I knew his history. I knew what he was capable of. But I couldn't stand bullies. I had no problem standing up to them. So Nathaniel just stepping aside and letting them do what they would burned me inside. Come on, Mary Beth said, looping her arm through mine. We're all tired and a little emotional. Let's get you to bed. Is it okay if I crash here tonight too, Professor Bell? Of course, he muttered, not knowing what to say. I was angry, and for this moment, I wished I hadn't knocked Borden out. I wish he was here to back me up, that something needed to be done, something that would get them out of our way for good. But maybe Mary Beth was right. Maybe I needed to sleep on it before I did something I would regret. So I let her drag me upstairs. She shoved me into the bathroom and told me to brush my teeth, which I did with such gusto. My gums were bleeding when I spat in the sink and rinsed my mouth. I yanked on pajamas and threw a clean pair at her to change into. She must have known me well enough, because as I clicked off the lamp and we both climbed into my bed, she didn't say a word. She let me be angry, and she let me plot in my head what I was going to do to fix this. Chapter 18 I didn't sleep the entire night. I thought eventually I would fall into a restless sleep, maybe have some vengeful dreams. But I stared at the ceiling the entire night, coming up with my plan. Mary Beth was out like a light within twenty minutes of lying down. She did everything to one extreme or another. She was still sleeping when I decided to crawl out of bed at five o'clock, even though it was a Saturday. I dressed quietly, and she never once stirred. I slipped out of my bedroom, closing the door as much as I dared without making it squeal. I listened at my father's door and heard his deep breathing. A quick peek in the extra bedroom revealed Nathaniel sleeping on the twin-sized bed my dad had gotten a few weeks ago. On light feet, I made my way down the stairs, and I froze solid when I got to the bottom of them and saw Borden there, pulling his shoes on, looking up at me with wide eyes. I held a finger up to my lips to tell him to stay quiet. I nodded toward the door and slipped on my own shoes and coat. And without a word, the both of us stepped outside. The ground was frosty and the streets entirely empty. The sun was barely starting to creep up into the sky, so I could hardly see where I was going. I'm really sorry I knocked you out last night, I said in a quiet voice as we set off down the street, headed back toward the opening to Aldridge. It was a total accident. Borden shook his head. You were probably right to do what you did. I had some pretty violent thoughts rolling through my head. Plus, that was probably the best night's sleep I've had in months. I huffed a laugh and shook my head. Still, I didn't mean to do it, and I'm sorry. Already forgotten, Borden said. He followed me, even though he didn't know where we were going. I shook my head again, and I hated this feeling inside of me. This anger. This antsy need to go do something. Something harsh and final. Something that would unleash all the feelings pent up inside of me. What do you think needs to be done? I asked as we got to the end of the fence and hooked into the grounds. Because I don't see this ending. The society boys have been determined to make us miserable for months, and their attacks on you are getting more and more dangerous. Borden looked over at me, and as he read my face, I saw something deepening in his own, like his view of me was changing. 
I think we need to do something to put an end to this shitbaggery. We need to cut David off at the ankles. Make it so he doesn't bother us ever again. Something coiled and riled in my chest. I nodded. I agree. And I have a plan. What about Nathaniel? My jaw grew tight, and I shook my head as I cast my eyes around the grounds. What about him? He can handle this his way, but I'm going to handle it my way. I caught a glimpse of the small, controlled smile that crossed Borden's face. I'm in. What's the plan? You have your keys to your building? I asked. Borden reached into his pocket and pulled out a single key on a ring with a cutout of the Empire State Building. I nodded, and we cut across the grounds as I explained the plan to him. The beautiful brick building in the middle of all the student housing was reserved only for the society boys. While the core five of them were our main tormentors, they were all seniors. There were equally as many juniors, sophomores, and freshmen who all belonged to the same rich inner circle. Each grade went up a level in the building, with the seniors all residing on the top fourth floor. No wonder Borden had been living with Nathaniel for the last week. Having no escape from the guys who were trying to make your life miserable had to be terrible. Silently, Borden unlocked the main door. It was quiet inside, and there were no signs of life in the living room or kitchen. There weren't any showers running no sounds of footsteps in the halls. Quietly, we worked our way up to the fourth floor. We cut straight to David's bedroom first, and I watched in admiration as Borden used telekinesis to unlock the door without an ounce of trouble. The door swung open without even a squeal. The light was still dim, but we could see just enough. There was David lying in his bed, his back turned toward us, there was a grand desk against one wall, homework and books scattered over its surface. A bookcase lined another wall, and it was only a quarter filled. There was a chest at the foot of his bed, and a closet on the far side, lined with well-cared-for, expensive clothes. We started with the books first. One by one, Borden and I used telekinesis to float the books to us. We checked them to see if they were ours. I didn't know every one of Nathaniel's books, so in the end, I sent all of them floating down through the building, out the door, and back to the solarium. I doubted David would truly mourn their loss. And toward the end of the process, I found every single one of our mage books, all on one of his shelves. Thankfully, we'd glamoured them. So to David, they would look like a mix of Latin and German, utter nonsense even if he could speak or read either of those languages. When we were finished with the books, I smiled and nodded to Borden. Using my concentration, I made the huge window inch open as wide as it could go. I was grateful it wasn't windy. That might wake David immediately. But it was still cold, so we had to act fast. Borden and I both went to work. We started with the clothes in his closet, one piece at a time, and then whole piles and hangers. We sent them sailing out the window. We didn't aim them anywhere in particular, just far. On top of the roof, the roof of Alderidge, scattered across the grounds, out to the beach or the ocean. We flung every single piece out the window until the closet was stark empty. We went after his desk next, which was a trick to fit out the window, but with some very careful telekinetic maneuvering, we managed to fit it out. We put it up on the roof of the building next door. Next, we went after the chest at the foot of his bed. It was filled with shoes and various things. We scattered them around the grounds and the ocean and beach as well. And then we maneuvered the chest outside, setting it down on top of the tallest tower of Alderidge. Then we carefully closed the window before it could get too cold inside. It was as if I had a balanced list in my mind of everything the society boys had done to us. David had relentlessly pursued me. They'd tried to kill Nathaniel. They'd gotten into numerous physical fights with him and Borden. They tried to get Borden expelled. And they'd invaded Nathaniel's personal space 
and taken all of his possessions. Some of those things I could never balance or make right. I wasn't going to trade a life for a life. I certainly wasn't going to romantically pester David. And I wasn't going to get my hands bloody with a physical attack. But I could take their things. I could expose the truth about these boys when it came to their grades. And I could make sure none of the other things ever happened again. Glancing around to make sure that there was no one watching, I carefully walked through the room. I watched David as I approached, and his eyes remained closed, looking so innocent in sleep. But I touched my fingertips to his temples, and instantly, I knew that he wasn't innocent in anything. I knew he was guilty, that he'd taken all of Nathaniel's things, but it was a relief to get absolute confirmation when I dove into his mind. I watched the memory of him and his lackeys avoiding James all day. He'd been acting annoyingly, trying to change the subject whenever they'd brought up the retaliation against Borden. He'd been acting like a pansy, and David had had enough. So, they'd all met together without James. David, Donald, Gerald, and Howard, and made their plan. They'd followed Borden to the solarium on a few occasions. They'd seen him staying with Nathaniel, and they waited for their opportunity, which presented itself on Saturday night. They'd gone in, they'd brought a truck even, and then they'd taken everything, loaded it all up, huffing with the effort, and laughing, and making fun of all of Nathaniel's used belongings. They'd hauled it all to a storage unit across town, but for good measure, David had taken most of the books back to his own dorm. They'd waited for a while outside the solarium, so they could get a good laugh when they saw Borden's angry face. But it had gotten late, and they were all tired from moving all of Nathaniel's things in a hurry. So they'd gone home and went to sleep, without feeling guilty about any of it. I hated him. David was the worst kind of bully. The kind that thought others deserved this kind of treatment for daring to step one toe outside his version of normal. And he thought it was funny. He got pleasure out of other people's pain. The memories flashed red. I left the memory of taking Nathaniel's things there. I let him remember that he'd done something terrible. But I made David forget where the solarium was, or that it even existed. I pushed confusion and uncertainty into his mind. I pushed guilt into it. And I erased Borden from David's mind. I made him forget that they'd ever been friends that Borden had ever been a part of the Society Boys. I couldn't make him a better person, so all I could do was erase us from his mind. I tried to be thorough. I tried to think of every angle and every complication. I plucked us from David's existence. And when I was sure I'd done all I could do, I let go of David. He laid there, sleeping like a baby. On tiptoes, I walked across the room back to Borden. We locked the door and closed it behind us. And one by one, we went through the bedrooms of each of the senior society boys. We emptied their closets, their cluttered corners. We took their shoes, and their books all went to the solarium. We sent every bit of furniture out the windows and scattered them out on the roofs around campus, where they would be near impossible to retrieve. And then I dove into all of their minds. I did to them what I'd done to David. I removed us completely from their minds. I made them forget their connections. I erased every possibility of being their target. I didn't know if it would work, not to the extent I hoped for. Surely I couldn't take it all, because if I could take four years of history between them and Borden, what else could I take? Their entire identity? I didn't think so. So. We would only have to wait and see just how deep this worked. When we were finished, Borden and I went to his bedroom, and it was strange being in his space with him. We went inside and closed the door behind us, locking the door. I don't know about you, but that felt pretty damn good to me, Borden said as he walked around his room. I wasn't sure what he was looking for or what he was looking at. Revenge does taste pretty sweet, I said, 
as I took in his surroundings. The walls were all paneled wood, and even this room screamed money. The bedding on his bed looked more expensive than all the furniture in our living room. The clothes in his closet probably cost as much as my entire house. The books in the room were neatly lined up on the row of shelves opposite of his bed. Everything was neat and tidy, in its place, and it smelled just like him, like money and some kind of clean spice. He smelled like a bourbon commercial, if that made any sense at all. I'm going out to find an apartment today, Borden said. I realized then he was trying to decide what he would take and what had to stay here in the dorm. Want to come with me? I thought about it. It felt weird to go do something with just Borden. But when I thought about going home, having to face Nathaniel or my father or even Mary Beth, I just couldn't do it. Not yet. I still needed to let all my frustration out. And in this moment, I felt like Borden was the only one who understood. Yeah, I said with a nod. I'll come with you, but I'm not quite finished. Borden raised an eyebrow at me, even as a sly smile curled on his mouth. We headed back outside and set across the school grounds. And while I'd felt fairly safe executing part one of the plan, I knew this part was more of a risk. The grounds were utterly silent and empty. There wasn't a soul around this early in the morning on a weekend. But still, we were careful to not be seen. We cut to the front door, and using telekinesis, we unlocked the door and slipped inside. It was eerily dark and silent inside. Each of our footsteps sounded deafening as we walked down the hall. We turned, cutting down another, watching to be sure not a soul was around. Our destination loomed ahead, and we unlocked one final door. Dean Lowell's office. How deep do the buyouts go? I asked, as we stepped inside and quietly closed the door behind us. Surely none of those boys always earn good enough grades to stay in good standing at Aldridge. Another smile pulled on Borden's face, and I knew I had been right. Donald Klein's father? paid for his entire freshman year of grades. Borden said as he looked around. He aimed for a filing cabinet against the far wall. Howard bombed half of his finals this last semester. James spent the entirety of the first half of his junior year drinking, so that took a few dollars to fix. I rifled through files, looking for evidence. What about David? Borden shook his head. Unfortunately. David pulled his own weight. I huffed a sigh of annoyance. He was the one I really wanted to serve justice to. He was the one who really deserved to have his name soiled after what he tried to do to Borden. But we could only do what we could do. Got it, I said, smiling in triumph as I pulled out a paper. It was a copy of a check written by Howard's family, buying perfect grades. Here's Donald and James's proof, Borden said with a smile as he held up another few pages. I shook my head as my stomach turned sick. I always thought this was a good place, that Dean Lowell was a good man. I never imagined all this corruption was happening right under our noses. Money goes a long way in every setting, Borden said, and from his tone, I knew he was speaking from experience. What other corruption had he witnessed? Or more, what had he bought his way with because he had money? It didn't matter now. Now, everything was different. Come on, I said. We have copies to make. It took us nearly an hour, and my heart started beating faster and faster, knowing our undercover time was running out. But we made 50 copies of each document of proof and we took a page out of the society boys' own playbook. We each grabbed a roll of tape, and we hung them up on the walls, down every hall. The school deserved to know what kind of corruption was happening within these walls. The rich shouldn't get things easier simply because they had money and power. Borden and I turned as we headed back to the main doors, observing our handiwork. 
Is it enough? Borden asked. Not even close, I said, shaking my head. But it's good enough to keep my conscience clear for now. Borden nodded, and I could just feel it. He wanted more justice served, too. I'm starving, I said. You want to go get some breakfast, and then we can go find you a new place to live? Borden smiled just a little and nodded. We locked everything behind us, and still, there were no signs of life as we walked across the school grounds. I smiled coyly at the large number of clothes and shoes strewn across the school grounds. A pair of slacks there, a pair of underwear hanging from that tree. It was glorious. We found a 24-hour diner and ordered an insane amount of food. Really, it felt like everything on their menu, but it all sounded amazing, and we were both ravenous after doing more magic than we'd yet done in our lives. You were white as a sheet, Borden pointed out as we dug into the dishes as they were brought out. It happens whenever I alter memories. I set around a mouthful of pancakes. It kind of takes a lot out of me. I nearly passed out that night in the hospital when I tried to alter your memory. And all the others. Don't go passing out on me, Borden said, fixing me with a serious stare. I haven't learned any of that healing magic yet. I think you need to speed up your learning, I said. You're making good progress, but I think there's going to come a day when you're going to need to know how to do something you don't know yet. And without the society boys causing drama and distracting us, hopefully you will have more time. Borden nodded, hardly taking time to breathe as he dug into a whole pile of bacon. This trip to the UK, I said, as I swallowed a massive mouthful of scrambled eggs. How long do you think we're going to need? Borden shrugged. Honestly, we could probably spend several years searching the place. Who knows where we're going to find what we need. But with Mary Beth and Nathaniel needing to be back this fall, I think if we can manage, we should stay there the entire summer. Your father is going to be there that long anyway. I slowed as I swallowed more pancakes. I hadn't even considered it, staying in the UK for that long. It was a strange idea. The thought of being away from home for an extended period. But he was right. We were going to need all the time we could take. Really, it would make more sense to move there permanently. Borden continued as he downed almost an entire glass of milk. Because I don't know how much more we're going to find here. Books, but largely people. If you think about it, there was a concentration of mages in the UK and Germany. Not so much for America. Even with all the emigration that happened, there were only so many. I shook my head. That might not sound like a big deal to you, but Harrington is my home. I think it always will be. Don't be so sure yet, Borden said as he held my gaze. You might just go there and fall in love with it. I shook my head and my eyes fell back to my plate. I can't really even imagine it. I've only ever been a few hundred miles away from here. You've seen so much more of the world than I have. It all sounds a little bit scary to me. My eyes rose to meet Borden's again. His chewing slowed as he considered what I'd said. I think you'd like it, if you gave it a try. Traveling, seeing new places. I might do it nonstop if I could. I never tire of seeing new places and things. I tried to imagine it, going to exotic new places, meeting new people, seeing sights I'd never seen before. But I was too tired. My imagination wasn't that grand. Borden paid for our enormous breakfast, and when we were done, he used the diner's phone to make a call. Twenty minutes later, we met a realtor at his office. We spent the day going through apartments. We saw tiny homes and spacious lofts. We moved through row after row of apartments, and I gaped at the price of every one of them, but Borden didn't balk. But in the end, 
it came down to the time frame. Most places wanted a year-long contract, and Borden insisted on something month to month, because we were going overseas soon, and I could tell, in his mind, he didn't know when, or maybe if, we were coming back. So, in the end, Borden put down a deposit and the first month's rent on a brick row house in the middle of town. It was actually kind of cute. There was a tiny kitchen and a living room with hardwood floors on the main floor. And upstairs, there was a massive bedroom and a bathroom. I knew everyone back home would be getting worried. I hadn't left a note. I hadn't said where we were going. But it felt kind of freeing. There was a lack of expectation in being around Borden. I oddly felt like I could just be myself, and that self didn't always have to be sweet or perfect. We had dinner in town, and then we took our time walking back to Aldridge. I was happy to see there was still a large number of the boys' belongings strewn about campus. We pushed ourselves to our very limits. Borden went up to his room when it was fully dark outside. He opened the window and sent every one of his belongings out the window and high into the sky. I waited outside and carefully kept everything afloat, high up enough no one would ever look for them. And then together, we walked back to his apartment, keeping everything high in the dark air above us. We looked in every direction when we got to the apartment, and when the coast was clear, we opened the door and floated everything in a big rush. In a matter of minutes, we had everything placed and organized. I guess I'll be going shopping after school for everything else I need, Borden said. Dishes, pots and pans, groceries. How grown up, I said, feeling a tiny bit jealous. I'd been dreaming of living in Asteria House someday, but that goal was so far down the line, it still seemed impossible. Here Borden was, now, living his own life. He just chuckled and nodded to the door. I'll walk you home. How do you think the boys reacted when they woke up? I asked as we slowly walked down the road. Borden shook his head. I wish I could have seen it, when they had to go looking for their things without anything to wear but the clothes on their backs. I laughed and pictured it. Their angry red faces as they found their furniture on top of the roofs of the buildings. Their clothes and belongings spread across an entire square mile of space. They so deserved it. Borden chuckled and nodded in agreement. This was kind of fun today. I kind of like having you as my partner in crime, Margot. It was a little unexpected. I looked over at him, and as he met my gaze, I felt something change. I felt my last walls come down when it came to him and I knew I'd finally forgiven him. Yeah, this was kind of exactly what I needed. I slowed as my house came into view. All the lights were on, and my stomach sank, because I knew what was waiting for me inside. You ready for the interrogation? Borden asked. I sighed. Not really. We stopped in the middle of the sidewalk. Then how about we go get all of Nathaniel's stuff back instead? He asked. Put off the inevitable a little longer. Yes, I said immediately. And for another hour, we ignored real life. We found the storage unit where the society boys had put all of Nathaniel's things. As far as I could tell, it was all there. And surprisingly, it was all undamaged. Using the same method as we had with Borden's things, we moved all of Nathaniel's back to the solarium. It didn't quite look exactly the same when we were finished placing it all back inside, but close enough. His bed was back against the one wall. His desk was replaced. His couch was ready and waiting. I knew I would never get the books back in the right order, so we left them in a stack beside the bookshelves. And finally, when the hour was pushing eleven, the two of us headed back to my house. All the lights were still on inside. I could see Dad's silhouette in the window, in his chair, his head bent. I hate feeling like I'm going to have to go in there and explain, I said, as we stalled outside. I hugged my arms around myself, 
clouds forming in the air as I breathed. Can't I just be allowed to feel the way I feel and deal with everything in the way I see fit? In theory and a perfect world, yes, Borden said. But that's the problem with caring about other people. We have to strike a balance. I nodded, because he was right. I could indeed go inside and go straight to my bedroom and ignore everyone. But I couldn't do that, because I cared about everyone inside. So, I let out a sigh, and Borden and I walked up the steps and opened the door. Nathaniel, who had been pacing back and forth across the living room with a book in his hand, his nose in the book, instantly froze. His eyes went from Borden to me and to Borden again. Dad looked up from the book he was reading, waiting, silent. Mary Beth stepped out of the kitchen, glaring at Borden and I as if we were two kids who'd wandered away from the play yard for too long. Borden and I hurried karma along, I said, keeping it simple and clean and calm. I don't know how well it will work, but I try to erase Borden and all of us further from the society boys' minds. They're guilty. I knew they were. And then I needed some space to think and breathe. I found an apartment. I'm all moved in, Borden said, and his calm and clean manner gave me boldness. We got all of your things back, Nathaniel. I'm sorry my presence in your solarium made your things a target. Thank you for taking me in for the last week. But I'll be sleeping at my new place from now on. They all just looked at us, not knowing what to say. And I had to wonder, how much had I scared them? What did they think I'd done, or where I had gone? But I didn't care nearly as much as I should have. Thank you for all your help today. I said, turning to Borden. Likewise, he said back, and I gave him a little smile, feeling grateful for all he had done for me today, and not questioning me and letting me do and feel what I needed to. I hope you all have a good night. He turned and walked out the door, and I cut right across the living room between everyone. I didn't say a word as I went up to my room. I shut the door behind me, ignoring the sound of voices downstairs. I changed into my pajamas, and I crawled into bed. I slept like a baby, feeling that just a little bit of justice had been served. Chapter 19 I was awoken the next morning by the sound of knocking on my door. I barely opened my eyes when Dad stepped in. Instantly, I knew something was wrong by the expression on his face. He looked gray. Dean Lowell called this morning, he said. I sat up in bed, feeling my heart drop into my stomach. He wants you to come into his office immediately. I felt sick. My palms were instantly slick with sweat, and I'm pretty sure all of the blood in my entire body disappeared. I nodded and climbed out of bed. Dad stepped out so I could get dressed. I pulled on a plaid skirt and a white button-up shirt. I didn't have time to do anything about my hair, so I pulled it up in a high bun at the top of my head. When I stepped into the living room, Nathaniel and Mary Beth were nowhere to be seen. Apparently, they'd gone home last night. Instead, Dad stood there next to the door, looking as if he was about to go to the doctor's office and get some life-ending news. I pulled my coat on, and I stepped out into the early morning air. What happened yesterday, Margot? Dad asked as soon as we started walking down the sidewalk. You just disappeared, were gone all day, and didn't say a word about where you were going. We were all worried, absolutely sick. I swallowed once. I knew this time would come. I knew I was going to have to explain, and I knew it wasn't going to be pretty. So, I told my father what Borden and I had done. I told him that I didn't feel bad about it, because the society boys deserved much, much worse. And then Dad didn't say anything. He walked by my side, and I could feel anger rolling off him in a way I'd never experienced in my life. I didn't know if I wanted him to yell at me. 
I'd never experienced that before. I'd never given him a reason to be angry at me. The school was still very quiet when we walked through the doors. It was early, and classes wouldn't start for nearly another hour, so we didn't have to fight our way through as we weaved through the halls. Our pages were still hanging from the walls, proof that the society boys had bought their grades. Several were missing, as if someone had ripped them down, but most still stayed in place, damning them all. There, at the end of the hall, was the dean's door. Waiting in a chair just to the side of it was Borden. He looked at me with wide eyes, though he was fighting very hard to keep his calm and composure. But as we approached, he stood, standing by my side. And I knew. Dad knocked on the dean's door, and he called for us to come in. All of my guts had settled in my pelvis by this point, dead and unrevivable. I walked in, and I had no doubt from the very first moment what would happen in the next few minutes. The dean's expression was dark and serious. I could see disappointment dripping from every bit of him. We walked in and sat in the chairs across from him, Dad standing next to the door as he closed it behind us. I don't want either of you to say one word, Dean Lowell said, keeping his tone very even and calm, but deadly with their seriousness. Because I don't care what you think your reasoning was, what your justification was. There were multiple witnesses who saw you two coming and going from the society boy's house on Sunday, and then the school. There was no one else, and it is a well-known fact, the rivalry and contention that has been going on between your group and those boys. So I don't want the story. I don't need the explanation of how you did what you did. Dean Lowell grabbed two pieces of paper from his desk and extended one to each of us. Effective immediately, you are both expelled from Alderidge University, the dean said. My eyes scanned the page and it reflected what he'd just said. I felt heavier and sicker than I'd ever felt in my entire life. Expelled. That was what the word read, easy and clear. Borden, you will not graduate come the end of this semester, the dean said, and now his voice shook, just slightly, with disappointment and rage. Margo, you will not retain your faculty scholarship. Borden, you are to immediately leave the society boy's house. I've already moved out, he said hollowly. He stared at his expulsion letter, looking dead and empty. Dean Lowell nodded curtly. I wish to express my exceptional disappointment. The two of you have been nothing but model citizens at this school. You've gotten excellent grades, been examples of what this university stands for. You should have had a bright future. But trespassing on school grounds, in an administrator's office, is something that cannot be tolerated. And this kind of playground drama will not be excused. A bit of school ground drama could have been settled in a much more civilized way. A bit of school ground drama? I finally snapped. The words bit out of me harsh and loud. I stood up, placing my hands on the dean's desk. The society boys tried to kill Nathaniel Nightingale. They stole from us on multiple occasions. They've turned everyone against Borden. You talk about model students, yet you've done nothing about those walking nightmares. Why? Because they have money? Because you don't want to lose funding from their parents? Margo. My dad said under his breath, Yes, it was me who posted the proof for everyone to finally know the truth. It's time someone started calling out the bullshit that happens at this school, I said, shaking my head. You do not run this school, Miss Bell, Dean Lowell said, the volume of his voice rising slightly. You do not get to make the calls. Now, my decision is final. And since you are no longer a student at this school, I will ask the both of you to leave the campus grounds immediately. I felt as if I'd just been slapped. And for the first time, 
it really sank in. The school where I had lived my whole life had just kicked me out. I was no longer welcome at Aldridge. I tried to swallow around my dry mouth, but my tongue stuck to the back of my throat. So, I turned, and with Borden, we walked out of the office. By this time, there were a few students in the hallways. I felt as if I had a huge flashing sign above my head that said, Expelled. I felt ashamed. I felt angry. I felt... I felt... I didn't know. Maybe I was in shock. But I felt some satisfaction when they looked at the pages we'd hung, when they started whispering to each other. The three of us made our way down the hall, and when we turned in front of my dad's classroom, he stopped. I think you know we'll be talking some more after school, he said, his tone very controlled. I just swallowed and nodded. As I turned to walk back out, I found Nathaniel coming down the hall. His expression was serious, dark, and guarded. I was a storm of emotions as I looked at him. He stopped just in front of Borden and I, and I wondered what he was seeing. Did we look ashamed? Scared? Angry? I didn't know what I felt, so I had no idea how I might look to someone outside my own head. You two all right? He asked, and I had never heard his tone so measured. Automatically, I nodded. Borden did the same. Nathaniel took a deep, slow breath in through his nostrils. He let it out, his eyes drifting away. And I knew he was at a loss for what to say. We need to talk later, I said. Can I come by the solarium after your shift is over? It seemed as if you were having a hard time meeting my eyes when they came back to mine. He didn't say anything, but he nodded, and then he walked away headed toward his first class of the day. Borden and I stood there for a minute, watching as all the students we were no longer a part of walked around us, on their way to classes we were no longer allowed to attend. I'd made my decision weeks ago that this would be my last semester. So really, this didn't matter. It didn't really change anything but it felt like the two smallest fingers of my hand had been chopped off. They'd been a part of my identity my entire life, and now, someone had ripped them away. I took slow steps forward, counting each and every one of them as I went, because they were my last. Yes, I might step foot back in the school. I would have to. I was going to have to clean out my mother's office now. But after I left, Everything would be different. The front doors were within sight, when through them walked David Sinclair, flanked by all of the other senior society boys. And it truly was like magic, because their gaze only slightly floated over me and Borden before they moved on. They walked down the hall and hardly even seemed to notice that we existed. They walked right on by, not a second glance or a word spoken. As we watched them go, Borden and I looked at each other, our eyes widening with awe. It was almost as if we could read each other's minds. It worked. We both glanced back and watched as the boys turned right down a hall and disappeared out of view. It had worked. We'd finally rid ourselves of them. But at what cost? I looked back at the doors, and together, Borden and I slowly walked toward them, and as we walked through them, we both seemed to be holding our breath. And when we stepped outside, everything did feel different. I felt... free. I felt a little wild, untethered. I felt like I wanted to do a million things all at once. I had no time schedule, no restrictions. Suddenly, for the first time since I was five years old, I had no homework. A little laugh bubbled out of my lips. What could possibly be funny right now, Margot? Borden asked, looking over at me like I was a lunatic. 
I laughed again and shook my head. Homework, I said, knowing I was indeed smiling like a loon. For the first time in almost my entire life, I don't have to stress about homework again. It took a second, but Borden did huff out a laugh. He shook his head and looked ahead. I'm going to get a call from my father the second I get back to my apartment, and I can guarantee you 100% he's going to tell me I'm cut off forever. And you're gleeful about not having homework? I shook my head at my own ridiculousness. I'm sorry, Borden, I said, meaning it. I know this is awful, and it's definitely going to hit me hard later, what this all really means. But yes, for just this moment, I'm just really freaking grateful I don't have to do homework tonight. Borden laughed, and then he laughed some more. And then we were both laughing and crying and holding our middles and looking up to the sky. So much had changed in the last two days. My head was spinning from it all. Hey, do you have anything better you need to do right now? I asked as a thought occurred to me. Uh, apparently not. Borden said with a chuckle. I've got an idea. It would be helpful if you came with me. Chapter 20 I marveled that evening as I walked back home by myself. It had worked. Really, this was the true test. And it had worked. Borden and I had gone and grabbed the three rocks that had now stayed gold for a few days. We'd gone into town and taken it to a jeweler. He'd been suspicious and asked a lot of questions. We'd done a lot of lying, and thankfully, we were both getting quite good at it. In the end, the man had bought all three lumps of gold, and now I had a huge amount of cash in my purse. I felt nervous on the walk home. Borden tried to insist on walking me home, but I told him I was fine, despite how I actually felt. This was more money than I'd ever had in my entire life, combined. It was enough to buy myself a car, a brand new one, but I had other plans. Now that I wasn't in school, I needed to pay my own way around home. I wanted to pay my own way to the UK when we went in a few weeks, and I needed to start saving up, because now that I was done with school, every other plan I had was accelerated. I was going to start saving up to go to the owners of Asteria House and to make them an offer. I needed to start coming up with the money to make the repairs needed to make it livable. I stopped at the grocery store on the way home and got everything I needed to make Dad's favorite meal, meatloaf with mashed potatoes and asparagus. I took my time, making it the best I could possibly do. I even cleaned the house top to bottom. I wanted him in as good of a mood as possible. When he walked in, he looked around and sniffed the air, and instantly felt the mood surrounding him lift a little. You hungry? I asked, offering a nervous smile. He didn't say anything, just nodded and followed me into the kitchen. I dished him up a plate and set it in front of him, an extra large portion that should keep him happy and full. Today was interesting, he said, after a few minutes of silent eating. Oh yeah? I asked, nervous to step into it all. I was getting a lot of particular looks today in class, he said, meeting my eyes as he raised an eyebrow. And there was a lot of behind-hand whispering, and most of them weren't being particularly quiet. I'm really sorry I embarrassed you, Dad, I said, jumping right into my apology. I never meant to make you look bad. He made a little grunt noise. Actually, everyone seemed quite thrilled that for once, someone had dared to stand up to the society boys. My eyes widened as I looked up at my dad. They were all quite impressed at the way you and Borden threw caution to the wind and went after them so directly. I covered my smile up with my hand over my mouth. Really? At my amusement, Dad glared at me. 
The students might be singing you two as heroes, but that doesn't mean I'm not exceptionally disappointed and a fair bit angry. That sobered me instantly. I know. Dad took another bite, and I could see the gears turning in his head as he thought. And you should know, I'm not even a student, and I could hear the rumors and speculation running rampant already. People are wondering if you and Nathaniel broke up. I felt all of the color drain out of my face. Why would they think that? Dad gave me a look, one that said he was questioning my intelligence at the moment. Because you were with Borden, getting in trouble. They're thinking you and Borden are a couple now. I sat straighter, my gaze falling to the tabletop. I hadn't even considered it, what it would look like. Borden and I were together all the time. But yesterday was different. Are you and Nathaniel broken up? Dad asked, his tone a little softer and quieter. Is there something going on between you and Borden? My eyes rose to meet Dad's. I stared at him for two solid seconds, not knowing exactly what to say. I don't know what's going on with me and Nathaniel, I said. As you saw on Saturday night, we still have a few disagreements on how we deal with conflict. We need to talk. Dad continued to hold my gaze. And you and Borden? I blinked twice. Something twisted in my stomach. Me and Borden, nothing. We're friends. He... I paused, trying to explain it. I'm not the kind of person who can just sit back and let people walk all over me or hurt the people I love. That might work for Nathaniel, but I can't. And Borden isn't asking me to be someone different than who I am. That sounds a little bit like the start of a relationship. My father said quietly. I sat there in stunned silence. My stomach was doing strange things. It was angry and confused, just the same as my heart. It's not, I said shortly. I love Nathaniel. We might have problems, but that hasn't changed. But as I got up and rinsed my empty plate, I found my mind going deeper and deeper into everything. How we handle conflict is a huge part of a relationship. As we'd now proven, Nathaniel and I took very different approaches. And it had come up twice now, causing a huge rift. Where did that leave us? So over the next three hours, while I waited for him to get off his shift in the library, I laid in my bed feeling utterly sick to my stomach, trying to sort out what needed to be said and what had to be done. At 8.50, when I got out of bed to walk to the solarium, I didn't know. I had zero answers. So, feeling like a nervous wreck, I walked across the grounds, no longer as a student, but an intruder. Light was softly glowing as I walked down the stone path to the solarium. I knew there was something really wrong when I knocked first, instead of walking right in. Nathaniel had been lying on the couch, but sat up when I walked in and shut the door. There was a fire roaring in the fireplace, and that was the only light. His face was cast in an ethereal glow. He looked like a mystical god. His features were already sharp and brooding, enhanced tenfold right then in the dim firelight. Nervously. I walked around and sat on the edge of his bed. And that was yet another indicator that something was wrong. I didn't sit beside him, and I didn't know if it could be fixed. Neither of us said anything for several long moments, and I had to appreciate them. These couple of seconds where nothing had yet been said, and so nothing could quite be called broken. For a few seconds, I could pretend that everything was still the same, but it wasn't, and we had to be grown-ups and deal with our problems. You just left, and I was really worried for you all day, Nathaniel said, pushing us into the dark unknown. I knew you would try to talk me out of how I needed to deal with things, I said, 
and I didn't want to jump into a fight right then. I think that shows us we have a problem, Nathaniel said, and just barely in his voice, I heard grief working its way to the surface. Apparently we do, I said. We were both quiet for a few beats, and I knew, neither of us knew where to go from here. What did we start with? What was owed, and what could we really fix? I'm sure you heard some rumors at school today, I said. Nathaniel nodded, but didn't say anything else. I did get expelled from school, I started, stating the easiest thing to explain. Apparently, there were several witnesses who saw Borden and I going in and out of the society house and the school on Sunday. I don't know who these witnesses are, so there won't be any memory altering to fix at this time. And this time, we were guilty of what got us expelled. From the look on his face, I knew Nathaniel was wrestling with the ethical implications of what I just said. It could have been a lot worse, I said, my voice hoarse and tight. I didn't sleep the entire night Saturday. I spent all night trying to come up with a plan, a way to bring them to justice. I came up with a few different plans, and this was the least of them all. And did it work? I looked at Nathaniel when I heard the sharp tone in his voice. He looked off to the side of me, his jaw tight. Did you make them pay? He asked. Did you bring them to justice? And I realized then that he was right. In the end, what kind of justice was it that we'd done? We'd pulled a prank on them, a practical joke. We showed the student body the truth about their grades, but what could they ever do about it? And in the end, Borden and I paid for it with our educations. How juvenile I had been. I should have gone with one of my other plans. I should have made them pay in a real way. Don't you patronize me, Nathaniel, I said. My voice dipped low and dangerous. You've never walked down these roads before, Margot, he said, his voice matching mine. You've never had to deal with true confrontation in your life. I tried to warn you that. Stop, I said, my tone sharp and loud as I cut him off. It won't do us one bit of good to go down that road of, I tried to warn you because I also tried to warn you that I couldn't just do nothing. Nathaniel looked at me, breathing hard through his nose as he tried to reclaim his calm. But, Borden? Borden, you could go and be yourself with? And that was when the tears pooled in my eyes. That was when I started to crack, when my hold on this started to slip. Because I saw it there in his eyes, the emotion in Nathaniel that said he was hurt, but that he was also sorry. It was just one day, I said, the words hardly audible. One day and one instance where he offered me some emotional support and connection that I needed. The whole school is apparently making their own assumptions and spreading all kinds of gossip, but it was one instance. I'm. Really sorry that it wasn't me that could give you what you needed then, Nathaniel said. His voice was unsteady with emotion, because we were sliding further and further down this rocky hill. I shook my head. You've been exactly what I needed in every other instance. He shook his head. Yet this keeps coming up. This keeps being a problem. And I don't know how it goes away, Margot. I shook my head, too. This shouldn't be a definer. This shouldn't be the decider of anything. A tear pushed its way out onto Nathaniel's cheek, and I couldn't stay away any longer. I got up and crossed the space to him. I knelt with my knees on either side of his hips, straddling his waist. I reached up and brushed a thumb over his cheek, wiping away the tear. And yet... Resolving conflict is part of a relationship, Nathaniel said, as he studied my face. His eyes lingered on mine, slid down my nose, focused on my lips, 
my ears. And we keep failing at it. I pressed my lips together, trying to gain control over the emotions in me. But I lost. Two of my own tears pushed themselves out onto my cheeks. Do you think that all of the other things were maybe just too easy? That maybe we just took the rest for granted? I think that maybe we made too many assumptions too early, Nathaniel said, his words barely audible at this point. I leaned forward, and I pressed my lips to his, gently, softly, as if he were fragile, and he might shatter or disappear into mist at any moment. You're the love of my life, Nathaniel, I said in a whisper. It's not supposed to be like this. He looked up into my eyes, and I saw it there. Everything I was feeling reflected in his eyes. I think maybe we need to take a step back, Margot, and evaluate some very important things about ourselves. And as much as it killed me, I knew he was right. We each had to decide if we could change, if we could accept, or if there were core flaws that would put cracks in any foundation. So, I nodded. I climbed off his lap, and with feet that weighed a thousand pounds each, I walked toward the door. Nathaniel stood as I reached it and put a hand on the doorknob. I looked back over my shoulder. See you at nine tomorrow to work on the healing book? I asked, trying to say something normal. Nathaniel didn't say anything, simply nodded with his lips tightly pressed together. So, I walked out of the solarium. My legs felt like disconnected tree stumps as I walked faster and faster. My throat grew tight. Emotions flooded my eyes. I pushed myself faster. I was halfway across the school grounds when I utterly broke down. Sobs ratcheted their way up my throat. Tears broke free from my eyes. I had to wrap my arms around my middle to keep from crumpling to the ground. While we had never said as much in words, I knew Nathaniel and I would never be what we were ever again. We were too easy, had been too young and too naive. We had ignored critical differences in our personalities. And now the bill had come due. I'd meant it when I said Nathaniel was the love of my life. I'd believed we were meant to be together with every fiber of my being. But what if that wasn't enough? Chapter 21 For the first time since I was a five-year-old, I slept in on a Tuesday morning in March. The sun was high in the sky by the time I opened my eyes. I rolled over and stared at the window, where light was pouring in through the gauzy curtains. That was the same window that Nathaniel had once crawled through the night we had our first kiss. The same window where he would send paper airplanes with sweet messages. And now, that window was devoid of anything but sunlight. I pushed all of those feelings away, and I crawled out of bed. I did normal things. I showered, I ate breakfast, I dressed like it was any other day. And while I was brushing my teeth, there was a knock at the door. I darted downstairs with my mouth full of foam and opened it to find Borden on the steps. I waved him in and then darted into the kitchen to spit and rinse out my mouth. Are we still looking on the bright side and appreciating that we got to sleep in today? Borden asked as he closed the door behind him. Yes, we are, I declared, as I flicked my toothbrush at the sink, knocking the water off. Wasn't it lovely? Borden smiled and looked around. I guess. I've always been an early bird, so sleeping in till seven was an accomplishment. I looked over at the clock on the stove. It was almost nine. You look like you came over here with a plan, I said, as I leaned against the counter. He nodded. We have a lot of time on our hands now. I was thinking that we could replace one kind of schooling with another. No days off for you, huh? I asked. 
He shrugged. If I sit in that apartment thinking about everything that happened, I will go entirely insane. Did your dad call? I asked, feeling my stomach sink with dread. Borden nodded. It was what I expected. He'd been cut off. He'd called it, and then it came true. I hated that it did, and I hated that I had something to do with him losing everything. But this is where we were. I'm sorry, I said, meaning it. I know, he said, giving a little nod. But it's worth it, you know? To be what I am. To become what I was always meant to be. It's weird to think, though, that Dad should be able to do everything I can. My mage blood comes through him. It floored me, that statement. Really, despite all this family history we'd done, I hadn't thought of Borden or Mary Beth's parents being mages. My mother had disappeared. Nathaniel's parents were lowlifes who had lost custody of him when he was three. But Borden and Mary Beth still had both their parents. Honestly, I hadn't even thought about that, I said. That your dad is one of us, too. Have you ever considered telling him? Borden crossed his arms over his chest. No. He answered confidently. The man's a controlling prick who looks at every person as a dollar sign. He'd find a way to take this and make a profit out of it. Or he'd just take you and turn you into a gold-making cog in his machine of wealth. Yikes, I said, my eyebrows rising at his blunt statements. He nodded in agreement. But I was thinking, we could work on that trick you used on me in the solarium and the beach. You want me to purposely knock you out? I asked, raising an eyebrow at him. He shrugged. It's a good defense. It's likely that throughout our lives we're going to be in dangerous situations. We need to learn how to defend ourselves. I shook my head at him, surprised at his willingness to let me knock him out. But I stepped forward and joined him in the living room. For hours we practiced. I found I was able to do it again, knock him out. At first, he was out for 30 minutes, but then I was able to control the amounts of time. I brought it down to five minutes, and then one. I explained how I did it to Borden, and it was terrifying, becoming his guinea pig, but I let him knock me out. He was right. It was the best sleep I'd ever gotten, even if I was only out for 20 minutes the first time, and then a few minutes after that. But over the course of the day, Borden and I got a really good hold on how to do it, we each took time detailing the instructions in our personal grimoires. I put dinner in the oven, and then he and I sat at the dinner table with four rocks on the table. You just say the words, prick your finger, and that should start the process. I said again, showing him how I'd done it. My blood soaked into the rock, and then it started changing into gold. Borden did exactly what I'd just done but it stayed looking exactly like a rock with a few blood drips on it. Am I saying the words wrong? He asked. The frustration was rising in his voice with every attempt. Your pronunciation isn't great, but yes, you're saying it correctly, I said. I just... Maybe Nathaniel is right. Maybe it has something to do with our affinities. Yours is electricity, which has nothing to do with gold. I mean, it's a conductor, but maybe that makes it even worse. Your magic is just going straight through. So far, I feel like yours is the most useful affinity. Borden mused as he folded his arms on the table and stared at my two golden rocks. Nathaniel can fix books and make paper airplanes fly. I cause storms whenever I get angry, but you have yet to try anything that doesn't work. I think we're all going to have our different skill levels, I said. Everyone has got to have strengths and weaknesses. I guess I should just be grateful I can do anything, Borden said. Mary Beth is growing more frustrated by the day. It was true. She often didn't even want to come to our study sessions, 
because even though it had been this long, she still had yet to perform an ounce of magic. The door opened, and in walked my dad, carrying his briefcase. In surprise, he looked at the two of us together and the lumps of gold that lay on the table in between us. Is that... is that what it looks like? He asked with wonder. I nodded. Alchemy is real? He asked in addition, wonder filling his voice. Seems so, I said, picking up the golden rock and setting it in Dad's hand. So don't worry too much, Dad. I might be a college dropout, but I think I might be able to care for myself. Speaking of which, I stood and went to my purse, which hung on the coat tree by the door. I dug around and pulled out a sum of money. I walked back to Dad and set the money in his hand. I'm really sorry that I've disappointed you, but now that I'm not in school, I fully expect to pay my way around here. It's time that I act like an adult and start helping out. He opened and closed his mouth twice, at a loss for words. Just take it, I said. It will make me feel a lot better about things. Why don't you go wash up? Dinner will be ready in about fifteen minutes. He eyed Borden and I warily, but finally, he turned and walked up the stairs to do what I said. I don't think he likes me very much, Borden said in a low voice as soon as Dad was gone. I shook my head. It's not that. He's just a little in love with Nathaniel himself. I haven't asked yet, Borden said. But what happened between you two? I looked down at the table and shook my head. It's complicated. We just, we have some things that make us absolutely right for each other. And then there are some things that we handle very, very differently. We decided to take a step back and figure some things out. I was surprised when Borden laid his hand over mine and gave it a gentle squeeze. I'm sorry to hear that, Margot. Anyone who has seen you two together can see how much you're meant for each other. I thought about it then, telling Borden about the rumors that were going around school, that he and I were a thing, that I'd seen the questioning in Nathaniel's eyes. But there was nothing here, nothing but friendship and partners in resurrecting magic. So, I kept my mouth shut. Thanks. I offered simply. I stood and went to the fridge and pulled out the bag of green beans. Want to help me snap these? It hurt being around Nathaniel that night. We all met together in the solarium like everything was normal. Mary Beth tried her very best, but never accomplished anything. Borden and I went over the knockout magic we'd been practicing all day. Within a matter of an hour, Nathaniel had it down perfectly. But he and I kept our distance at all times, staying across the solarium from each other. We rarely made eye contact. But I kept seeing him looking from me to Borden, with a thoughtful expression on his face, like he was trying to determine if the rumors at school were true. But he never said anything and to my relief, he never seemed to make up his mind one way or another. My heart ached seeing him keeping his distance. I kept looking at his hands and remembering what they felt like in mine. I kept looking at his lips, remembering how they tasted. I found myself looking at his bed and remembering lazy Saturday nights, lying together underneath the covers, being totally innocent. I wasn't sure if I'd ever get that back, and it was killing me. But the fact that I wanted it didn't change the reasons why we weren't currently doing it. And that night, I left the solarium, having hardly said a direct word to Nathaniel. Mary Beth awkwardly said goodnight before heading across the grounds to go back to her dorm, and Borden and I walked silently down the sidewalk together, because his apartment was generally in the same direction I went to go home. We said goodnight, and he walked home alone, further into town. And for the next few weeks, things continued in the same way. 
Gordon would come over to my house during the day, and together we would work on magic, and we started making incredible progress. We both mastered transfiguration as far as it was outlined in the book. We could transform any ordinary object into something else that wasn't alive. We started speculating if we could transfigure living things into other living things, including making ourselves look like someone else. But it was a risky experiment to perform. So for now, we left it alone. We pushed the boundaries of our telekinesis. We tried bigger and bigger objects in extending our distance, using the beach as our practice grounds. Borden learned how to alter and still memories, and the only way to practice was on other students at school. That was the test, to see if he could make them forget anything happened. And over those weeks, I started doing mass amounts of alchemy. Every day, I created five new lumps of gold. I let them wait for four days before I trusted they were going to stay, but every single one of them did. So, Borden and I started going around to every jeweler in a 30-mile radius, selling the gold. I made more and more money. I started stockpiling it and made my plan to make an offer on Asteria House. And twice a week, the four of us would meet at the solarium to practice together. It was hard to be patient, because while Borden and I were progressing by leaps and bounds, Nathaniel was learning at a slow pace, having to balance school and his hours at the library. And Mary Beth was still unable to do any magic. I felt the dynamic changing, where once Nathaniel and I were the directors of this group, the parents and teachers, it was now Borden and me, and that broke my heart further. I didn't want to have one more rift between Nathaniel and me, but it was growing bigger by the day. One week before school was out, I decided it was time to clear Mom's office out. We had booked our flights. We'd gotten hotels arranged for the trip. Nathaniel and Mary Beth and my father had worked hard plotting out what regions were best for us to hit. What they didn't know was that Borden and I hadn't booked return flights just yet. We were planning to stay however long it took to get everything we needed. And I truly wondered if Borden just planned to stay. And I wondered if, when that decision was made, he was going to try and talk me into doing the same. I knew what my answer would be. I wasn't going to move to another country. Harrington, Massachusetts was my home, and I wasn't making that sacrifice. But for now, I had to face what I'd done. I had to make the necessary arrangements. Already, I felt strange walking through the halls at the school. I felt like an outsider, when never in my whole life had I felt that way. This was my playground as a child, and now it wasn't a place I was welcomed. The others walking around me were no longer my peers. They were students at the college in my backyard. And for the first time, I started to feel like this kind of other. Not a student, not just any other human. I was a mage. I was different from them. And I even further felt the fear of them. There were so many more of them than me. And in the past, my kind had been killed. But I also felt a little bit of awe. I could show them things that would blow their minds. I could do things that would seem godlike to them. I could do more than they could ever imagine. And suddenly, I had to wonder how no mage had ever used their power for evil and tried to take over the entire world. Surely there had to be some incredibly powerful ones who could have done extraordinary things and could have forced the world to bow before them. Someone bumped into me and brought me back to my present surroundings. As I looked around at all the teenagers and young adults walking around with their backpacks and textbooks clutched to their chests, I felt confirmation again of why I was okay with this expulsion. My life had become so much more than their classrooms. I walked into the library and cut along the bookshelves to work my way back to the McCallum room. I double-checked that no one was watching, and I unlocked the door and slipped inside. Already, 
more than 80% of my mother's things, and then our things, had been moved out. Every night before he came home, my father would pack up a box and bring it back to the house. It kind of broke my heart to see it so empty. This was the one last bit of her that I had, my last connection. I think I had always held on hope that this room was going to reveal her secrets to me, and as of now, it had given me nothing but her knowledge. I started packing her last few things in a box. Her journal, a few books that seemed useless to me, the jar of pencils that sat on her desk. I jumped half a foot into the air when I heard the sound of the bookcase opening below, and one second later, Nathaniel's head appeared in the opening. You scared me, I said, letting out a breath as I turned back to what I was doing. Sorry, he said, though I could tell he was distracted. He stepped into the middle of the room and looked around. I keep wanting to ask about this place and learn its history, but I also don't want to raise any questions until we've gotten everything out of here. I nodded in agreement. Probably only one more load. I'll come get the last of it tomorrow or the next day. Nathaniel went and sat on the couch, and I could feel the weight of a conversation settling in. So I stood and leaned against the desk. This has felt like the longest and quickest school year ever, Nathaniel said. He rested one arm along the back of the couch and crossed one ankle over the opposite knee. So much has changed and so much has happened. And then I think about it, and I wonder how it has only been eight months since we met. It seems kind of impossible, doesn't it? I said. I feel like somehow... We've known each other for our whole lives, but that can't be real, because I've been right here, in the same place, the whole time, and you were never in the same place for long. He didn't say anything. His gaze had fallen to the ground, and I could tell he was lost in his past. I know you don't like to talk about it, I said, venturing into these unstable waters, but I think it would have helped. If you really talked about your past, what you've been through, how you were, because you just gave me the bare minimum, and it's made it hard to relate to. It's made it hard to see it as real. Nathaniel's eyes rose up to meet mine. You really want to hear about the nightmares I had as a child? Of being left alone in a crib for days by myself? He asked. I heard his words grow darker and heavier with every word he spoke or the time I punched a kid who kept taking my lunch in preschool, knocking out all four of his front teeth, or the time that Myrtle Bloom convinced Danny Shaw to shove me into the fountain at school, and I came out with my hands around his neck, so tight it left bruises for an entire month. You really wanted to hear about all of those things, Margot? I swallowed once. Yes because you've blocked me out of all of these things that make you who you are, and then I just can't understand when certain things happen. You just expect me to accept that you're somehow magically two entirely different people. So, is it too late now? He asked, and his tone softened. His words sounded a little lost. Did we just jump in too ignorant, and now we've destroyed our chance? I shook my head, and I just kept shaking it for a while, because I couldn't accept that. No, I said, my word breathy. But maybe... I cut out, trying to think when my head was spinning. Maybe we needed to get to know each other as friends first. Maybe the kind of love we had was just too blind. I could see it on his face just how much this was killing Nathaniel, and it was breaking my heart, too. But we were both more broken than we realized. I do love you, Margot, he said, his words little more than a whisper. And I wish I could just let you in. But all I want to do is ignore everything that ever happened to me before I came here to Aldridge. I don't want to go back into the past. 
and I can't stand the thought of showing you who I was then. I wrapped my arms around myself because it hurt that we kept looping back in circles over and over again. I nodded once. All right, then. Maybe you can learn to trust me more as a friend first, then. Maybe we cut it all back, and maybe we don't talk about that future that we thought was so sure. We just take it back. And maybe someday you will trust me enough to help me understand. Nathaniel didn't say anything for a long time, and we both just stared at each other, because I'd finally been able to put into words what I'd been struggling with all this time. And he didn't want to hear the truth of it, but he was accepting it. All right, he said, and he stood as he did. All of his features were tight, as if he were holding something in, trying to control every movement and every breath he let out. We become friends, Margot, and see what happens from there. I gave a curt little nod, but didn't say anything else. I watched as he walked back to the spiral staircase and went down. I listened for the sound of the bookcase closing again, and when I knew I was alone, I grabbed the pad of paper laying on the desk, and I threw it as hard as I possibly could against the opposite wall. Very unsatisfyingly, it simply made a noise and fell flat to the ground, barely even crinkling any pages. I wanted Nathaniel to fight with me. I wanted him to yell and tell me he did trust me. I wanted him to counter me and tell me that of course we were friends. I wanted him to say it didn't matter and that we loved each other so we could figure all this other crap out. But he had just sat there so calm. He just acted so logical. And he got out of here without ever once raising his voice. I wanted us to scream at each other and yell it all out and work through every single issue right here and now and then fall into each other's arms and kiss and touch and for everything to be fixed. But here was the problem. We handled things differently. So, I took four deep breaths. I stuffed a few more things into the box, and I walked out of the hidden office. I walked out of the library without looking around for Nathaniel. I went home. I scoured the shelves at home, debating what was expendable. I grabbed a dozen glass jars from the kitchen, ones we had emptied over the winter. I went down to the beach, and I hurled them out over the ocean before making them explode into tiny bits of sand with my mind. Chapter 22 Are you okay? I looked over at Borden as we walked out of the jewelers with a thick envelope of money. Yeah? Why? He shook his head, his eyes fixed ahead. We turned the corner, aimed for the store. You've just been exceptionally quiet the last few days. I shrugged as he held the door open for me and we stepped into the store. There's just a lot going on in my head right now. I don't really want to talk about it. That's fine, Borden said. I get it. We can pretend there's nothing else to worry about besides packing for a long trip overseas. I glared at him because he knew I was stressed about it already. I looked around the store, catching sight of Mary Beth at the back, looking through a rack of suitcases. Hey, you, I said, smiling as I bumped her hip with mine. It's a good thing I'm not a penny pincher, she said, as she considered the row of luggage. I have three sets back at home, all much better than these. But what's the harm in one more set? You are ridiculous, I said shaking my head. Which set is cheapest? I said it, despite the thousands of dollars in my purse. No, she said, correcting me. It's not about the price tag. It's about which one speaks to your soul. Do you really never worry about sounding like an arrogant braggart? Borden asked, raising an eyebrow at Mary Beth. Never she said, grabbing a set that was far more colorful than all the others. 
And since when did any of us care what people thought about us? Leave it to Mary Beth to instantly make me feel better. In the end, I still picked the least expensive set, and Borden got the most practical gray set they had. We each picked out a new jacket and got our travel-sized necessities. I picked out a new set of everything for Nathaniel and asked Borden to take them to him. He didn't have any money, and I knew he was stressed out about missing two weeks of work for our trip. He hadn't done his own shopping because he was currently working at the library. And it was a truly nice afternoon. We shopped, we ate at a diner, leaving our massive pile of things by the front door while we ate. We didn't mention magic once, just talked in excitement about our trip like the young adults we were, and then we all went our separate ways home to pack. I stumbled through the door with all of my things to find Dad eating a bowl of cereal at the table. Good gracious, he said, his eyes widening at all of my things. Did you need to buy out the entire store? I laughed, tripping over one of my shopping bags. It's kind of awful, right? But I can't remember the last time I had extra money to buy two new pairs of shoes, let alone one. Dad just shook his head at me and took another huge mouthful of food. Maybe he was related to Mary Beth. Where are your stress levels? I asked, as I dumped all of my things and walked into the kitchen to sit across the table from him. This is the part where I stop stressing, and all the students start having heart attacks because they've been slacking all semester. He said with a laugh. Oh, I knew you weren't worried about the finals. I said, raising an eyebrow at him. I'm losing my mind about the international travel. I can't imagine you aren't feeling the same way. He dropped his eyes back to his cereal bowl. Okay, maybe that part is keeping me up at night lately. There's just so much to do once we get there. I have so many people to connect with and so many things I want to accomplish in just a few months. And his expression sobered and his eyes grew far away. And I was supposed to do this trip with your mother, he said, his eyes sliding up to meet mine. This was all about her, her ancestors, her country of origin. I wish she could be going with us, I said, and it all hit me again, how much I missed her, her laugh and her smile, the stories she told and how she would tell me bedtime stories in different languages. You look so much like her, Dad said, as he raised a hand and brushed his thumb over my cheek. It was true. While he had my same sandy blonde hair and a slight dip in his chin, I got everything else from my mother. I had her eyes and her nose, her same oval-shaped face, even had her same serious, thoughtful stare. If you put pictures of us side by side, there was no question we were mother and daughter. Someday, we'll get our answers, I said, offering him a sad smile. He suddenly sat up and reached for a box that was sitting on the chair next to him. That reminds me, I picked up the last of your mother's things from her office today and it reminded me that there were two books sitting on her desk in her normal office when I cleaned it out. I'd returned them to the linguistics department when I cleaned out her office, but I remembered them because they were in a language I knew your mother didn't speak. He pulled out two books from the box, and my heart instantly thumped with hope. I reached for them and opened the pages of the first one. The words swirled instantly at my touch, and rearranged themselves into a language I didn't recognize. I can't read it, I said, shaking my head. I, I don't even recognize the characters. They look like some kind of Asian language to me. Dad nodded, though he looked disappointed. And there's something interesting about the other book. I reached for it and tried to open the pages. Tried, but failed. It was almost as if the pages had been glued shut, 
like every single page had been sealed to the other, the front and back cover included. Instantly, I darted from my chair and went to my wand, which had been left useless on a bookshelf. I grabbed it and returned to the table. I covered my hands with my sleeves and touched it to the sealed book. It glowed brilliant blue. And even though I didn't need to, because I already knew the answer, I touched it to the first book, and it too glowed. These were in the linguistics private collection? I asked, instantly thinking of the place. It was a room in the center of all the linguistics professors' hall, stuffed with shelves of books from all over the world. They were. Dad said with a nod, and I was impressed that he knew exactly which ones Mom had kept on her desk. I need you to go back there tomorrow and test to make sure there aren't any more magical books in that library, I said, and instantly, I was shocked at my own stupidity that I hadn't considered checking all the private department libraries. Try this, I said, handing him the wand that looked like a pencil. Dad picked it up, and at my instruction, he touched it to the sealed book. Instantly, it glowed blue. Perfect, I said, my brain spinning a million miles an hour. Dad, Mom talked about two books that she just bought from overseas. She said they took months to arrive. These, these have to be the ones she was talking about. I stood, grabbing the books. I stood there, debating with myself for a solid ten seconds. I wanted to run right over to the solarium and see if Nathaniel could read the language that was in the glamoured book, or if he had any ideas why the book was sealed. But he would be studying for his finals tomorrow. He didn't need the distraction. So, I would wait until the day after tomorrow, when we would all be on a plane bound for Scotland. Chapter 23 While all the other students at Alderidge were taking their finals, I counted the money I had made from selling gold. I'd spoken to a real estate agent and asked him what Asteria House was worth. It had been hard to get him to take me seriously, and I couldn't exactly blame him. I was only 19 after all, and a single woman at that, talking about buying an abandoned mansion by herself but he gave me an amount he thought the owners would consider. As I counted out the bills one by one, I found that I was exactly halfway there. I'd earned enough to put down half, in cash, in just over a month. I could get the rest in another month, though that was going to be more complicated since I was going overseas and I'd have to deal with currency conversion. But in two months, I would have earned enough to hopefully buy the house. And in another two months, hopefully, I would have enough to pay for the mass amount of renovations it needed to make it livable. I stuffed all the money into an envelope and then hid it behind the frame of a large painting in my bedroom. I headed down the stairs to go make some lunch when there was a thump against the door. My brows furrowed and I reached for the knob, but suddenly, the entire door swung open and in stumbled Borden. His eyes looked hazy, and he could hardly keep himself upright as he walked in. He put his hands on my shoulders and looked into my eyes. Are you drunk? I asked stupidly, even as I had to back away from him because he reeked of alcohol so bad. Yes, he said simply, stepping away and dropping down onto the couch. Why? I asked walking to my mother's chair and sitting cross-legged on it. He looked over at me and gave me this look that entirely questioned my intelligence. I was supposed to be graduating tomorrow, Margot, with my bachelor's degree in international finance. I was six weeks away from finishing my schooling. And now, I have no degree, no family, and every bit of my trust fund that was still available has now been allocated to my 14-year-old sister. I didn't know you had a sister. I said stupidly, ignoring all the other painful things he just said. Chloe, he said, 
turning his face up to the ceiling and closing his eyes. She's spoiled rotten, the apple of our father's eye. I take it you're not close? I asked. He let out a sigh, and the air instantly smelled even stronger of alcohol. We're eight years apart in age. She was a surprise that came after my parents started expecting me to be a man. So no, we're not close. I'm really sorry, Borden. I said again, wishing that somehow I could make it all better. If you need money, he made a pfft sound and waved a hand in my direction. Please, keep your pennies. I started investing my own money into stocks when I was 12 and learned how to work the market as well as my father by the time I was 15. I have more than sufficient funds for my needs. I raised an eyebrow at him and shook my head, even though he wasn't looking. I have to put all of my things in storage, however, Borden said. Landlord wasn't willing to work with me while I'm gone. All my bags are somewhere outside. Can I stay here tonight? I huffed and shook my head at him, even as I got up and went to the door. Of course. I said, as I pulled it open. There was a shoulder bag dropped in front of the neighbor's house, and a large suitcase laying half on the sidewalk, half in the road. Are you kidding me? I said quietly, as I walked down the stairs into the warm end of April air. I retrieved Borden's bags and hauled them up the stairs. They were lighter than I expected, considering Borden was planning on a long-term stay. By the time I had them in the door and it closed, Borden was fast asleep on the couch. I just shook my head at him and went into the kitchen to make lunch. Dad got home from work earlier than usual that afternoon. He declared finals done, and disappointingly, he reported that he'd gone through every department library and hadn't found a single mage book. I tried to not let that get me down. I pushed it away. It was fine. We'd been lucky to find as many as we had. The two of us headed to the bank. I felt a little embarrassed and bad when I brought twice as much money as he did to exchange currency. But he didn't say a word. We simply pocketed our money and returned home. The smell of food filled the air when we walked inside. I turned to find Borden and Mary Beth in the kitchen, creating dinner. Feeling better? I asked Borden. Yes, he said, and he actually blushed a little. I'm sorry you had to see me like that. I just smiled and shrugged. How did finals go? I asked Mary Beth as I walked in and sat on the edge of the table. She shrugged. Good enough to keep me in school for another year. I shook my head with a smile. Her family donated too much money and too many assets to this school for them to ever kick her out. This mean you're sleeping over too? Why not? She asked. We're going to be roomies for the next two weeks anyway. I just smiled and hugged her, and then turned to watch as the front door opened, and in walked Nathaniel. He offered a small, controlled smile when his eyes found mine. He set the suitcase I'd bought him next to the door and awkwardly walked in to join all of us in the kitchen. How about you, Mr. Smarty Pants? Mary Beth asked as she stirred something in a pot. You show everyone up again? I did well enough, he said, and from the look in his eyes, I knew he was being modest. I got word my scholarship for fall semester is still intact. I wanted to hug him. I wanted to squeal with excitement and pride and plant a kiss right on his lips. But we were being friends first. And friends don't do that. Congratulations, I said, giving him a genuine smile instead. And together, we had one last normal night here in the States, eating and laughing and talking with excitement about what was to come. The morning was a flurry of activity. Our flight was at seven, 
So we all got up at five to be sure we were dressed and everything was packed. And it felt like we were one big family. And my dad suddenly had four young adult children instead of one. We were arguing over the shower and asking who didn't put toilet paper on the roll. We were yelling if anyone had seen our shoes and then calling for the straggler taking too long to get their luggage to the curb. We ordered two taxis. We dumped all our luggage in the trunks, which barely fit. And then Dad locked the front door, and I watched, with a pit of excitement and dread in my stomach, as we pulled away from the house, because I wasn't sure when I'd next see it again. Mary Beth talked nonstop from the front seat, and I wasn't sure if she was talking to me or my dad or the taxi driver. But it didn't really seem to matter if there was any kind of response. She rambled on anyway. I wondered how the vibe in the other taxi was, if Borden and Nathaniel were talking. I wondered if it was silent and awkward, because Nathaniel still didn't seem 100% sure that nothing was going on between Borden and me. My stomach tightened, and my lips pressed together in a thin line. I pushed out all those thoughts, and I watched the scenery go by outside. It only took 30 minutes to reach the Boston Logan Airport. We gathered our luggage and paid the taxi drivers, and then with nervous anticipation, we headed inside. I didn't have a passport. Nathaniel didn't have a passport. We might, big might, have been able to get one in time. We had decided to make this trip weeks ago, but there was no guarantee we'd get it in time, and the cost was too much for Nathaniel. So in the end, we decided to test our magic. We each held a folded up piece of paper, and as we walked up to the security check, they both changed from plain white paper to something that looked exactly like a passport. I handed mine over. The guard looked at me and looked down at the picture of me, and without a single question, he waved me through. Nervously, I looked back at Nathaniel, who met my eyes as he handed over his fake passport as well. In five seconds, he was waved through, and I finally breathed a little easier. We could do this. We could travel to another country without the proper paperwork. We could use magic and not get caught. You look white as a ghost. Borden leaned over and said quietly as we walked down the hall to our gate. I've never ridden on an airplane before, okay? I said, my tone a little harsh. And now my very first time is going to be flying over the whole of the Atlantic Ocean? I think I've earned looking a little bit pale. I wasn't trying to make fun of you, Borden said. Only making sure you're all right. And something happened in my stomach with his supportive words. And I didn't like it. But the moment came and went as we all reached our gate just as they called for it to begin boarding. I was planning to sit next to Dad on the flight, but as I was the last one to walk down the aisle, I watched him sit next to Nathaniel on the side aisle, where there was only seating for two. Annoyed, I looked for the others. Mary Beth had taken a seat just behind Dad, next to an older woman. Of course, they were already chatting it up. Borden had taken a seat in the middle aisle, and I took the one just in front of him, right across from Mary Beth. My heart was thumping loud and hard as they finished boarding the plane. I knew I was too alert, too anxious, and probably looked ridiculous. But I couldn't stop looking at everything. The seats, the flight attendants bustling around, or the cockpit, because the door was still slightly open. I paid special, close attention when the flight attendants gave safety instructions. I made sure my seatbelt was especially tight around my waist. My heart gave a lurch when the plane moved back, pulling away from the gate. I took deep breaths in and out, slowly, as we moved to the runway. I wished I'd been able to get a window seat so I could watch closer. Maybe then I wouldn't be so nervous. I had to tip my head back against the headrest as the plane started rolling forward, faster and faster. Suddenly, I felt a gentle hand on my shoulder, and I glanced back just barely 
to see Borden's familiar hand. I reached a hand up and covered his with mine, holding on for dear life as we launched forward. I felt like we were going to shake apart as we moved at impossible speeds. Surely, we were going to crash and flip and roll. But like a miracle, suddenly, the nose of the plane lifted, and just a second later, the entire thing was airborne, and the ride was smooth. I took five deep breaths in and out, telling myself to appreciate this feeling of flying, literal flying. I squeezed Borden's hand, hoping he understood that I appreciated his support in the moment, and I hoped he could feel the excitement I felt at knowing I was truly in the air. As we started to level off, I let go of his hand, and just then noticed Mary Beth's eyes on us. As soon as I met hers, she darted them away, as if she hadn't seen anything. Flight attendants started walking down the aisles, and if they felt safe enough to do that, I could feel safe enough to breathe normally. So, ignoring Mary Beth's questioning looks, I pulled out a book and got lost in a world of dragons and daring princes. Chapter 24 Would you like something to drink, miss? I looked up largely because of the accent. I was lost deep in my book, getting to the good part, where the prince was ready to walk away from it all to be with his true love. And suddenly, there was a very strong but clear Scottish accent bringing it all to a halt. Oh, sure, I said, saying the first drink that came to mind. The woman smiled sweetly and nodded, getting the drink orders of everyone on my row. I leaned forward and tapped my dad on the shoulder. He looked up from his own book to look at me. How long has it been? I asked. He looked at his watch. Should be landing in an hour, he said, just loud enough for me to hear him. I nodded and went back to my book. I had started it when we took off, and already I was almost at the end. The flight really had gone quickly, and the only way I could tell how long it had really been was the stiffness in my back and neck and the half-numb state of my legs. Ten minutes later, the attendants returned with a cart and trays full of drink orders. Realizing my bag was in the way, I reached for it and pulled it under my feet. Only I knocked it over, and my wand and a bag with snacks fell out. I grabbed them awkwardly, trying not to drop everything or lose my place in my book. But just then, the flight attendant stepped backward down the aisle, and my wand poked right into her leg. Instantly, my wand glowed blue. Sorry, she apologized, but she didn't even look back as she continued to do her job. Sharply, I looked over at Dad and Nathaniel and Mary Beth, but none of them were paying attention. Holy shit. I heard Borden breathe from behind me, but I didn't get the chance to twist around and stare at him wide-eyed. The attendant walked further down the aisle, blocking my view. I stared up at her with wide eyes as she handed drinks over to the two people next to me. Carefully, I slipped my sleeve over my hand and kept my wand in my hand as I reached for my drink. Awkwardly, but carefully, I made sure it touched her wrist as she took my drink. Oh, that's pretty, she said, her eyes widening just a bit as it lit up, brilliant blue. What's that? I swallowed once and my words got caught in my throat for just a second. Just, just a trick. Thanks for the drink. She gave a courteous nod and then moved further down the aisle, delivering more drinks. Almost violently, I turned around in my seat to look at Borden. She's a mage, he said, his eyes wide as he looked at her. No question, it happened twice. I nodded in agreement. But, but what are we supposed to do? She's a complete stranger. I don't even know her name. I... But Borden closed his mouth again, because he didn't know what we were supposed to do either. I sat back in my seat, watching the attendant 
as she reached the front of the plane. She was a pretty woman with clear skin and the reddest hair I'd ever seen. She had pretty green eyes and a warm smile. I'd guess she was 25 or so, maybe a little older. She was the most Scottish-looking person I'd ever seen, and the accent was a dead giveaway. This just furthered our reasoning for going where we were. Scotland is where so much of this traced back to. I got up from my seat and stood next to Dad and snapped at Mary Beth to get her attention. Borden came to stand next to me, leaning in. See that attendant there? I asked, trying to keep my voice down so only our group could hear. The one with the red hair? Each one of them strained their necks to see who I was talking about. She's a mage, I said, my voice shaking. My wand fell out of my bag and I touched her, twice, and it lit up like a Christmas tree. Nathaniel's eyes widened as he looked at me. You're sure? I saw it too, Borden said. No question, she's one of us. The entire group stared after her, watching as she made her way to the end of the aisle, smiling and speaking softly as she handed out drinks. What do we do? Mary Beth asked. She whispered far too loud. Do we tell her? She'll think we've caught some airborne virus on the plane and have gone insane. Nathaniel looked down at his watch. We've got 50 minutes until we land in Edinburgh. We'll talk to her as much as we can in that time frame. Get a feel for her. It's a quick decision to make, but we can't let an opportunity like this pass. My stomach clenched at the idea of it, but what else could we do? I nodded, and Borden and I both went back to our seats. I reached up and pressed the call button. And like a charm, she came walking over just 30 seconds later. Can I get you something else, miss? I smiled sweetly, trying to seem calm and inviting instead of anxious and uncertain. No, actually. I hope you don't mind. I just wanted to ask some questions. I've actually thought about becoming a flight attendant myself. I wondered if you would recommend it. She smiled and actually seemed to appreciate the genuine conversation. Oh, it's been a wonderful job. I've gotten to see so much of the world, and I get to travel anywhere I like. It's a far cry from the little village I grew up in. Where's that? I asked, telling myself to remember it, because I knew it would be unfamiliar, no matter what. She said the name, and I committed it to memory. I actually have a lot of ancestry in Scotland myself, I said. My ancestors were the McGregors. She smiled. There were several McGregors in my town, though it isn't too uncommon of a surname. Sorry, I said, shaking my head at myself. How rude of me. I never even asked your name. She smiled, flashing such a sweet and warm smile. I trusted her already. It's Poppy. Poppy Gowans. I'd never heard the name before, but I still smiled and told her my own name. I'm actually off once we land, she said. If you'd like to chat more, we could grab a drink or something, if you're not in a hurry. I felt myself brighten, having a golden opportunity land in my lap. Yes, actually, that would be great. That's so kind of you. She smiled, and everything in me felt light and excited. Wonderful. There's this little pub in the airport. They have all kinds of options. If you wait for me at the gate, we can go together. I nodded. I'd love that. She smiled, and just as she straightened to walk away, my dad pushed his call light above him, and she turned right to them. I couldn't hear their conversation over the noise of the airplane, but I turned and shrugged at Borden and Mary Beth, who looked at me with anticipation, and gave a tentative thumbs up. One by one, Mary Beth got Poppy's attention next and then Borden called her over. The pilot was calling for everyone to return to their seats by the time Borden was finished with her. Anxiously, we all looked at one another. There were similar shrugs and nods, the signal that no one had gotten any red flags from her. I gripped my armrest with everything I had in me as we quickly approached the ground. 
I gritted my teeth with thoughts of certain death as the wheels hit the runway and we gave a tiny bounce. The noise was deafening as the wings transformed, creating drag, slowing us down extremely quickly. But finally, we slowed, and our speed felt more normal. We curled around, and in just a few minutes, we were safely parked at a gate. You survived, Gordon said, as we all unbuckled and stood, collecting our luggage from the overhead bins. I thought I was going to throw up on the landing, I confessed. But as we were all pressed together in this tight space, I moved on to the more important subject at hand. She actually invited me to have a drink with her on landing, I said, talking quickly, because the plane was unloading fast. So unless anyone has any objections, we've got a perfect opportunity. She didn't say anything concerning, Nathaniel said, looking around the space for Poppy, but she was nowhere to be seen. And everyone shook their head in agreement. Okay, I said feeling nervous butterflies swarming in my stomach. I'll go with her to the pub. You all stay close by, but give us some space for a minute, maybe? And then we'll figure out some way to slowly introduce her to all this. They nodded in agreement, but I could tell none of them felt particularly easy about having to make this big, heavy decision instantly, either. One by one, we all filed off the plane, the others went a little way down the hall to wait, watching in a casual way, and I stood there as every passenger left the plane. And then finally, Poppy walked out with her own bag, wearing that same warm smile. You ready? she asked. Absolutely. I responded with an excited and nervous smile. We set off down the hall and made our way through the crowded airport. What brings you to Scotland? She asked, as she navigated easily. Um, I'm actually here with some family, I said. My father is a history professor, and he just got a grant to study the area where the McGregors came from. So, you're all the smart, bookish type? She asked, her tone teasing. I shrugged and smiled. Sort of. I actually just got expelled from the university. Poppy made a gasping sound. I certainly never would have guessed. What for? I smiled, because even though it was awful and I hated it, I was kind of proud of what I'd done. I put some bullies in their place. Unfortunately, they were bullies with money and power and connections. Poppy raised an eyebrow at me, but smiled. Sounds like you're my kind of girl. I laughed and followed her around the corner and then into the little pub along the hallway. I just ordered a glass of water. I was too nervous to eat. But Poppy got herself a salad and we settled into a tiny table in the hall. So, tell me about yourself, I said, taking a sip of my water, even though I didn't want it in the least. She finished chewing her bite. Well, not much to tell. I grew up in a tiny town where not much of anything happened. I once let all of old Colin McCallum's cows out of their pen just to relieve some of the boredom. I laughed, feeling better about her already. My older brother went on to medical school and is a doctor here in Edinburgh, and so when our parents died two years ago, I decided it was my time to get out and do something with myself, she said and I was impressed with the way she could be so sincere, but not bring down the mood with the heavy things she just said. That's when I decided to become a flight attendant, and it's been great. If you love traveling, you couldn't pick a better career. I felt myself blush, and instantly my stomach grew heavy with nerves. I looked around to be sure no one was watching, because now was the time. Actually, this was my first time ever on an airplane. I confessed, starting down this slippery slope of craziness. And becoming a flight attendant wasn't really my real reason for talking to you. I bent down and pulled the telekinesis book out of my bag, noting the questioning look on Poppy's face. 
I know you probably know Gaelic since you're from Scotland, I said. But do you notice anything unique about this book? I opened it and lay it flat on the table, where she could easily see the words. She narrowed her eyes and leaned forward so she could read it. It's complete gibberish. I nodded, because we'd already discovered so. What about when you touch the pages? She looked up at me with questioning in her eyes. I simply nodded, encouraging her to do what I said. Tentatively, she reached a hand forward and touched the pages. Her eyes narrowed. She leaned in closer. Just the same as I had done. The same as Mary Beth had. The same as Borden had done. And the same as Nathaniel had. How? she questioned, blinking three times. The words were certainly Gaelic just a second ago. She withdrew her fingers and sat a little straighter in confusion. I pulled out my wand, and at the contact with my skin, it glowed brilliant blue. Poppy's eyes widened at it slightly. An older man, who looked to be in his sixties, made his way down the hall. Excuse me, sir? I called out. Blinking in surprise, he walked over. Would you happen to know Gaelic? I asked him. I'm afraid not, he answered in an English accent. I nodded. I picked up the book and handed it to him. Can you read this? I asked. And thankfully, he gripped it in a way that his thumb touched the pages. In confusion, he looked down. I'm sorry, he said, shaking his head. Like I said, I don't know any Gaelic. Poppy watched this all in utter confusion. That's okay, I said, giving him a kind smile as I took the book back. Would you mind holding this for just a second? I handed him my wand, which stayed looking exactly like a pencil. I'm sorry, what is this for? He asked, and I heard him starting to lose a little patience. Just a little experiment, I said once more taking the wand back from him. The second it touched my skin, it started glowing again. He looked at it with widened eyes. Thank you so much for your help. He just shook his head and continued on his way down the hall. I laid the pencil on the table, and once more, it looked like a pencil. How did you do that? Poppy asked, looking at it. And why couldn't he read the book? Pick it up, I said, my tone soft and gentle. She looked at me with uncertainty, but I was surprised at something I saw there, excitement. She grabbed the pencil, and instantly, it turned crystalline and glowed blue. Why is it doing that? My stomach leapt in excitement. Because you have ancestors who could do magic, I said, and I both loved and hated this part, the telling of the truth, because it sounded insane. And even though it's been lost and hibernating for centuries, you have it in you too, Poppy. She looked up at me. It's why you can read the book, I said. Only a mage can read it, and that wand only reacts to mages. I looked down at my glass of water, and I asked it to rise into the air just enough to show her. She sat back in her seat, her eyes widening as she watched it levitate off the table. You're a mage, Poppy Gowans, I said, confident and calm. Just like the rest of us. Suddenly, it was Nathaniel's voice behind me, and I turned back to see him and the others walking up. We watched as Poppy's napkin folded itself into an airplane and it lifted off the table and made a circle around us all before landing back on the table and lying flat once more, not a single crease mark in it. Borden snapped his fingers, and every single light in the hall flickered before returning steady. You're... you're saying I can do all of that stuff too? Poppy breathed. She was breathing hard and blinking entirely too much, but she wasn't entirely freaking out 
and I gave her a lot of credit for that. I nodded, and Nathaniel pulled up a chair at the table. Try rubbing your hands together, creating friction and heat, he said, instantly going into teaching mode. And then snap your fingers while you look at that napkin. Poppy eyed him warily, but she shifted her gaze to the napkin. I grabbed my glass of water in preparation. She rubbed her hands together for a good ten seconds. She concentrated on the napkin, and when she snapped her fingers, it instantly burst into flames. She gave a yelp, drawing lots of looks, but I instantly poured my water on it, dousing the flames before anyone could see them. I did that, she asked, her voice a little too loud, her words breathy. I smiled and nodded. You did that. She looked around and grabbed another napkin from the holder on the table next to us. She rubbed her hands together. She snapped, and the napkin lit on fire. I wasn't sure if it was Borden or Nathaniel who used telekinesis to move the spilled water and douse the fire. We want you to come with us, I said, leaning in, holding her shocked gaze. We're here to find more magic because Scotland is where so much of this is tracing back to. You're one of us, and we want you to join us. Poppy's eyes cast around to all of us. Dad, who was utterly human. Mary Beth, who looked disappointed that she was the only one who inexplicably couldn't do even the simplest of magic. She looked to Borden and then Nathaniel, and back to me. You're not going to murder me, are you? she asked. I smiled and shook my head. Hardly. We need you, Poppy. She hesitated, and they were some of the longest ten seconds of my life. Okay, she said, a hesitant but excited smile pulling on her face. But you've got a lot of answering to do. Chapter 25 we took a shuttle to our hotel, which was nearly an hour outside of the city. I was too distracted by everything that had just happened to even appreciate the fact I was in Scotland. We all sat together at the back, and Poppy fired off question after question. We gave her all the answers we knew. We told her all the history we understood, which was very little. She questioned it all, asked us to repeat information, she asked about the books we had found and the history of all our families. And Nathaniel asked his own questions about Poppy's family history, her parents, her brother, what she knew about the Gowans family, if she knew about any ancestors who were caught up in witch hunts. She didn't know. But then, she didn't know much about her ancestors beyond her grandparents. It was late by the time we got to the hotel. It was the middle of the night here in Scotland even though for us it was evening. We grabbed the only 24-hour takeout we could find and then went back to our rooms. Only, everyone ended up in mine and Mary Beth's room. I've been meaning to show you something, I said, glancing at Nathaniel as I unzipped my suitcase. I pulled out the two books Dad had found in the university. Dad found the books Mom had bought just before she disappeared, but there's something strange about them. I handed them to Nathaniel, and the entire room watched with piqued interest. Nathaniel opened the first, and I knew he was seeing the words swirl and rearrange. I believe this is Mandarin, he said. My heart sank, even though it was what I suspected, which no one is going to speak or be able to read. Let me see, Borden said, his brows furrowing. You speak Mandarin? I asked, shock furrowing my brows. My major was in international finance, remember? He said, looking at me. Most of that international business comes from China. It's kind of important to be able to communicate. I shook my head, floored that I never knew this about Borden. He looked down at the characters, and several long moments passed, as he flipped from the first page to the next, and then another. 
I can't make sense of all of it, he said, shaking his head. I understand spoken Mandarin better than I can read it, but it's talking about travel, jumping from one place to the other. This word. He tapped the page, and I watched the gears turn in his head as he tried to piece it together. I think it means portal. And it was as if everything in the past four years slid into place. My eyes widened as I looked across the room at my father, who wore my exact same expression. The way she'd taken no possessions. How there were no signs of struggle, no evidence that she'd been harmed. The way there were no traces of where she'd gone. The way she'd simply vanished. What if she accidentally opened a portal? I asked the words coming out almost too fast to even understand. What if she opened a door to some crazy faraway place and she couldn't get back? Dad nodded, and I watched as his eyes got redder. I watched as hope started creeping into his expression. Dad, I breathed out. What if she's just lost and hasn't been able to make her way back home? Emotion filled my eyes, and for the first time in such a long time, I started to hope, started to hope that maybe she was still alive, that maybe somehow she could find her way back. This is dangerous, unstable magic then, Borden said. Amelia had been practicing for years, and if she couldn't control it, if she couldn't make it work again to find her way back, we need to be very cautious in ever trying it. Nathaniel concluded. I crossed the room and wrapped my arms around my dad. He hugged me tighter than he'd hugged me in years. She could come back. I breathed against his neck. She could come back. Dad didn't seem to be able to speak. He simply squeezed me so tight I could hardly breathe before he clapped his hands on my back and released me. There are words here on this book, Nathaniel said and from the quiet, low way he said it, I thought perhaps it was almost to himself. I looked to see him squinting at the page edges of the sealed book. I walked over, glancing over his shoulder. And there, tiny and small, I could see them, just barely. Let him be locked away until the world be prepared to grant him his due. The second we read the words together, the cover of the book sprang opened, and like a nightmare, something started emerging from the book. There was a head of dark hair, and then a face marred with scars. Instantly there was a neck, and then shoulders, a torso, and a narrow waist. And suddenly, an entire man flopped onto the floor. Everyone screamed. Nathaniel instantly dropped the book, and everyone skittered back from it, their backs pressed against the walls. The man propped himself up on his hands, looking around, with wide, terrified eyes. Where am I? Who are you? His accent was English, but in a unique way I couldn't quite identify. He just came from inside that book, Mary Beth said, her voice shaking with shock and fear. How did he get inside a book? The man sat up, looking terrified and bewildered. And just then, I noticed his strange clothes. He wore a button-up shirt and boots with pants that were tucked into them. His hair was longer, and he clutched a hat in his hand. He looked... He looked like he'd just crawled out of another century. Why... Why are you dressed like this? He asked with a shaking voice. What is that accent? We all looked at each other. I was hardly breathing. My head was still spinning from the discovery of the portal book. And now, I'd just seen a man erupt from a book that had previously been sealed shut. What year is it? Nathaniel asked the man, keeping his voice very calm and steady. It's the 1656th year of our Lord, of course, the man said. But as he looked around, he seemed less and less certain of that. Who put you in that book? I asked, 
my tone darkening as I tried to fill in all of my questions with answers. The man's dark eyes slid over to mine. An enemy. Someone who took things too far. Someone who slid into the dark. Nathaniel and I glanced at each other. And could you do the things your enemy could do? Nathaniel asked. The man looked over at Nathaniel, and he evaluated him, but he kept his mouth shut. Borden stepped forward and held his hand up. It sparked with electricity. You need to answer our questions. We mean you no harm so long as you're honest. Maybe it wasn't the best way to handle it, but at least Borden knew how to be direct. Yes, the man from the book answered. I can't do what he could do. 1656, I said, looking up at Nathaniel. That's nearly 50 years before it all disappeared. Nathaniel nodded. What is your name, sir? Warily, the man eyed us, cautious and defensive. Alan, Alan Rayburn. I saw sympathy and fascination in Nathaniel's eyes. He crouched down, leveling with the confused man on the floor. Alan, you've been trapped inside that book for over 200 years. Magic has been gone for centuries. His eyes widened, and his expression went slack. We have so many questions for you, I said, taking a cautious step forward. Mary Beth suddenly stepped forward and knelt in front of Alan. I'd never seen more desperation in her eyes. Do you know why some of us can do magic and why some can't? She blurted out. Alan gave her a look, one that questioned her intelligence. What do you mean? If ye all be witches, surely you know. Nathaniel leaned forward. Sir, magic has been dormant for over two hundred years. As far as we can tell, we're the only magic wielders left. We hardly know anything. Alan looked cautiously around, confused and overwhelmed. You have never heard of the Lock of Sandris. My heart jumped to my throat, and I looked around at everyone. It sounded so official, so sure, like a fact. No, Mary Beth said, and for the first time in a long time, she sounded hopeful. The man looked more confused and lost than ever. You don't know that, fifteen years ago, you and Sandris locked half of all magic wielders. I looked back at Mary Beth. Her expression was pale. She stood stark still. Answers. Finally, there were answers. Please, I said, as I looked back at the man. Tell us everything. The End of Book Two This has been Keeper of the Lost, Resurrecting Magic, Book Two. Written by Kiri Taylor. Narrated by Sidney Fulmer. Copyright 2020 by Kiri Taylor. Production copyright 2020 by Kiri Taylor.